Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. It's 9.30 a.m. Today is Tuesday, April 28th. Uh, my name is Brian Zumwalt. I'm the director of the county's uh, Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. Uh, on the panel with me is Don Crowell from the county attorney's office, who will be serving as process moderator. Uh, before we start the meeting, just want to do a quick roll call and ensure that we have communications for each commissioner. Uh, let's start with Commissioner Eggers. Uh, can you Aye, hear me okay? I'm here. All right. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Seal. I'm here. All right. Good morning. Commissioner Welsh. Good morning. Excellent. Commissioner Long. Commissioner Long, can you hear me okay? I'm here. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Commissioner Peters. I'm here. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Gerard. Good morning. All right, Madam Chair. We have a quorum. The meeting is yours. Thank you. Okay. Well, first item on the agenda is the local state of emergency. Mr. Burton, you want to kick it off? Good morning, Commissioners. So today, today on the first item, the local state of emergency, there are two resolutions for your consideration. Uh, the first resolution is discussing options that we have for addressing two local orders, which is 20-17 uh, and 2020. That's specifically dealing with pools, beaches, playground equipment at all. And so the second one would be your consideration that our local state of emergency would expire on Friday of this week uh, is to consider extending that for uh, the following week. Um, again, the, both of those items for your consideration. For the public's benefit though, I really wanted to start um, by discussing how we come to the resolutions you have before you. When the looking at our pools and beaches and the impacts that we're seeing and in in people's frustration uh, with the lack of access to them, we've been looking at this with our data, which we're gonna go over in just a second, to determine where we're at in this pandemic. However, there's only one piece that we control locally, and that's the two orders that I just mentioned. People have asked, why are you looking at pools and beaches and not businesses? And the fact is the businesses are completely controlled by the governor's order. So until the governor, which it's set to expire come this Thursday, until the governor acts on his local order, which prevents you from leaving your home to go to anything except an essential business or service, then we can't act locally on modifying the uh, opening of local non-essential businesses. So that's the reason that we're addressing these them uh, separately. Now, as last week when we dis last discussed this, we discussed what's gonna happen because in fact, the governor's order expires on Thursday, but we're here Tuesday and none of us really know. We've seen the task force do their work that the governor appointed, three different committees. We've heard him discuss different um, options and um, seek advice from many different experts. He's currently seeking input from the public regarding the next step in his um, reopening Florida um, uh, plan. But he has yet to decide, um, at least you know that we're aware of, in terms of what those ste next steps look like. Um, there are many places, including here in Florida, where they've discussed what would a local um, reopening look like. Um, and we have too, and we thought about that. However, until we see the framework by which he lays out those parameters um, and all the things that go with that, it's very hard for us to react and respond to that. However, we do have two issues that are impacting us daily right now, and that is dealing with primarily our pools and our beaches. Our pools obviously make up, are made up of condo pools, hotel pools, um, association pools, and a variety of uh, different types of situations, all from small, um, you know, eight people, you know, that share a pool to very large complexes. Um, and when, then we also have obviously um, beach and beach, beach access. Some, a lot of our residents live on the beach and they want to use that for recreation, to walk, um, to exercise, to just enjoy that. So we've been looking at what does our data, and the commission's been asking, what does our data look like? 
So I sent to you last Friday um, a, our best analysis on the available data. We also sought input from our municipal and our um, other stakeholders, such as Chambers of Commerce and others. But we also talked to our public health experts and trying to figure out um, the things that we control of whether or not it's an appropriate time to act upon this. Now, I will also state that there is no perfect answer here. We're, we're looking at the best available data. We're trying to extrapolate that um, and trying to make recommendations to you based upon um, the input from everyone. Um, as we look at our data, we have seen very clearly that within the hospital data available, we are, we're nowhere near our hospital capacity. So if you look in terms of um, the total hospital, and that, that actually, as of today, includes where we've seen a spike in, in some of our nursing home cases being transported to hospitals. That'll be, they'll be put back into nursing homes, I'm sure, shortly because of the acuity issue. But that in, in total, out of over 3,200 beds, 103 residents in there currently. Um, when we look at it from a percentage of capacity, there's plenty of capacity within our hospital system. We look at our ICU capacity, again, we see um, 27 COVID patients um, at, to, in total. Um, so we're looking at very low percentages uh, occupying our hospitals, but that's only one indicator. The real indicators are what's occurring within the community. So if we've, if we've seen uh, the percentage of testing. Our percentage of testing has remained much lower than Florida, around the 5%. So out of the people tested, um, our, uh, the rate of people um, receiving a positive test has been around the 5% to 6% range um, over the last 14 days. Now, out of those te positive tests, you also have some that have had multiple tests. So you need to extrapolate that to say unduplicated um, new positives uh, results in something less than 5%, more like to one to three percent of the percent being tested actually come out positive. We also tried to look at our right, people that are in that incubation period, that 14 days. And again, over this same trajectory, over the last 14 days, we've seen that remain flat, that the number of people coming into that 14 day window and going out has had that, that relative number um, at, a, at, at a very downward tra trajectory uh, to where it's, it's insignificant in terms of total positives. So those are just three data points. We could talk about different data points all day long. I, I shared with you several, and I'll certainly be able to answer any questions. But we've seen a continuing low rate for uh, the Tampa Bay area, and specifically in, in Pinellas County, uh, in terms of the percent positives. The area, obviously, that we have our largest concern with, it's been well documented, is within our nursing home. That's a confined area. Um, and, you know, and that has a, from a risk st uh, standpoint, um, uh, something that we uh, obviously are doing more testing on, making sure it is confined, making sure employees are tested, and that, in, in fact, uh, they are able to manage uh, that population group. When we look at our numbers, we look at total numbers as another data point. We've seen uh, consistently in that 10, you know, um, 15, maybe 20 people per day, uh, coming into that as new cases and for our entire, you know, 1 million population. We've saw a couple of peaks, but that peak is like 27, and that's where we had a spike in the nursing home. So, again, you, you've seen, you can see the data. It's consistent, um, and, and it's relatively low as a, as a uh, risk factor in terms of a, a population group, not large community spreads like we've seen in other places such as New York, even in South Florida, our percentages is um, significantly you know, less than, than what others have experienced. Um, so it brings us back to whether or not it's an appropriate time to address the two areas that we control. Um, and, and, that, and those are with our public beaches and our pools. For our beaches, we've, we've seen other beaches open. Um, we've seen good and bad examples of that. Um, the main issue that we're concerned about in an open air environment is that we, that we practice social distancing. 
Well, our own experience when we implemented a social distancing ordin ordinance or uh, order before the governor, we actually did very well with our social distancing ordinance because we put law enforcement out in mass to make sure people were being responsible. Um, and in fact, people practiced social distancing. We saw pictures of people on the beach in their chairs with circles a six foot circle around their chair saying people spread out. And I think most people, you know, do that. You know, obviously the risk is that you have some people that wouldn't. And so the question is how do we address a policy uh, that is in total um, understanding that we would have um, some cases where we would have to enforce and address any concerns specifically to them. Um, we've saw other places that have implemented um, uh, limit, limited hours. Um, where they said, okay, you can go from, you know, 6 to 11 a.m. and then from 5 to 8 p.m. or something like that. One of the main differences that we see with our local um, order and addressing this is we have 35 miles of beach. It's not just a destination. It's where people live. Um, you know, their homes are there. Their condos are there. And, um, and simply from, you know, clearing out the beach twice a day, the only way, the only reason you do that, obviously, is to where you um, are making sure people are moving. But the reality is if people are social distancing, then the risk factor is no different from if they're out there at three o'clock or at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's it's whether or not they're separating and not creating the large crowds and the spring break crowd that obviously uh, caused you to take action to begin with. So the beach area, the beaches is, is one issue. The second issue is the pools. We have all kinds of pools, like I just said. But when we when we look at pools, there's a pool capacity. So there's a bathing um, sign that is posted at every pool that limits the capacity of the pool. We have the ability to address social distancing through the pools simply by limiting the capacity and therefore allowing people to enjoy uh, the pool while practicing social distancing. Um, both of these issues uh, come down to people being responsible. Um, that's no different than if they have a party in their backyard. Um, well, we haven't seen um, large um, uh, problems with that, but it is an enforcement issue when we, make, when we need to make sure anybody out there would have to make sure that in fact people are being responsible for the easing of restrictions. So the question is, is, is it an appropriate time to act on those things that we can act on separate from the governor. I will all I'll put one final thing out there and then you know open it up for questions. Um, when we were talking about this a week ago, we really thought we'd be talking about how this would mirror and, and go in conjunction with the governor's order, um, but that hasn't happened. And so we're here um, and bringing up these issues and discussing whether we should relax uh, the two issues that we control um, while we're still waiting on further direction from the governor. So again, these are before you for your consideration. I'd have, be happy to take any questions or discuss anything in further. Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before we get knee deep in the beaches and the pools, and I think all of us come at it from a perspective that we want to open the beaches, we want to open the pools as soon as humanly possible. People are, are asking for that. But before we get too knee deep into that discussion, can we take a step back? And if Dr. Cho is on the line, can we talk about the actual virus and, and those numbers of flattening the curve and the severity of the impacts and our, all those kind of things about the actual virus? Because I know we've talked about it a lot over the last several weeks, a lot. There's still folks out in the public as evidenced by the emails and, and messages that we're getting that people don't completely understand what the virus is and the impact and whether or not chlorine can kill it or sunlight can kill it or all those kind of things. So if we could kind of just take a step back and get a little bit of virus information from Dr. Cho, I think that would be helpful for our, our viewers. Thank you. So um, good morning, everybody. Can, you can hear me? Yep. Okay. So just uh, in terms of my update, um, obviously, um, uh, the, the, this is a novel virus. There's still as much unknowns as there are knowns. Uh, so I do preface it with that. 
Um, I want to thank uh, first the, the staff at DOH. I want to thank our community partners, the hospitals, EMS, law enforcement, emergency management, uh, BCC, among others, really working to tackle this uh, difficult uh, pandemic. Now, in terms of some of our numbers, um, uh, as of this afternoon report, we'll have uh, 709 cases with 31 deaths, uh, 17 of which uh, com are coming from the long-term care facility. Um, in Florida, we have uh, over 32,000 cases uh, with, with um, over, I'm sorry, 1,088 deaths. Uh, the focus, as Barry mentioned, uh, needs to remain that, uh, the vulnerable population. Uh, these are individuals that once infected have the higher risk for developing severe complications. Uh, those older than 65, those with chronic health conditions such as diabetes, obesity, uh, high blood pressure, lung disease, I mean, compromised conditions. So uh, looking a little uh, further at the numbers, uh, over those over the age of 65 uh, comprise of 83% of the deaths and 54% of the hospitalizations. So it really underscores the importance of protecting the vulnerable population, especially the elderly and especially within the long-term congregate setting. Um, to, to that end, and obviously we have seen those increases within our long-term care facilities here in Pinellas counties, we've developed a long-term care uh, a f a care facility uh, task force comprised of hospitals, emergency management, fire and rescue, emergency management, B the BCC and DOH. Um, and obviously we wanna prevent that from happening. So um, we are gonna continue on working with ACA uh, as well as uh, emergency management, making those calls, uh, educating some of those facilities. Um, and then we've uh, partnered with fire rescue to provide that uh, education uh, as it pertains to PPE, the appropriate uh, appropriate donning and doffing. So hopefully we've amplified all those things that need to be in place to prevent this from occurring in the, in the first place. And then with cases, uh, we do have a, a process in place with uh, joint assessments with DOH and ACA, uh, as well as uh, FIRE. Um, and then we, uh, what the state has created on a regional as well as a, on a regional level uh, is some resources that we can in, uh, deploy to assist with that, including infection control resources in terms of education, uh, in terms of the clinical augmentation team, as well as uh, facility testing. Um, uh, Commissioner Justice, you mentioned sunlight. I, I know that's been asked before. I, I, uh, again, that would probably fall under the unknown category. Uh, there are some experts that do believe that if, if, if it responds like a, a, any other uh, respiratory virus, that it is more susceptible to sunlight, the heat, the humidity. Uh, but um, I, I think it's um, too early to say definitively. And, and if it were to act in, in that kind of fashion, uh, that um, it, it would, uh, we would see a lower number in the summers, but then potentially see a peak in the fall when we, uh, the, the seasons get a little cooler. So I think time will tell on that, whether that does have a huge impact. Um, and obviously with this virus, the, the testing is key. Uh, we have in Pinellas tested in both the private and public sector over 13,400 uh, individuals. Um, uh, DOH does offer testing at mainly our St. Petersburg site and Mid-County site. Uh, we do ask uh, to call for uh, an assessment and, a, and an appointment at uh, 824-6900. Um, we've been fortunate here in Pinellas County that a number of private labs and hospitals have developed their own capabilities. So increasing uh, testing, we need to continue to hopefully uh, um, increase it further. Uh, what we've also done here at the health department is that we've uh, are trying to do some of these outreaches uh, in partnership with some of the jurisdictions as well as uh, where uh, supplies last. So uh, we just did one this uh, yesterday at Child's Park and we're gonna continue to look for those types of opportunities. And again, it's really contingent uh, on the available supplies as well. Um, there has been uh, questions on antibody testing. Uh, that is somewhat of a new technology uh, diagnostic tool. Um, and, and certainly I think uh, some of the benefits of antibody testing is that it can give you sort of what we call the seroprevalence, meaning how many people uh, have been infected in the past and, and maybe give a bigger picture as to the disease burden in our community. Uh, there's also uh, the having, uh, having evidence of an exposure, uh, uh, whether it confers immunity, uh, again, is, is something that uh, is uh, up for debate. Because what, um, what they're seeing, especially in countries such as South Korea, some of these other countries that have uh, had dealt with this uh, infection earlier is that a number of individuals and a, a percentage have, have been reinfected or reactivated with the infection. So having, um, at this point, we don't know whether having an infection uh, confers uh, immunity. Um, and again, it's something that the, uh, the scientists are looking at. 
So with uh, any reopening, I, I think what's mentioned also is contract tracing, um, contact tracing. Um, that is a, a, a special function that we've always uh, deployed here uh, at the Department of at Public Health uh, through our epidemiology unit. And simply put, uh, what contact tracing is uh, um, tracing anyone that has been in contact with a positive case. Um, obviously, as, as we uh, ease some of the, the restrictions, I think some of the challenges is that uh, as numbers grow, uh, that um, as well as the complexity, the different locations that we have to uh, do these contact tracing can present somewhat of a challenge. But what we've done here uh, at the health department, uh, even since the beginning of this, was try to increase our capabilities uh, pertaining to this. Um, we've deployed, uh, we've asked, and we've gotten four uh, FE students, as well as recent grads from the College of Public Health at USF. Uh, we have uh, trained and utilized some of our clinical staff uh, into some of this epidemiology function as well. And then we're also looking at technologies like uh, more we can do with texting. And I, I know uh, other uh, technology companies such as Microsoft and Google are looking at more uh, technological solutions to, to ease some of this workload as well on a national scale. Now in terms of the trends, um, in terms of the trends, uh, we are, as Mary mentioned, monitoring all those curves in terms of new cases. Uh, we're looking at it both at a local level and a regional level. Uh, and then when you're looking at the new cases, um, it does look like the, the majority uh, has occurred in late March and early February with a plateauing over the last few weeks. Um, and also, as uh, Barry um, uh, alluded to, is that we also look at the percent positivity, uh, which did range uh, 5 to 6 percent for a while. So that is something good in both in um, Pinellas. Uh, Hillsborough looks like it's been averaging around there as well as Pasco. Uh, so we have been monitoring some of those trends. Um, uh, also, uh, the, the, one of the more commonly cited models does show that there was a peak in Florida uh, uh, now uh, two weeks back. Um, other data points um, that we look at is the hospital surge models, looking at ICU and, and hospital bed availability, as well as uh, vent uh, supplies. Um, and I know this, there's, uh, we're really here just uh, talking about reopening. Um, certainly, I, I go with what the experts and the guidance says. Uh, everything needs to be phased. It has to be, uh, there has to be elements of social distancing, uh, no more than 10 in a group, um, with six feet apart. Um, and then with that, uh, we, with the possibility of, with seeing more cases, with the easing of those policies, uh, we need to be sure we can react on that and, and monitor those trends as well. Um, what I'd love to see, um, and I don't see, think I see it enough, I'd love to see more of these cloth masks, uh, especially uh, going with the CDC recommendations that if you, you go to a uh, place like a grocery store where it's, it's difficult to do those social distancing elements, um, I, I think it's important that we continue to push out that messaging uh, to, to wear these cloth masks when you go out in public, especially and more so to the vulnerable population. And with that, uh, yeah, I'm gonna. You, I'm, I probably sound like a broken record at this point. It's 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 gonna be the same preventative messages. This by the social distancing and the safer at home. We didn't eliminate the virus. We we didn't. Um, it's still around. Um, it's it's probably gonna be a, around for a while. So it's gonna be the same messaging. Avoid avoid close contact if possible. Um, uh, stay at home when you're sick, uh, especially from the vulnerable populations. I think as as uh, businesses reopen, uh, having that flexibility on the employer side to telework if feasible. Uh, so I, I think it goes back to, to having elements of that social distancing. So with that, I'll stop there. Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, I think it's important for our citizens to hear all of that great information because what I took away from that was um, a couple of things. One, this is a new virus that we don't know about. So when, you, when your friends, neighbors, uh, whatever, gives you absolute information because they read it in a study somewhere. Um, take that with a really big grain of salt because uh, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. And the, uh, the groups of 10 people, I think it's important to realize it's not a different group of 10 people every day. Um, you wanna keep your universe as small as possible. Um, it's, it's not, well, I went to 10 parties with 10 different people and we were only at 10 people, so we're fine. Uh, I think it's people for important to know that. On the second part, I would like to get uh, uh, Barry and the sheriff, I guess, their thoughts on on uh, the hours of operation for the beach. If it's wide open, they're suggesting um, the thoughts about uh, the parking lots, whether we, we open the parking lots, we have them open halfway. And then really the question of how we enforce the social distancing on the beach when we've got Memorial Day coming up in a few weeks. And um, 
the thoughts about if we see those spring break type crowds on the beach again, how, how are we going to react to that? And are we going to be back here in a couple of weeks? A couple of things. Um, uh, so the issue about hours of operation, I briefly touched on that before. Um, we, you know, I, I think that the, the key is that people spread out. Um, and so if you're on the beach or you're walking down the street for exercise or in a park, the key is that you're not congregating in large groups that increase the risk of you contracting that, just like you mentioned, with uh, dif having different crowds of 10 people. No different at the beach or wherever you're at. Um, the, what, that, what the beach causes is the chance that people will, you know, um, create a party-like atmosphere. And so obviously enforcement's gonna be key to that. Um, it, we talked about hours of operation um, and, and whether or not we, you should limit the types of activities, but we have 35 miles of beach. And so people do have the opportunity to spread out. Um, and you have different types of beaches, you know, even throughout that 35 miles. Um, and so our recommendation, you know, is that we don't limit the hours of operation. We don't try to, you know, um, clear the beach twice a day. Um, but that we enforce the social distancing and we make it very clear that we're easing up on this, but we're also going to enforce it. And so if, you know, you're um, a 20 year old, you know, class reunion thinks that they're going to come down to the beach and, and create a party, they, they, they need to rethink that because that's not going to happen. And so that's going to be key to making sure this works. And we did it before and, and we'll do it again and enforcing that we practice the social distancing. Um, you know, we did talk about whether we should prevent, you know, somebody from bringing a chair and setting out there versus just having it for exercise. We've seen a lot of other uh, places implement different types of measures. Um, but when we go back to the risk factor, whether you're sitting in your chair reading a book or whether you're walking down the beach, there's no real difference in the risk factor, except if you get in large groups. Um, and so we, we just decided that you know, if, if we enforce it and people practice responsibly, which I think the message, you know, has gotten out and people are, for the most part, uh, doing that, if we enforce it, well, then we, we minimize that risk. Um, and so it's going to be, a, a key, the key is going to be to enforcement. The other options are there before you, as you mentioned, um, but, but we, we, we just felt like with 35 miles, people have the opportunity um, to socially distance and that we would not only message that, um, but we would enforce it. So, so Commissioner Justice, in response to your questions, is that we have uh, plans in place uh, and different options available if you were to approve this today. But I can assure you from Fred Howard Park in the north part of Pinellas County, uh, all the way down to the southern tip uh, in Fort DeSoto, uh, along all of the Gulf beaches, that we have uh, a plan in place to make sure there is a strong presence uh, at all the beach access points along that entire uh, area to make sure that people are doing what they need to do. And I can tell you that what we're seeing out there right now, and remember there are people on the beaches because the closures uh, apply to the public beaches. And I was out there this weekend and there's a fair number of people out there uh, and they're doing the right thing. Uh, and this is consistent with what we saw in the past. Remember, uh, during that one week that we had before the governor ordered the shutdown when we were operating under your safer at home order. And we did over 4,000 of those business checks and we found compliance in the absolute majority or to put it the other way, there was non-compliance in less than 1%. At the same time, uh, we saw, as the administrator pointed out, people that were on the beaches and that they were drawing the circles and that they were doing the right thing. So what I've seen uh, is people uh, are generally, and for the absolute most part, uh, adhering to uh, the requirements and doing what they need to do. And I can assure you in the strongest of terms is that we have the resources and we are prepared to uh, enforce this, to make sure that the right thing is done and that it doesn't regress uh, because of people not adhering to the social distancing requirements. You know, we have uh, about 30 uh, available from different resources, uh, ATVs. We've got the uh, personnel uh, that we can put out there on the beach. 
Uh, we're having signs that are made in anticipation of this so that we can remind people. And it really comes down to uh, making sure uh, with that, I'll call it the gentle nudge, and making sure that we don't have uh, what we saw previously. I think the people who caused that situation previously are gone, uh, the spring breakers. Uh, we are coming up here into the summer months, and it's going to be a nice weekend this weekend. So we're prepared for it. As far as the hours are concerned, I support wholeheartedly just opening it up all the way. Um, I, I, it's not feasible uh, to clear the beaches, everything from the north end of Clearwater Beach all the way down to uh, the south end of St. Pete Beach and Pasa Grill. It's not possible just to start clearing people out at 10 o'clock in the morning if they were open to 6 to 10 or something like that. Um, it, also, in the other area from an enforcement standpoint, remember we've got the issue. It just is what it is where we've got the uh, private beach area. And so where do you distinguish if you say, OK, well, you can be here from 6 to 10 on the public area, but the private beach area, uh, you can be there like you are now and you can have a chair on the private beach, but you can't have a chair on the public beach. That just doesn't work. And it's really not, it, you know, people don't know what the rules are and where they can do it. We've got the high water line issue. We've got all the things we've discussed previously. So I think the, the best course, and as far as the parking goes, we had extensive discussions about the parking. I've talked to the cities and the police chiefs that are affected by it. Our concern is, is that by uh, not opening up the parking, all we're going to do is put push the parking into uh, the side streets and into those residential areas. And that's just going to be a mess. So if they're coming, they should have a place to park. And, and really the key to the success of this is on us and making sure that we have the right resources there, we're controlling the environment and are there to offer that nudge, if you will, or the enforcement if it's necessary, uh, which I hope it won't be, uh, to make sure that people do uh, what they need to. And I can tell you we're prepared to do that. So all of these things uh, have been discussed and there, there are uh, pros and cons on both sides, but uh, we believe that this is the uh, best approach uh, at this time. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Seal first, and then Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm glad to hear that you have signs ready, so I'd like to know exactly what those signs are going to say, um, and are they going to be at each beach access point, basically. Um, second is the cities. Um, if they have a different approach that they wish to take, can they? And third, um, I consequences. So um, if you are out there patrolling and somebody isn't going to comply and are you going to give two chances and you're out or where do you go? Are you arrested? You know, what is going to be that? And then the final question is um, when you talk about a strong presence, give me a picture of that. Are you going to have two patrol officers for every mile, or how are we going to um, show that we have a strong presence? Thank you. So I'll take the first two and then the sheriff can take the, the second two about that. So um, in terms of signs, we do have a um, mock um, sign that would say beach open, um, six feet apart, groups no longer, no greater than 10. And they, you know, they're working on the, the, um, the exact format for that. The intent would be that we would print them in mass. Um, we produced over 300 signs for the beach closure. We intend on producing more than that for this um, and not only have them at the, the entrances, but on the beach, throughout the beach to where people are reminded constantly. Um, we even talked about Sheriff and I last night about having large signs that we can actually put on post out on the beach. Um, and the Sheriff's offer didn't make crews to be able to help us in implementing that. We had 100% cooperation from the cities the last time, um, and everybody deployed their crews to make this happen quickly. Um, our biggest issue is just going to be getting the signs printed, and depending upon your decision today on whether there are other restrictions or anything like that, we will we're prepared to to execute that contract and have that uh, those signs made. This literally at, at the conclusion of this meeting. Um, so. You know, that's the piece. The, the cities can do things uh, more restrictive if it's, um, you know, if they so choose to do that. Um, we have talked um, repeatedly with our municipal partners about trying to be consistent um, because, you know, the public doesn't know, you know, the municipal line necessarily of whether you're in San Key or whether you're at a different beach. And so, you know, from a public messaging standpoint, we certainly hope 
that we can um, maintain consistency. And that was kind of the commitment on the city's call. They, they thought the approach that we were taking was uh, reasonable. Um, everybody, as you saw from the <laughs> from the uh, responses, had different ideas, as you would expect. And each time you ask 24 different um, cities, um, and everybody's got a little approach. But, but we've debated those issues and incorporated everybody's thoughts into trying to find something that's reasonable. We talked, okay, should we do limited hours? Well, then, you know, a different city says, yeah, but in my city, it's going to spill over into the beach because we have very limited public parking areas. And so it's going to spill over into residential neighborhoods. So every, every, there's a, a different nuance for each. We took all that in consideration and coming to the recommendations that we, we have before you. I'll turn over to share for the other two enforcement issues. Yeah, and, and, and as far as the signs go, Commissioner Seal, as far as I'm concerned, and I believe the administrator and I are on the same page, we can't have too many signs. Uh, we, we need to have, we need to have uh, uh, a tremendous reminder all the time that this is not just business as usual. Um, and uh, if you all were to allow this, that it has to be done uh, with uh, limitations and it has to be done with uh, restraint by the individuals who are there and that they don't violate it. And so we're going to be there uh, in presence and I'll get to that here's in response to your question, but also the constant reminder of the signs. And what we're talking about are double faced signs, putting them all the access, putting them in the beaches and just making sure that people see these uh, bright colored signs. You can't have too many of them because it'll be a constant reminder. So as far as uh, the amount of personnel are concerned, um, I would say and we're, we have a variety of different plans uh, that are options for us. And if the vote today is, is to reopen them, we've got all those laid out and we'll start implementing that uh, with the implementation date if that's what's proposed this Thursday. Um, I would say uh, a minimum that we'd have out there is about 100 deputies. Uh, and my plan is, is to have a person at every beach access point. So that means every place from, and I'll say, and I've talked to Chief Slaughter about this in Clearwater, uh, he's on board with this. And if they need help in Clearwater, we'll help them in Clearwater. But I believe he's got the resources to address this Clearwater Beach. He's also got the North End uh, up there, which is different than the area around Pier 60. Um, we are for sure going to cover everything. The Sheriff's, is going to, sheriff's office is going to cover everything, and from Fred Howard Park, uh, Dunedin Causeway, which is very important uh, in the city of Dunedin, uh, Sand Key Park, and everything all the way south to Fort Soto. And we'll have somebody, especially for this weekend, because what's really important is the initial messaging on this, and we set the tone from the get-go with it. So starting Thursday, you get into Friday, Saturday and Sunday especially, is, is that they see somebody that they're passing before they go out on the beach. When they get on the beach, probably uh, we'll have somebody about every half mile plus uh, 25 people out there on the various ATVs that we have. We also have about an additional five or six four by fours out there. So what I envision is, again, that strong presence because that creates the reminder and that we stop any potential issue before it becomes an issue. We don't want to deal with issues, we're going to stop them ahead of time. And if we see something going in the wrong direction, we're going to go up to those people and say, look, you just can't be doing what you're doing. And if you're not, which gets to the second part of your question uh, is, is that, and if you're not going to play by the rules, then you need to leave. The last thing in the world that I want to do, and the last thing in the world I think we all want to do, is they have to take any type of an enforcement action, meaning whether somebody gets cited, whether they get a notice to appear, whether they get arrested or anything along those lines. And as I said it before, and I'll say it again, is, is that you're gonna to have to beg your way uh, into an enforcement action, but if you beg, you're gonna get it. And you know, we had one person you know, during the, the uh, Safer at Home order that did just that. And uh, he wanted to become very unreasonable, or frankly, he wanted to be a jerk about it, and so he went to jail. I have no desire and no intention of doing that, and I really believe that the people of Pinellas County the people who are going to visit our beaches are just going to do the right thing. And the reason why I say that is because they've demonstrated that already and by what they're doing and what we've seen in the past. But if we have those one-offs and those people that uh, want to uh, push the envelope or play games, well, we will deal with it. I assure you that I'm not going to let it get to a point where it's a problem. Same thing out on Gandy, uh, same thing on Accordion Campbell Causeway, all of these areas is that we're fortunate uh, that we've got the resources uh, with the equipment and we've got the people that we can implement this in the right way to give the people uh, the latitude that they're asking for, but to make sure that it's measured and we keep it within the rails and the bookends and that we don't have a problem uh, like we did in the past. And I know we can accomplish that. 
Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I really appreciate all of the, uh, the work, uh, the gut uh, that was put into the, uh, the information that we got this weekend. Um, and so, uh, you know, just a few different thoughts. Uh, number one is that um, in my mind, I was, I was kind of looking at May as a, as a perfect opportunity to transition from where we are today to where it might be what you consider um, a complete openness in, in all regards. Um, so, so some thoughts about number one, are, do we consider ourselves in phase one as defined by the federal government? Um, are we there yet? Are we there three out of five? Are we there four out of five? I think that's kind of important to understand where we sit. Um, I also was thinking about the month of May, uh, kind of looking in every couple of weeks to see what's happened from the time two weeks before when we made that, that, that decision. Um, have we seen uh, significant changes? So, and then, and then uh, the, the thought about this is a regional issue as well when it comes to beaches. In other words, if Pasco, Hernando, excuse me, Pasco and Hillsboro and Manatee, if they're all, I mean, I know they're starting to open, but if they were all closed, Honeymoon Island's still closed. It, it, it exerts a lot more pressure on our 35 miles of beaches. And so it'd be good to understand that piece uh, as well. Um, the, um, the idea that we kind of take it slowly to me. So, so just if maybe we could talk a little bit about where we sit from a phase perspective, and then uh, just a little discussion about how we, how we compare to the region as, as it relates to beach uh, open, opening. Uh, beach. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Walters. You ready for me now, Madam Chair? Yes, yes sir. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, hold on. I oh, asked, can, can we get some of those questions answered? Sure. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, it's not when you do an online meeting, you get. Um, so the issues about the way, the phase we were in under a the federal government guidelines. Um, I, I would say that from the issue of the data analysis and the 14 day window that we're consistent with a phased reopening under the federal order. The pieces that we're not is where we're, is with the testing and with the contract tracing. And those are, I believe, will be addressed as part of the governor's order. His, his um, subgroups, um, his advisory panel has discussed both of those. Um, but again, we have yet to get direction out of um, the governor of where he's going to go with that. So. I, and I think that that's critical to, for him to articulate that as part of a broader strategy. If we were here talking about impacts on businesses, it would be a much broader discussion. You know, if, um, and we, I didn't put in our thoughts in terms of a phased reopening regarding businesses because there's no sense in having that conversation twice. I, we say we don't believe movie theaters should be open. Well, well, we really have to wait and see what the governor does in order to say whether that's a reasonable conversation or not. But obviously, anything that has an enclosed presence and and the potential for large group gatherings is a much higher risk, um, and and would you know require careful um, consideration. So we we do want to have that discussion. We just need to wait until the governor's order. But a lot of the phased implementation ideas in the presidential guidance is related to those two issues, which have to be addressed as part of the governor's order. We only are looking at those two, and from a data standpoint, we're consistent in terms of seeing that steady decline, sufficient hospital capacity, sufficient um, uh, downward trend in our trajectory. And so that's the reason we're here discussing those two pieces. What about, what about the region, Honeymoon Island and um, and the other and, and the other communities around us. Have you so heard? Pas what yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so Pasco is opening. Um, so they, of course, they have very small beaches. Um, you know, or a beach. Um, they have opened. Um, they're opening their parks. They're opening that. Um, Manatee. I, I don't know. Sarasota is opening beaches um, with restrictions. So everybody's doing it a little bit different. Um, you know, and we've seen you know a, a lot of the beaches on the east coast um, open. So um, I think everybody's at that point where they're seeing the same types of numbers um, and trying to make those decisions currently. Um, and, and so I, I think that, and I did 
submit over to Hillsboro to kind of see what they're doing. And they're they're going through the same analysis and the same discussion that we're having here, except obviously theirs is a little different because it's mainly around business because they don't have the, the beaches uh, that, that we do. We just have one other question for the sheriff. Um, on, we, we were talking about, and I, I kind of agree with you on the opening and closing twice a day, and it seems a little bit difficult. Um, the one thought I was thinking about was we look at our trails around the county that um, and I'm not saying they're directly, you know, they didn't directly correlate to the beaches, but I noticed that during the week, it's pretty, pretty good. It was pretty busy, but it's very, you know, easy flowing on the weekend. It's just absolutely crazy. And I think we need to do a better job at our key intersections and identifying some, some, some spacing areas. But, um, has there been any thought to maybe during the month of May uh, opening during the week, Monday through Friday, just open it up like you're talking about and on the weekend, just do it for exercise. Um, so we're able to take those, the, the at least for the first couple of weekends, just to kind of see how things actually pan out and give you all a chance to really adapt to, to uh, that situation. Just, just a quick thought on that. Well, well, Commissioner, I think the, the reason to not do that is the reason you raised in the first part of your uh, question is the reason why we're seeing, I believe, all these people on the trails and probably one in particular you're talking about is the cross trail along A-19 through Dunedin and Palm Harbor uh, and into downtown Dunedin especially and up by the causeway is because people are compressed into one area. And part of the analysis and part of our thought in this is is that if you open the beaches and the trails are already open, the parks are open, and then you open the pools, is you're going to have spreading out. And we are absolutely seeing, because people have been compressed and pushed into one corner, so they stay in that corner. So if you open up more, you're going to allow them to spread out more. And what we were hoping for, as the administrator said, that we would see some action by the governor in conjunction with this, where you'd also have some people go into businesses that were now open and businesses opening up, et cetera. Again, we have no control over that. So I believe the better approach is, is to see it uh, open it all up at once. And I know we can deal with it. And another to point and kind of goes to the first part of your question to the administrator as well and surrounding areas. I can tell you that the uh, east part of the Courtney Campbell Causeway this past weekend, the Tampa side was packed, absolutely packed. And it's because people are being squeezed into wherever they can squeeze into where there's either not enforcement or where it's allowed. So in, I, I believe there, there's good merit to open it up it all at one time and it'll allow it to spread out. And, and it actually makes it easier for us to manage. Now, it's going to require a little bit more as far as personnel, but I'm good with that. We can handle it. Is that, but it keeps people from uh, that bloom, bloom being squeezed and people being wedged in a corner. So I don't think there's anything, uh, and I hear you, and these are all you know good thoughts and it's all part of the discussion. Uh, but I think we just open it all up and get through the initial process. We set the right tone, we set the right message, and we just ensure that people do the right thing. Uh, and if we set it from the get-go and people are clear as to what the expectation is, um, I think we can get there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Long, can you hear me? So I, I know she's on mute, but she's a, an advanced certified county commissioner. Uh, and I'm just a regular certified county commissioner. But they ought to add a class about governing in an era of uncertainty <laughs> and uncertain data. Um, so I just have a couple of comments and then a couple of questions for Dr. Cho and Dr. Jameson. Uh, working backwards on the spring break on the beaches issue, you know, the fear that, you know, the nightmare we have is that spring break scenario. And I know um, that the sheriff and administrator, you know, have stated the ability to enforce that, that we're past that. Um, I am concerned, as Commissioner Justice said, about Memorial Day. Uh, so I'm hopeful if we go this route that we certainly have the resources to control that. Because obviously we have much better beaches in Jacksonville. We've got the best beaches in the world and it's gonna be a, a better draw than Jacksonville or any other beaches in the state. Um, you know, and I think it's worth mentioning again what Barry said that our thought coming into this is that we would have a comprehensive approach that the governor's order would expire. We'd be able to get those non-essential businesses back in in action because to me the other items on our agenda today are just as important if not more um, because folks are are basically without any money for food and uh -huh. 
you know, we had farm share this week, uh, Commissioner Justice, and I attended feeding Tampa Bay at the trough where the line for cars was six blocks long at 730 in the morning. Uh, and so folks are really hurting. I think that's part of the, the issue, uh, the kind of angst that we're seeing in the streets. It's not just about, you know, the beaches and the condo pools. Um, but we, we might not have that uh, resolution from the governor. Uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to support uh, opening the beaches right now uh, for a number of reasons. One being the sequencing of this. And I think we had several uh, cities that weighed in on uh, Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach, the city of Clearwater, Tarpon. Um, I think sequencing this with opening those businesses first, as the sheriff said, where you've got folks going to businesses, going to work, you're, you're distributing those folks instead of all in funneling into the beaches uh, would be better. And also we'll, we'll see what the governor's plans are, hopefully in, in a day or so. Um, if we do go that route, I hope we take the clear water route where we limit it to exercise, walking, and limit, you know, gathering, standing, those kinds of things uh, as a preventive measure. One of the issues I have is, is the testing. And I know it's been mentioned that we're not, as, as Commissioner Eggers uh, alluded to, we're not at that robust testing level that's in the federal guidelines. Uh, and for Dr. Cho, one question that uh, we received on Facebook last night, was in reference to a, a Hillsborough, an article in the Times about Hillsborough County, uh, basically saying that anybody over there can be tested if they want to. That was from their emergency management director. Where do we stand in Pinellas in terms of having this kind of on-demand uh, testing? Is that really where Hillsborough is right now? And I'll have to verify the where the resources uh, are for Hillsborough and how they're getting the supply chain and the, the swab. So I do need to reach out to them. And um, uh, regarding uh, Pinellas County, um, I, I think it, it has gotten better. Um, but, uh, but to be honest, to some extent, that robust testing is, is a federal and, and a state issue as well because of the, the supplies that need, need to go along with those type testing. Um, what we have uh, here is that um, in terms of the DOH testing, we do have the the criteria we uh, use, and as uh, I suspect that uh, we reopen and potentially increase cases, uh, will there be easing of some of that guidance and so we can test more? Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, um, it, it is going to be contingent uh, on, on getting the adequate number of supplies, the PPEs needed uh, to do those types of tests. Okay. And according to the Times article, it says um, you no longer need to show symptoms to get tested. It's basically on demand. So I'm really interested in knowing if that is in fact the case, and if so, can we move to that in Pinellas County? What does it take to, to get there? Um, the other thing I'm concerned about is, you know, who is the represent, who's being represented by this sample of folks that are being tested? Um, I think what you did out in Charles Park was very important. I think you had 80 folks uh, tested in Charles Park, uh, Dr. Cho. Um, but we don't know where those folks came from, right? They're not necessarily from the Charles Park area. Is that correct? Um, I think uh, I don't have that information in front of me. I'd like to, that was the intent, uh, try okay. to, uh, to get the neighborhoods. But, but basically, um, uh, that was in conjunction with this jurisdiction. So, and, and, and again, going back to having more access points throughout the, the county, I think we're going to try to do more and more of these types of smaller outreaches uh, in coordination with those uh, particular jurisdictions. Okay. And so I'm not trying to go back to statistics 101, but that that low percentage of positives really depends on who's being tested and one of the concerns i have is we've seen the disproportionate impact on uh, minority communities around the nation but we're not seeing it here and that kind of brings the question are we really testing uh, the minority population in pinellas county um, is that the reason for that difference um and so the last question is really for both dr jameson and dr cho and you knew this was coming. Um, so this, this uh, recommendation of opening up the beaches, uh, in your medical opinion, does that, with all of the safeguards that have been talked about, does that present an acceptable level of risk in your medical opinion? So <clears throat> good morning. I'll jump in there for a minute. 
Um, I guess I would start by saying that uh, it appears that our community's efforts have had some impact uh, in terms of uh, slowing the, the spread of this disease. Um, and, and more particularly, if we talk about flattening the curve, sort of slowing the rate of growth of this uh, infection rather than the absolute numbers. Um, and so for that, uh, again, I'd like to say thank you to the community uh, and thank you for your sacrifice as a healthcare worker. I, I really appreciate it, so keep it up. Um, number two, um, you know, to be clear, um, the number of folks becoming infected with COVID, the total number of cases continues to rise. Uh, and there are still people becoming infected and there are still people who are having severe disease and even dying from COVID right here in, in Pinellas County. And just as uh, our current restrictions appear to have had some success in slowing that wave, I, I think it's reasonable to expect that any relaxation in those restrictions would have an opposite effect of potentially allowing more increase in those cases. Now, whether or not that's reasonable and whether or not that's acceptable uh, is really um, a very complicated decision because I think we're all uh, understanding that keeping a complete uh, level of, of lockdown or, or stay at home or uh, only essential activities is simply you know, not gonna be sustainable in the long term. Um, an expert I listened to said uh, he thinks we're in about the second inning of this game with this virus. Um, so we're pretty, we're pretty early. Um, and uh, we're really gonna need to learn to live with this virus over the next three months, six months, maybe even 18 months uh, until such time as we have a vaccine or we have uh, a high enough level of immunity within the community, which again is still under some debate as to whether or not you can get reinfected. Uh, but if that's the case, we really need to get to a point where we figure out how to sustainably uh, keep this virus at bay uh, without overly taxing the community. Uh, so things like, you know, uh, allowing people to get back to work, to make a living. Uh, we all know that, that uh, you know, economics is very high on the list of uh, determinants of the health status of a population. Uh, and so those types of things, we really need to, to balance against what's going on with the virus. Um, so I can't say 100% that it's reasonable to do any one of these activities, uh, but what I would say is, is that any of them uh, would be expected to potentially have an effect just in the same way that the staying at home has an effect. Uh, and so weighing that uh, as to what the community uh, feels is the appropriate uh, level of risk tolerance, I think is important. Uh, I would also say, um, making sure that we have a discussion about what to do if the cases do uh, significantly increase and are we willing to go backwards uh, as a community is, is a very important discussion to have ideally before uh, we start lifting the restrictions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Long, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair, I surely did. And um, let me just say, I really, really do appreciate hearing the thought process from all of my colleagues here. And yes, Commissioner Welch, I do clearly remember all those classes and how much time and effort it took. But I'd like to just raise the conversation a little bit, if, if you would allow me, because, you know, we, we are elected to lead and to govern. And we all know from experience, nothing about that is easy. And it comes with an enormous responsibility. When I get really hung up on or struggle in making decisions about important issues that we're talking about today, I go right back to a very basic thing I learned in my first couple of years of being an elected official. And you all probably know it well too. It's the Briggs-Myers grid. Do you remember learning about that? The things they focus on for public health and safety and our mental well-being, our food, clothing, a roof over our head, and community. And so when I think about the discussions we've had this morning, I'm heartened by 
Commissioner Egger's comments with regard to the month of May. You know, the month of May has many beautiful celebrations from a civic perspective as well as a religious one. Mother's Day is about 10 days from now. And I think it's a beautiful religious holiday, civic holiday, community holiday to focus our efforts on thinking about what a fabulous message it would be if we could signal our intent to bring our business community up over Mother's Day. And I know all of these comments are predicated on what the governor decides to do. Um, it's not very comforting to me that he seems to feel he has to go to Washington to get the blessing of the president before he can make a decision about our state. We were doing just fine with our own order, and I'd like to see us go back to that. Because for me, having the ability for our citizens to be employed, to put food on the table and a roof over their head with some kind of, uh, uh, you know, hope that they're going to be back to some level of normalcy is much more critical than being able to go to the beach or swim in a swimming pool. And so I think if we could focus on that for um, the future and then judge from then until Memorial Day how things are going with the idea that we would come back and assess if there's an uptick, if there's a not an uptick, if things are still leveling off. Because quite frankly, from all the data that I've listened to over this past week, it appears to me we've had approximately a little over 20 days since we reached the high point um, of the peak in our county. And right now, it's about the best it's going to be for a long, long time with regard to numbers of cases that we see. And on top of that, you know, we are nowhere near where we need to be to be able to do testing on demand. And we keep getting all these questions about why aren't you doing testing and where are all the tests? Well, I think it's really important to stress again that the testing supply chain comes from the feds down to the states and then to us. So there's a lot of moving pieces and that's my point. And I just think before we think about doing anything, we need to really put a plan in place to get people fed, a roof over their heads, and back to work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Peter. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a couple of questions for Dr. Cho. Um, this morning you talked about the new cases and you've already stated that, I think you said 80, let's see what you said, 83% of the deaths have been uh, people older than 65. Um, but you said on an earlier call this morning that when you take out the nursing home positive cases, the average percent, I think you said 1%, is that correct, Dr. Cho? Uh, no, I think that we were talking about the deduplication of the percent positivity. Uh, I think. So, could you explain that? So, uh, please? so uh, percent positivity—it's the number of cases over the the nominated number of tests provided. We've been consistently uh, in the states been sort of using a methodology to count everybody, and we've been in Pinellas County about five to six percent, <clears throat> um, uh, along with some of our surrounding counties. Uh, what they've done recently and what we've done and looked at internally also is uh, we took away some of the ones um, that had duplicate testing. Uh, there's some uh, circumstances where you have to repeat testing, so it's double counting some of those individuals, and when we took that out, um, the percent positivity ranged about 2 to 3% over the last at least five days. So we know we had a problem with several of our nursing homes and that the nursing homes were the major spikes, and just tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, it was the nursing home um, residents and the staff that gave us extreme spikes on our positive test, uh, test correct? Yes, uh, the majority over the last uh, three days were uh, from the long-term care facilities. Okay, and you had said that it wasn't conclusive on UV, UV rays and sunlight, heat and humidity on whether or not it would kill this virus? Yes, ma'am. 
um, because I I thought that there was a statement, or at least you said this morning, that although all viruses, most, well, I guess you said all viruses, but we don't know about this one, UV rays, heat, humidity, sunlight do kill the virus. And I do know that we're using UV light to um, sanitize masks. So um, so I know you, you're not sure on that, but I do have a question about, uh, you know, we had a woman call last week and she was talking about her child that is in a wheelchair and that's handicapped and that exercise is important. And um, I, I guess maybe you couldn't answer this, but I'm relatively certain for autistic children, um, being in water helps the noise in their body. It helps with, um, actually I looked it up so I made sure it was right. It helps with their cognitive processing and helps with their speech. Um, as far as development goes, it also helps with their social skills, self-esteem. So I feel it's really critical for the health, not only for autistic children and senior citizens, that they have the right to use their own private property to, um, for health reasons to use their swimming pools. Now, I understand that getting people resources, um, that they haven't been able to get unemployment, um, that's been a real big problem. People need to get access to resources so they can feed their family. There's no question. I'm not de denying that that isn't a question. Um, but I do believe the right to use their own private property um, for health reasons is something that's critically important. And I understand that it's being diminished because pools shouldn't be more important than resources. And I understand that resources are important. Um, but we can't expedite that unemployment. We can take our plans on our resources and that we're gonna talk about next. And I think that's critically important and the most important, but I won't deny and say that swimming pools are not important, especially for that woman who has a handicapped child, especially for our senior citizens that can't ride a bike, can't jog, can't walk very well because of their hips and knees. And we've taken away their ability to stay healthy and keep their immune system strong. Um, and so I, I hear that you all think, you know, resources are important. They are absolutely important. Um, but I think we've picked winners and losers here when it comes to swimming pool. The fact that I live in a private residence and I have a pool and I can use it every single day. Yet the person down the street from me living in a condominium can't. Um, they can't exercise, they can't do all that. So I'm in strong support of opening the pools. You all know that. I'm in strong support of opening the beaches. I'm in strong support of the next things coming up on the agenda. I think we need to give people hope that, that there is gonna be normalcy. We certainly should give them their private property rights back. Um, and I, I do believe that moving forward, when we come up on the next agenda items, we're going to help come up with a plan to give them resources back. But I do think it's critically important to give them the UV light, the sunlight, the humidity, and that's going to help strengthen their immune system. Um, and I believe that the people have demonstrated, the sheriff seems to have agreed to, the ferry has said the same thing, that people have done the right thing. They've done social distancing. They're being proactive. Nobody wants to get sick. And I think it's time that we trust the people and know that they're gonna do the right thing and give them their property rights back. So thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I would agree. I think in the context of doing the next two things on the agenda and revisiting the uh, business openings later in the week when we find out what the governor's gonna do. But I think this is a good first step phasing um, and I would support opening the beaches and pools again. Um, I'm sure we have, Commissioner Eggers, did you have something? You're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of things real quickly. Some of the comments that have been made and I just really wanted to follow up with that. And that is that um, it is obviously clear to me that we're gonna have a meeting later in the week, Thursday or Friday, because we're gonna to have to respond in some way, um, depending on what the governor says, but we probably ought to be planning to, to have that discussion. Um, and um, I think we need to continue to, to, to gather information in the meantime, between now and then, about what our, our regional partners are doing um, and what some, uh, some of the results of some of the early uh, actions that some of the other areas of the state have done with respect to beaches. Just gets, continue to get some, some feedback on that because um, for me, and I, that's why I was talking about, you know, doing it, opening it up during the week and kind of being careful on the weekend so that we can kind of ease into this. And in two weeks, we can look at some numbers and see what they look like. Um, but I think 
you know, again, I think that, that we got to be looking at that kind of moderate but but uh, forward moving approach. I think it's going to be really important. Um, and just on the numbers, uh, Dr. Cho, you started the conversation this morning with saying we had we had we have 709 cases, and we have had 31 deaths. So. Um, uh, I'm assuming that the 709 cases are those that have been tested positive, but that we currently don't have that many cases. But I'd like some clarification on that real quick. And then I have a couple other questions along that line. Um, yes, Commissioner, it's uh, 709 positive cases. Total. So we don't have that many now. All right. Are you talking about those that resolved as well? Um, because, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So we're, we're tracking that as well. Um, so what, what I have as of a day or two ago, resolutions about 245 of those. Um, okay. Have resolved. And then there's a, that we've also been tracking the number of new cases. And it seems like at least when I was hearing the numbers yesterday, the number of new cases um, are, are really on the decline, uh, but also mostly around our nursing homes. And I'd just like a comment about that as well. Uh, in terms of new cases, it, it lo does look like over the last uh, few weeks, it has uh, flattened um, a plateau to some degree. The, the increases that we've seen over the last week or any of the new, and the majority of those cases uh, have been coming from the long-term care facilities. Yes, sir. Okay, and I think, again, I think we're just trying to put perspective and context here. Um, and, and I think the, the, the pools are kind of a natural extension of the rest of our recreation that we've been doing. I like the idea of getting people back out on the beaches to some degree. I am a little bit concerned with the weekends. Uh, I am a little bit concerned with the context that we're going to be talking about next. And I know we've, we've spent a lot of time <laughs> telling us commissioners that we're not going to talk about those things we don't have control over. And yet, I think for all of us, that becomes the most important component um, is getting folks back to work. And um, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive conversations. I think we can do multiple things at a time, but I just think that they need to be uh, considered together. Um, I certainly um, would be looking forward to kind of moving forward, but maybe uh, giving a little bit of time after we find out on Thursday or Friday, kind of what the governor has said and where we are on the other front, and then making our recommendations to go forward and opening the pools and opening partially or completely on the beaches. But um, anyway, there's just some additional thoughts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, <clears throat> two points. I think the sheriff will be uh, quick to tell us if we're having a problem on the weekends, if we do open up. Um, I think we'll be the first to know. Uh, and Mr. Burton, I, the order that we have, um, says it would take effect immediately, but the cities were asking for two more days. Yeah, we, we clarification on that. We would recommend that you put a date, an effective date on that. So if it's two days and Thursday or, you know, something to that effect, our thought, on, and that was just uh, clarification. Our, our thought on that was to, you know, not open it on a Saturday, you know, necessarily right. because uh, um, then obviously you would get more people. And so, you know, a chance for people to kind of spread out a little bit more. Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is a little bit for the sheriff because I remember during the evacuation that we did of Hurricane Irma that there had been a process in place whereby those folks that lived out on the beaches were able to get passes to be able to, to go back and forth across the mainland. And so my question is, What's the possibility that for the folks that live over on the beaches or uh, I don't know what the exact criteria might be, that they could have passes so that uh, our own citizens have priority over folks that are coming maybe from New York or I don't know, you know, Tampa, other places. Just curious. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's feasible, Commissioner, because what we really wanted was everybody, we call that the barrier island reentry best, and we wanted everybody that lived out there uh, to get one, uh, and we wanted business owners with employees to get enough, etc. And we also weren't worried about the people staying in hotels, because that's for a reentry after a storm. So you, unfortunately though, is, is that we really needed to distribute somewhere in the area of probably about 125,000, 
But the last check, we've only distributed somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30,000 because a whole bunch of people didn't get them. So what you would end up with in that situation is a whole bunch of people that don't have them who truly need to get out there that are just going to get immensely frustrated uh, because they don't have one of those passes and they're true. I, I think that it just, it just wouldn't work because not everybody has one and everybody who would be entitled quote, to be out there wouldn't have one. Uh, and plus you got all the people who are staying and I get it's a few these days, but uh, maybe if this opens up more in some of those hotels out there. So, uh, you know, we talked about that, but I, I it, it just wouldn't work and it would backlog because those people don't have passes then you got to put them in the slow lane and you'd have huge backups at all of the causeways and uh, bridges leading out to the beaches because okay. more people don't have them than do. Okay. Well, thank you for that. My next question. And then I'm, that's the end of my questions, Madam chair is for Jewel. Jewel, um, what's the liability for the County given the fact that condominium association uh, insurance policies state that there's no liability coverage for the use of the swimming pool and it doesn't cover, you know, accidents or in this case, you know, people got really, really sick. Does, would the county be on the hook? I don't Do you know any liability for the county for any issues that would happen on private property. Um, you know, really our only role here would be be saying, are they open or are they closed? And, you know, keep in mind those pools are open, you know, 365 days a year normally under normal circumstances and we have no liability. Uh, so I don't see any, any, any potential liability here should we reopen those. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair sure, Seal. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I, I am very inclined to open the pools and I think they can be thoughtfully open in a couple of days. Um, one of my questions is, would the homeowners associations have the right to keep them closed if they so desire? And then um, another thing that we haven't talked about, and we've been seeing the increase um, in cases in the long-term facilities. Well, some of those long-term facilities have pools. So are we going to allow those to reopen? And one of the hoteliers also sent um, me some guidelines that they had put together for their hotel, it was very thoughtful. And one was that they, um, all food and beverage service around a pool at a commercial establishment would be prohibited. So um, are we just going to let everyone make up their own guidelines or are we going to do something more specific so that people understand these beyond social distancing, you know, um, no more than 10 people, et cetera, that they have a, a better idea of how to govern. And um, the, I guess with the beaches, I would like to open them. I think that opening them in two days is, is going to be difficult to do it in a thoughtful and considerate manner. I saw Courtney Campbell this weekend. It was a mess. I was on Edgewater Drive last night. It was a mess. They have people driving from all over to put out their hammocks and put out their picnics and put out their, which I love. I want to get back to being normal, but I am concerned that we will be starting an influx of, of more disease. And as already been stated, we don't have on-demand testing. We don't have contact tracing. Um, those are part of phase one of everything that I've read, not only at the federal guidelines, but other guidelines as well. So I, um, again, I just want us to be thoughtful and mindful of what also Dr. Jameson said. So what are we going to do if we do have an uptick? Are we going to close? You know, we do, we need to have a modulated plan. Thank you. Let me address a couple of issues if I can, Madam Chair. The first, mm -hmm. there, there's no requirement for a condo pool to reopen um, if they so choose to keep their pool closed. Um, and and I do think it's incumbent upon um, the either hotels, condos to take reasonable plans on how they're gonna enforce the social distancing. One of the things we put in there is the enhanced cleaning methods. 
Um, the same thing what we say if we open up beaches, the enhanced cleaning methods for our public restrooms. Um, prior to the order, when we implemented stay at home, we had hourly cleaning um, on the public restrooms. Um, is, does that eliminate, you know, the risk? Well, it certainly minimizes it. So it's a reasonable step. So, you know, it's going to be incumbent upon them to take, be, be responsible to keep, to keep the residents safe um, and implement those practices. Um, whether, and, you know, so they're going to have to come up with an individual plan. There's just so many different scenarios in terms of pools. Um, and we've heard from those residents where you've got um, a lot of snowbirds that are gone back. And so you only have a third of the people in the building. And so they're not going to have a capacity issue to those that are have more active pools. Um, and, and in fact, are going to have to take proactive steps to make sure that they don't have a problem. Uh, that'll be part of the responsibility of not only the pool owner, um, but also a check from the sheriff's office and make sure they're doing it right. Um, you know, the food service is another, you know, issue, obviously, right now, you know, food service is shut down. So it'll be, uh, uh, we'll see how the, how that impacts from the governor's order. Um, after the governor's order, there, you know, if there's issues there, there, there could be local orders that we would uh, take uh, on addressing that. But I don't know if they're, if they're looking at that as similar to like a curbside or something, we'd ha have to think through that. I haven't, we haven't really discussed that particular piece on full, full side service. Um, and, you know, and then in, in terms of the beaches in two days, well, you know, I think the one thing that the, the reality was setting in as we're talking about this, and I asked Dr. Cho, um, you know, we're looking at less than 10 cases a day, right, in a county of a million people is what we're seeing. Now, did when we did the Seminole Pavilion, did we see an uptick that day? Sure, right, because we did testing and something where we knew there was a risk. So, but for the most part, it's something less than that. And when you pull out the double test, then, you know, it's significantly less than that. The, the question I ask is, okay, when we get to June or July, are we still going to have five, six, you know, seven people test positive? And the answer, uh, unfortunate answer is probably yes. Um, and so if, you know, if it's the new norm, if it's um, trying to implement reasonable procedures to learn to live in the environment where we're, until we have a cure, um, we're still going to have new cases. Well, then, then is are the reason are the actions reasonable, and getting to uh, that that next phase of the way that we're going to have to live and operate. And that's kind of the thought process we had in trying to uh, say whether it's reasonable to make you know relax these standards or not. Can I address um, a couple of those things, Commissioner. Sure. So on the food service, uh, Commissioner Seal, that's going on now. Uh, quite honestly, is, is that we see it uh, where people are getting uh, to go and take out and they're taking it to parks and they're taking it out on the beaches or the, in the causeways, et cetera. So that's going on now and um, it wouldn't be any different. If somebody gets a burger and they go sit in their chair and they're six feet apart from everybody else, that's what's happening right now. And you're seeing it, it with a lot of the parks that are people are getting to go up and down Gulf Boulevard. We're seeing that now. So I, I don't think that's any different than uh, what we're currently seeing. Um, as far as the two day is concerned, is that in anticipation that this could happen, uh, this isn't two day. We've been planning this for probably about the last 10 days that it might happen. So there's been a lot of discussion. I've talked with uh, the cities. I've talked with the police chiefs that are uh, affected, uh, that are partners in this. And we've you know been working on this. So this is not just, you know, it, it, it is with your decision in a timetable potentially, uh, but the plan's in place, and I, I know that this could be uh, affected uh, appropriately and uh, within a couple of days. As far as what you're seeing on Edgewater Drive or on the causeway, that's going to continue. Uh, and I'd suggest to you that the only way it's going to continue is if you give people an additional outlet. And here's why. It goes back to what I told you last week, and we're still seeing it. We're seeing a lot, a lot of pushback. And we're seeing people just say no. And that puts us in a situation that I don't want to be in and I don't want them to be in because when people say no to us, we either have to turn around and walk away or we've got to do something about it. And I don't want to have to do something about it. So that puts us in the situation where we are right now with a lot of this, we're just not engaging because it's a no win situation. And I see the win and the way out of this is to open it up and let us handle it and let us handle it in a regulated way and in a measured way as opposed to what we have now. And that's just going to continue. Uh, because 
it's not worth the battle with these people and their level of impatience really it grows every day and i see it every day out there and i'm out there myself and i see this with people and they're just simply saying not not doing it and that's just a bad position to be in mr Rager. real quickly uh, when we talk about pools um are we talking uh, since we are we talking about community pools as well um, that that um, I know that there are a lot of them out there, and uh, we've been careful to keep our play our, our parks open, our playgrounds closed, um, our our shelters closed, so that we don't have a lot of congregating. Um, but if we're going to open up, keep the parks open, are we going to keep the playgrounds closed and the shelters closed, and are what are we going to do with the pools? I think that uh, we need to probably have that discussion, um, and. Um, I think, you know, the reasonable approach to opening um, is really going to be important is when we get a chance to talk about the business aspect of this. So how are they going to open? How are they going to open the right way? How are they going to be ready for customers, the new customer that expects cleanliness and all of that? So our standards, our messaging to them, take it easy, slow it down, make sure you got everything right and you're ready to go is an important message. I, I certainly appreciate the, the sheriff's comment about being ready in two days, um, that there's something also that we need to think about, and that's the psychological thoughts of our residents who have, you know, put themselves in their homes for the last six weeks, with you know trying to be careful and do the right things, and to just, to just you know, so to speak, rip the bandaid off in two days. Uh, I think gives them a, a certain sense of unsettled, uh, and it also gives our, the, if we wait till Monday, for instance, it gives our those those business owners out on the beach a little bit more opportunity. It gives the, 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 the communities, I know they're getting ready, but it's still, when you, when you turn that switch on, it's going to be a lot different. So again, I just think it's all about readiness, I think. And I, you know, I've had this conversation with my son at home. It's just getting our businesses ready. It's getting our community ready, getting our residents ready. Uh, but, you know, in that minimize, in minimizing risk as much as we can. And uh, I just think if you just, you know, we're, we're going in that right direction. And I think we, we feel it. I can see it, sense it in our conversation, but just, you know, just be a little bit careful how we un, how we open that up. That's, that's my last comment, but just, we need to talk about the pools again, uh, community pools, playgrounds and that kind of thing. Make sure that we're all on the same page. Thank you. So in terms of our parks, our parks obviously have been open. The playgrounds um, that, you know, when we have implemented our stay at home order, that was the last thing that I wanted to recommend to you is that we close our playground equipment. Um, but when I saw 30 kids, you know, that go and come and they're not, you know, small groups that, that from one family and they're intermixing and they're, you know, <laughs> doing what kids do and play crawling around playground equipment. There was just some, no reasonable way to clean it. Uh, even though we were doing it hourly um, to make, it was just too much of a risk. So we did, you know, recommend to you and you close playgrounds um but the parks are still open the park benches are open um it's we we did eliminate any group you know you can't have a family reunion at our shelter and things like that so we eliminated the scheduled groups um but you know if we saw a couple out sitting at a picnic at a shelter having lunch well you know that's uh, th there's no issue with that um th and so that's how we kind of handled you know our our, our um parks and our playgrounds the the only modification to that is what in our recommendation is we we wanted to differentiate that between a daycare under the governor's order a day, a daycare is limited to 10 p 10 kids per um room and then the um we when we shut down playgrounds we also shut down playgrounds at a at a daycare and um obviously that puts a stress on the daycare if you're working at a daycare and you can't let the kids climb around on equipment. What we said is that, you know, as part of this, we would say that they have to enhance the cleaning. And so they clean, do it between classes because those classes are intermixing and playing with equipment in the room all day long. Um, and so as long as the playground equipment is clean, uh, that that would be a reasonable accommodation for that. The governor may modify that because that was the, the limitation on the numbers per class was a was within the governor's order. Um, and so again, we're we're saying let's take a reasonable step first, waiting on to see what the governor does in terms of if, if further modifications are needed. 
What about the community pools, Barry? Um, well, the, the community. They're all in cities. Yep, cities. City pools. Oh, community community pools. Well, that would uh, would be up to the city, obviously. And um, but but again, if we open them up, there they're going to have to. Imp the key is on any of this that they implement social distancing practices. Um, you know, and it's no different than our businesses. You know, we we talk about, and I the reason we haven't, I have, I didn't put in all of the things that we want to see in a modified stay at home order. Should the governor, you know, choose to just eliminate that, which I don't think he will, um, is because we, we they they're taking those steps. They have businesses that are advising him in, in terms of where the way in which they would open, and so we're we're kind of watching that, but no doubt they're looking and, and businesses are looking at plans on how they would reopen. And, and so the same thing would occur within communities. I think that the, uh, one of the recommendations I made uh, at our city call was what that parks and rec directors um, get together because they got to be looking at summer programs, summer school programs, summer um, activity programs. Are they eliminating them? Are they doing some kind of a modified version? Um, and they should be consistent, you know, city to city. Uh, so there's a lot of different pieces that I think need to come together and, um, and everybody will have to try to um, represent their area and what works for them, uh, but also um, try to be as consistent as possible across the county. So it's a recommendation to open the pools uh, and let them all make their own individual decision, keep the parks our, open. Our, our recommendation is to open pools um, and but require the social distancing. Okay. And so how they implement that plan, you know, they could take the lawn chair furniture out and, and put half of it in. They could um, simply, you know, say that you must separate and they enforce it. Leave that, leave that up to the ingenuity. And what we will do is ensure that they're actually taking that seriously and doing it. Okay, thank you. And I think actually with the cities, it really depends for them on whether they have the staff to properly enforce. I mean, they have to have staff there if they're opening their pools. So uh, Commissioner Welch and then Commissioner Peter. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation. I will not be supporting this resolution. Uh, I can support the pools. I think uh, Commissioner Peters makes some good comments about that. We certainly receive a lot of emails uh, from folks who use the pools for therapy. Uh, so I get that part of it. Uh, and I did make that statement at the last meeting uh, for the record. Uh, but I just think we're moving too quickly on the beaches. Um, you know, when we talk about 11 cases, um, we're only testing 1.4% of the population. And I would like to see data if we have it on who is actually being tested uh, in terms of demographics, because we really don't have uh, data that gives us a good feel on, on the level of, of uh, infection in the county. I'm concerned about what happens when the best beaches in America are opened up uh, and then have we done everything we have we can do to release that pressure. One of those things would be opening essential non-essential businesses and to see whether we can do that or not we've got to see what the governor ultimately does. So I would rather wait a couple of days we're going to be meeting twice a week uh, see what the governor does see if that gives us another tool um, to not only address those needs that Commissioner Long talked about that we are addressing later in this meeting, but also to relieve some of that pressure. Um, because I, I just think you're going to see folks flocking out, as we saw in Jacksonville. I think uh, the sheriff sent, a, sent us a photo of what happened in Jacksonville when they opened up. So I'm concerned about that. I don't think we have to act today on the beaches, so I won't be supporting uh, this first uh, resolution. Thank you. Mr. Peters. Thank you. Um, I did want to say that we do have antibody tests. I know my doctor has the antibody test. So I went ahead and did it yesterday. Um, so I just want to read what she wrote, if that's okay. And then I have another comment about the businesses, if that's okay, if you'll indulge me. So um, she said she wanted to clarify to detect the COVID-19 antibodies. And Dr. Cho, you can clarify if she's not correct. She said there's limitations to the test. If you have just been exposed and have not gone through the infection, you will test negative, a false negative. Positive testing is probably COVID-19. However, there are some viruses such as the COVID, the coronavirus HKU1, NL63, OC43, or 229E, which can cross-react with the test, giving false positive results. This is not uncommon. 
Therefore, the test should be used as a guide, not 100% certainty. Um, that is covered by insurance. The Quest Labs are running the, the um, analysis on it. Um, so if people want to check with their doctor, if they have the test, it is 100% covered by your insurance, but you may want to call your insurance company to make sure. So that was just kind of an announcement I just wanted to say. Um, also, as far as businesses, you know, even if we open up the beaches, the hotels aren't ready. Many of the hotels have closed down. They furloughed their employees. And the problem they're going to have getting open and ramped up again is because some employees that maybe have been successful at getting unemployment will probably take in more money than what their salary would be. Um, and so some employees aren't going to come back right away. Um, and they have to find a way to ramp up their staff. And so I spoke to um, several hotel owners just so yesterday, in fact, I talked to one and he said, even if the governor opens up on May 1st, he wouldn't be able to get operating until May 14th. So I don't think open up the beach is going to have a big flood of people filling up our hotels because the hotels are not going to be able to take the reservations if they don't have the staff to clean the rooms and maintain the property at the way it's supposed to be. So I, I think that fear of everyone's going to flood to a hotel and we're going to have the spring break or stay in our hotel. I don't think that's going to happen really quickly. And the, the restaurants are going to have the same problem. Many of their staff have been furloughed. Um, they might make $300 a week at the restaurant, but they're going to get $600 a week for unemployment. So I think staffing up in our business is not going to be swift at all. Now, for those people that haven't been able to get unemployment, I think, I think we need to get them employed right away. I know my son has been out of work for nearly two weeks because he was sick and they quarantined him for 14 days. And then, of course, the day he went back, he was furloughed because the governor shut restaurants down. So um, I, I don't think that the fear of hotels filling up with a bunch of people is real. I think it's going to take at least two weeks for them to ramp up if, in fact, they can ramp up with staff within two weeks. So um, that's my comment. And I guess my question also would be, I don't know if it's a suggestion or a question. Um, Barry, you know, Ken Welch has said that he is not supportive of other elements of this. Um, I mean, I would do a motion to support the whole thing, but I don't know if it would be best to do them one item at a time. Have you got thoughts on that? Madam Chair or Barry? Uh, well, if I could leap in. Go ahead. Yeah, um, not written. Yeah, if I could leap in, I think, um, and I had already made a note to myself, if there are going to be different votes on the pool and the beach aspect, we really do need to pull those apart um, so that the clerk can adequately um, note on the resolutions the I's and the nays as to who voted for them. Um, so I would suggest that we take uh, separate votes on that. And to the extent, um, one thing that we did not address in the resolution that you have is whether or not you do want to take a look at some of the playgrounds at the daycare centers uh, that I know was included in the county administrator's recommendation that was sent over the weekend. It's not addressed in the resolution. So if you do want to take action on that, that, that might just be a third resolution that we put together. Um, one thing I would suggest, and we have already spoken about this morning, is to also be very clear uh, to the extent we open the pools, the beaches, any of these um, things we're talking about, that we establish a clear date and a clear time for the opening. Um, and just to kind of uh, bring to your attention, as long as I, as I have you, you, there's been some discussion about the social distancing in the pools in particular. Just do note, and the county administrator did mention this early on in the meeting, the resolution before you does provide that if the pools are to reopen, that that would be at 50% of the stated occupancy. So if you have a pool that says, you know, maximum occupancy of 10, well, it's only going to be allowed to be five. So keep that in mind. That is also another um, protective measure that is in the resolution that's currently proposed. So could I make a motion to um, use the language for the pools to open um, Thursday morning, maybe 6 a.m.? Um, to be approved. Um, can I, well, I would just like to, um, to ask if you'd be willing to amend that to include the playgrounds, because I think that piece is important for the daycare centers being able to operate with less than 10 or less kids in one, one place. I, 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 agree. I, I absolutely agree with you, Madam Chair. Um, and I would be willing to do that. The question is, Jewel, would you prefer them broken up or can we combine those two? Um, I would suggest that we go ahead and just break them up so that if there are commissioners that want to vote one way or another on either one of those topics, we can go ahead and memorialize it that way. And please keep in mind too, you need to take public comment before a vote on either of these. Right, right. Uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
And I would like to ask Commissioner Peters if she might accept a friendly amendment with regard to the pools issue, uh, because I agree with Commissioner Welch about the beaches. I don't see the necessity for making that decision today, since we are gonna be meeting later this week, and I would prefer to see the two issues pulled apart. And as it relates to the pools, my amendment, Commissioner Peters, would be uh, if you would consider also adding in there for those uh, condos that have uh, 50 or less condo units, because as you know, there are many condominiums in our community that have hundreds of people living in them. And I think there's a big difference in terms of the ability for the, for the hotel uh, management people to manage those those pools so that would be my offering and i will not be voting on the uh, resolution as offered today uh, okay so um, a second for well I'm she sorry. asked for a friendly go ahead are amendment. you willing to yeah so um commissioner long I, I think my take on that is if a condominium has a hundred units the condominium has the choice to stay closed and if the condominium doesn't believe that they can manage the population, because many of the condos are half empty. So even if there's hundred units, there might only be 40, 40 units full. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to limit that because of that reason. So what I would say is if a condominium unit doesn't feel that they can enforce it and ensure that they can use the protocols for safety, that those condo units, the HOAs choose to keep their pools closed. But I think we give the right back to them to make their decisions because they know better than we know. So I, I wouldn't accept that friendly amendment. I appreciate what you're saying, but since most of the condos are empty, I, I don't think it's necessary at this time, um, but I would look for a second. Mr. Seal. I will second it, but I do have one question that wasn't answered before. Um, what about the long-term care facilities? Are we gonna allow pools to be open in the nursing homes, assisted living, et cetera. Is that part of your motion, Commissioner Peter? Um, I would ask the sheriff then on enforcement. He's the one that said he wanted all or nothing. And again, the nursing homes and the assisted living facilities have the ability to keep their pools closed. I don't know that they need us to mandate it. I think they have the ability to close it on their own. Um, and so I'd really look to the sheriff for his response on that for enforcement. And I would ask, ask Dr. Cho, I mean, from the nursing home standpoint, you know, the nursing home pool is different than any other pool. It's really a question of them being responsible and managing their facility. Um, and so, I, you know, Dr. Cho or the sheriff can, can weigh in, but I don't think there's any greater risk at a nursing home pool than any other pool. Um, in fact, they probably have better oversight in, in terms of, uh, you know, um, proper oversight and infection control. Um, they should because that's um, that's critical for their continued operation. Um, but maybe Dr. Cho or the sheriff would like to weigh in. So, um, uh, in terms of, there's nothing specific in terms of the guidance, um, and I, I do want to reemphasize that um, we have to be protective of this population. Uh, the only thing I could think of as it pertains to pools in those facilities, and I can't speak to how many there are. Um, is that uh, to minimizing any congregate types of activities. So if it goes uh, with uh, that, um, I, can, I can sort of see that. Um, uh, they, they do in terms of the ACA and, uh, um, and other guidance is that uh, anything that minimizes congregate activities and such as uh, dining and, um, and I guess other activities. Well, anything that is parsing things out, all we have seen throughout this whole process is <laughs> splitting hairs and everybody trying to get around something in some way from people going out to getting food licenses so they can call themselves convenience stores to this license, that license, anytime. And so if you're talking about it, it comes from an enforcement standpoint, what are you talking about? So what is a nursing home? What is an ALF? What is independent living? What is a group home? What is all these things? So, uh, you know, I, and unless you're going to get really, really granular and get down to addressing every one of them, it's, it's, I don't think it's realistic because you can sit here and you can say, okay, well, we're going to exclude 
uh, what you call um, a nursing home. What is that? Uh, you're going to get into the difference between all the different types. And, and so it, it does, it is, it's a problem uh, and probably would be one of those things where, quite honestly, it, it, it's, it, it's probably not feasible to try and um, separate that out. Mr. Riggers. We said that the, the um, Jewel said something about uh, each pool, I guess, has a capacity rating or and that we this this uh, she didn't say that, but she said that the the ordinances or the, the our order would basically say that they were limited to 50 percent of capacity. So I guess the question is, do, do most of these pools have a capacity? So, you know, if you have a, yeah, they all do. So so as part of this is at least in this first go around would be that they, they maintain that 50% of capacity. Um, I'm, not gonna split I'm not gonna split hairs over Thursday. I was thinking Friday just to give them two full days, all day Wednesday, all day Thursday. But I mean, again, I, you know, I just think again, you know, we're, we're you know, charging full speed ahead here. And if we can just give a little bit more time for those, for those condo owners to get things ready for the cities to get themselves ready, um, I think would be helpful, but again, I'm not going to um, split hairs. I would certainly prefer doing it Friday if uh, if uh, if uh, you'll allow that, Commissioner Peters, but uh, in your motion. But otherwise, I'm I'm prepared. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I respond to Dave? Sure. Um, so so my thought is, as Commissioner, is that they have all afternoon today and all day tomorrow to do that. That's a day and a half. Many of these condominiums are small, um, and anyone you know they're gonna they're gonna decide the people that live there are gonna decide if they think it's safe for them to go out there or not and i believe many of them who most of the people in this community have been smart and responsible and and they can bring a soapy rag and wash off the chair they might sit on or the railing of the pool so i don't know that the condominium is going to need three and a half days or two and a half days i think i think thursday morning is sufficient for the condominiums because it's not a large area and they're only gonna put 50% of the chairs out. If they're even gonna put chairs out at all, they may only do swimming for activities and the condominiums may not even put chairs out. So I, I don't think it's gonna take a lot to prepare the railings on a pool, especially if they're not gonna put chairs out. And I think a day and a half is plenty of time. And I do believe the citizens are gonna be responsible and make sure it's been done before they get in the, on the pool deck. Um, so, so I don't know that one extra day is gonna make a difference for the pools. I, I understand the beaches, um, signage has to get distributed and made and printed. So I understand the two days for the, the, the beaches, but I don't necessarily understand two days for the pools. Well, it won't make a difference either way very much, either to the residents or the users or the or the condo board members who are making the rules. So you know, anyway, enough said, thank you. Thank you. Anything else before we take public comment? Okay. Thank you for those of you who have waited. At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on this item, uh, please hit the star nine on your phone or the raise hand button on the Zoom application. Uh, Madam Chair, it does appear that we do have quite a few people that wish to comment. Uh, looks like about 12 or so that uh, would like to public comment. Okay. We want to do three minutes, two minutes. Uh, what, what's your... Can we have a feeling about that board? I think we can do three minutes and ask people to try to keep their comments brief. Okay, very well. Our first uh, public speaker is Tammy Vasquez. Commissioner Eggers, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's all right, I had it muted. Uh, are we gonna take comments from across the board? So it's not on every resolution, we're gonna have different ones. So are they gonna be commenting on the beaches too at this time or is it just, um, anyway. So we have 12 on any of the issues. I would ask the process moderator or maybe Jewel, is that okay to take public comment on the individual votes uh, up front for the beaches, the pools and? Thank you, Senator. You, it would really be at the chair's discretion, but you can choose to take comment on all of the issues you believe you will be voting on today. Um, you do need to be clear to the public though, I think as to what issues are going to be voted on, but yes, you're required from a legal from the legal perspective to require an op to provide an opportunity to vote to comment before a vote is taken so you can take vote on all of the matters that you intend to vote on today but again you may wish to be clear as to what all those matters will be well how about if we take comment on this first issue having to do 
first three issues having to do with the pools, the beaches, and the daycare centers. Okay. All right, so our first speaker, Madam Chair, is Tammy Vasquez. Um, Ms. Vasquez, if you go ahead, unmute yourself, um, give us your first last name, give us a spelling and your address, and then you'll have three minutes to speak to the board. Thank you. Ms. Vasquez, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I, um, my name is Tammy Vasquez, uh, last name is V-A-S-Q-U-E-Z, and I reside in Treasure Island. I, some of you may remember I spoke to you um, a couple weeks ago, and a little bit of a different uh, discussion today for sure, but it kind of all stems from the same thing. Um, basically, you know, when you, when the commissioners voted and re-upped the, um, the order last week to extend through Friday, you know, I personally uh, felt that that was a bit of an overreach considering that the governor's orders were going to come out before that. Um, and I know uh, Ms. Peters had suggested that you all meet Friday and that got voted down. Um, but just moving forward from that, it on the beaches and the pools, you know, I see, I've seen a lot of comments. I've heard a lot of comments. People are like, oh, why is this so important? Um, it just doesn't make sense. You know, why the businesses are more important. And through informing myself over the last couple of weeks, um, I've realized that basically that's what you guys have control over. You don't have control at this point um, over the businesses reopening because that's under the governor's order. And that's something I've come, you know, again, educating myself. However, this is something. And, you know, it, it has seemed over the last couple of weeks that the majority of the commissioners really haven't listened to their citizens. And the citizens are telling you these are our beaches. We're private citizens living in condominiums. We want our pools back. And you've basically told them you aren't smart enough to make your own decisions to stay safe. And it's just, it's its pretty appalling. Um, with the exception of Ms. Peters, um, Sheriff Gaultieri and, and the Administrator Burton, it really doesn't seem that any of you are really listening to the people out there. Um, you know, saying, well, businesses need more time, you know, with the exception of uh, even with uh, businesses, depending on what the governor comes out with, you know, the, believe me, as a business owner, we're ready to open. I understand hotels and some of the restaurants, um, you know, they would need more time. But as a small business owner and lots, most of my friends are small business owners, I can tell you we were already following the guidelines before we got shut down. So we are more than ready to, to follow the guidelines in an hour <laughs> if we had the opportunity to, to open fully. So I just want to say that, you know, you all look to the sheriff for guidance. The sheriff has told you it is easier for him um, if we just open everything up so that his officers don't have to confront people that are out there. And I will tell you, they're out there. There were probably 75 people on Treasure Island between the Bill Maher and the Thunderbird with coolers. Um, but everybody was listening to the six foot guidelines. I mean, yeah, the bars may not be open, but trust me, people are still out there and people are respecting it. And, That's you know, your it, time has expired. All right. Thank you so much. And um, definitely think you should vote to open the pools and the beaches. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Tina. Uh, Tina, if you'll give us your first last name, uh, give us the spelling, your address, and then you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, hello, my name is Tina McCabe and I live in St. Petersburg. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you give us a spell, uh, Tina McCabe, T-I-N-A, uh, can you give us the last name? Yes, M-C-C-A-B-E. Thank you. Take that away. Um, I'm, my call concerns about the beginning of your conversation where we just dis, you discussed following Governor DeSantis's orders and the businesses that are open and closed. And I agree with what the some of your comments that by opening some more of those businesses, it would be much easier and slower at the beaches over time because there'd be more places to go. I we have 11 mattress stores in the Tampa Bay area. 
We have five of them in Pinellas County. The way they are being treated in each and every county, because we're in five different counties, Pinellas is the only one that has shut us down to the point we can't even have the open sign on while we're taking online orders in our stores. We've been had people out multiple times. It's become <clears throat> really very strange. But even in the code and what DeSantis, Governor DeSantis released, there was room for appliance stores. Famous Tate is open. They sell mattresses just like we do. They also sell appliances. They run their business very similarly. I believe they should be open. I believe we should too. We only have one employee. We have natural, we're, we're the definition of social distancing as a company, just always. It's just how we run our business. It's how they work. So instead of people being at that location, they're at Sam's Club, they're at Walmart, they're doing, they're, they're blocking up those stores when others, mine and other small businesses, I'm talking the floors, the car washes. Um, I've heard several people commenting, could do it here. And people are going to Hillsborough County or they're, you're just pulling resources from, from Pinellas County and you're, you're harming the small businesses and they're all going to big box stores when lots of us do fall under essential and are following the guidelines. So maybe you need to revisit some of those stores that we closed down a little harder than all our neighboring counties. And that might take some stress off this entire thing. Because I do think if we open the beaches, I'm all for that. But if you do have more other places open, local small places, that they're going to have other places to go because if they're all going to the parks, they're bottlenecking. And I do believe you'd have a lot more places for them to go carefully, of course, because I don't want my employees sick and I don't want any customers sick. So, you know, I, I do think the people in, in Pinellas and all of Florida are very responsible. I've seen it change over the time period. And I think we can trust people to follow the rules. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Jennifer Harmon. Uh, Ms. Harmon, if you could give us your name, first and last, spelling, your address, and then you'll have three minutes to speak to the board. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jennifer Harmon, H-A-R-M-O-N. My address, business address is uh, 1153 Main Street in Dunedin. Um, I don't really have a lot to say about the beaches and the pools, um, although I do agree with some of the speakers that have already talked. Um, I think if the businesses are open, there's going to be less people at the beaches because people will be back to work. Obviously, I think that makes sense. Um, my question really was, and I think some of it has been answered just listening to the meeting. Um, if the governor does let his order lapse on the 30th, will the county let us go back to business in small businesses? I personally have a pet grooming salon. Um, those of us that can adhere to CDC guidelines, which we were doing before the shutdown, we were doing very well. Um, a lot of my fellow um, grooming business owners were also doing the same. Are we gonna be allowed to reopen, let's say on the 1st, if the order expires on the 30th, um, will the county let us do that? That's my question. Um, we need a clear answer. We have clients literally begging to come in and um, appointments on the schedule, um, and we really can't withstand another month of being closed or even another week, really. Uh, most of us in the grooming community have not received any relief from the government. We haven't even received stimulus checks or unemployment. So um, I guess what I'm asking is that you really consider uh, deeply whether or not you as the county are gonna let us reopen the small businesses that can adhere to CDC guidelines if the order from the governor expires. I also want to thank you all. Um, I've really enjoyed watching and listening to your meetings. I recognize everybody's uh, voices, and I think you've done a great job. Um, so if we can get a clear answer on whether or not you'll let us open, um, that's really what we need. Thank you again. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Amish Patel. Uh, Mr. Patel, if you can go ahead and give us your first last name, uh, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Amish Patel, A-M-I-S-H-P-A-T-E-L, 20788, U.S. 19 North. Spoke to you guys last week. I have two hotels in Pinellas County. As far as beaches and pools open, I agree with the sheriff, sheriff 100%. It's either all or none. We're losing a lot of business since pools were closed because the people that don't have it at home, they would come stay with us for the day, enjoy the pool, and go back home. Um, it's up to the sheriff's department, local PD, to police the beaches and local pools if they need to. Um, and I think, like Commissioner Peter said, people should be responsible enough to do so. If they're not responsible, well, then Darwinism will take over. The other thing I have is when you're looking at reopening everything, 
if you guys can set up mandates for hotels where cleaning is only done during a checkout time. So when the customer checks out, we go in there, clean the room 110% like we normally would or go above and beyond. There's no need for a housekeeper to go into an occupied room every single day, clean the room. That'll only allow more services to be touched by many different people. When they check out, we go and clean it, we're done. So there are different rules that will help mitigate the amount of exposure employees have to people coming in once we start opening up beaches and hotels start opening it up. We can help further curb the exposure of visitors and employees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Uh, our next speaker, Madam Chair, is Ken Dulac. Uh, Mr. Dulac, if you could go ahead, give us your first name, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, my name's Ken Dulac, D-U-L-A-C. I live in South St. Pete. I'll talk to you kind of every week. Um, question I had for you was really, we plan a large condominium over, over 100 units. We have one pool. Uh, we plan to follow your guidelines as best we can. So we had a meeting already to talk about, you know, how we would go about social distancing in the pool and that, that type of thing. Um, I assume from this conversation I have now that you're not just opening the pools, but you're going to open the decks as well. Um, so that, that changes our plans a little bit because I was under the impression that that wasn't going to be part of it. Um, I, I understand that we can close them if we want as an HOA. Um, I have a question about cleaning. Uh, it seems like when you talk about how things should open, you talk about cleaning regularly every hour or things like that. I'm, I'm not sure how we do that. Um, if anybody can help me find somebody that knows is an expert on cleaning up in an outdoor area of, in, a, in this environment, it would sure help. Um, also, the sheriff talks about enforcement, but mainly about enforcement at the beaches. I haven't heard a lot about enforcement at the pools. I'm assuming you're wanting us to enforce it. I'm not exactly sure how the board enforces that. And I actually went out and took a look at our pool and measured it. And at 50%, we can't maintain six foot distance. Our, to maintain six foot distance in our pool, it was 33%, only a third. So, uh, so I can cut the capacity down to 50% and, I, and it's, it's not automatically going to generate a six foot distance. So we're, we're going to, in our statement, we're going to try and tell people they have to stay six feet apart unless they're living in the same unit. Uh, we, fig we figure if they're in the same unit, they're already close together. So those, those are my issues. Uh, we we want to follow your guidelines. I'm a little concerned from what some of the doctors said about the fact that we haven't done enough, enough testing to know how many asymptomatic people we have and you know where they come from and you know whether that three percent is real or not but uh, you know we're looking towards you for the guidance so thank you thank you Madam chair our next speaker is Gwen Douse um, Miss Douse if you could go ahead and give us your first and last name spelling address and you'll have three minutes Thank you. Gwen Dows, D-O-U-S-C, Clearwater Beach. And regarding beaches and condo pools, uh, I don't agree with some of the speakers today. As we begin phase one of reopening, we must remember COVID-19 remains a highly contagious, potentially deadly virus. Robust testing and contact tracing, as we've talked about today, have yet to be effectively implemented. To reopen beaches in a floodgate manner in early phase one could greatly increase the chance that we will have a strong rebound of this disease. Of the public Florida beaches that have reopened to date, smart steps have been taken to keep beaches restricted in time and activity. However, it has been observed that few beachgoers are wearing protective masks and there are some issues with social distancing. As, as discussed, it only takes one asystematic individual to affect many people. Regarding Clearwater Beach, please do not have a full reopen of Clearwater Beach, a beach that has become a very strong magnet of crowds, but please open carefully with, with restricted hours and activity. We're a small beach, we're not 35 miles and we're a crowded beach. It is best to reopen Clearwater Beach in small steps that can be measured and observed rather than leaps and bounds. Although spring break has ended, schools and colleges will soon be closed for the summer. As a resident of Clearwater Beach for 15 years, I've seen the local crowds flock here, even when it is not spring break or weekends. With this potential crowd surge, there could more easily be a transmission of this disease for which we have no proven treatment or vaccine. There are over 8,000 residents of Clearwater Beach with a median age of 63. 
this population becomes vulnerable with a crowd surge. As far as condo pools are concerned, please open the smaller condominiums first, again, to measure and observe in small steps. Full reopening of condo pools should not take place until we have effective testing in place. Even at 50% capacity, which my 156 unit condominium tried before the safer at home order was put in place, social distancing was not always practiced despite guidelines and no one without hazmat equipment can practically and continually wipe down all the surfaces touched in this common area environment. We are on virus time, not human time right now, unfortunately. Please open the beaches and condo pools with carefully measured increments and specific guidelines and keep in mind first the health and welfare of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Ms. Sharon Calvert. Uh, Ms. Calvert, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Yes, this is Sharon Calvert, S-H-A-R-O-N-C-A-L-V-E-R-T, and I live at 340 Pinellas Bayway, South in Tierra Verde. Um, I'm just going to have to say from, to begin with, that this has been a very, been very painful listening to this conversation. Um, I agree with the sheriff and the county administrator that dispersion is good. We are being told to social distance. People are going outside more as the weather has warmed up and people have become fatigued. They are going out. And it is much better to provide them more opportunities to be able to get fresh air, sunshine, which is necessary and exercise for their well being. Um, I'm assuming that you don't want our immune systems to be reduced and diminished, especially as we do begin opening up. And it does seem ironic still that we can go into Walmart or Publix in a much more contained area, but I can't get in my condo pool. I haven't been able to get in my condo pool and I can't walk on the beach. So I hope that you will support um, opening up both the pools and the beaches. Again, dispersion is good. And I would hope that you would start trusting uh, your own constituents, that we are responsible. None of us want any of us to be sick. And we take that responsibility seriously. So I just ask you again, um, that I hope you will vote to reopen the beaches and the pools. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Jonathan. I do not have a last name. Um, Jonathan, if you'll go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Los again uh, from Madeira Beach. I just want to, just from the previous speakers here, I want to make sure it's clear to everyone that the vote here isn't forcing anyone out of their homes into the pools or onto the beach. This is just returning the power back to the homeowners associations. You know, Ken Delac is worried about his uh, association. Our association is ready to go. So it's going to be a decentralized approach. Um, I do f hear uh, from commissioners and from the public and from comments, uh, this whole fear based versus fact based in their decision making and their thinking. I think it's great that um, the sheriff and uh, Mr. Burton, they have set reasonable expectations that uh, when things open up, because things are going to have to open up, infections are going to increase. It's part of the natural flow. We as a society decided to flatten our curve. And by flattening the curve, we eliminated the peak and now we have a broader base. We're going to be running horizontally for some time. Um, I think the expectation needs to be set that the flattening of the curve was never intended to drive this infection to zero. People think that by staying home and staying home diligently that this is going to go away. As the antibody tests are coming out, this infection is too widespread. I wish Dr. Cho and Dr. Jameson would be more forthcoming with people. They both alluded to the time frames for here is that he, uh, Dr. Cho said that the virus is still out there. We expect it to be out there. It's not going away. Dr. Jameson and acknowledged that it's, it's going to be around with us for 18 months. So that's the question that we have to start asking ourselves as a society. What is the long-term play? What is our exit strategy? From the get-go, because we had bad data, we had fear, we had no idea. We were expecting two to three million deaths. So we shut everything down to protect 
the hospital system only. That was it to make sure. And as uh, Mr. Burton had said at the beginning, we are well under capacity. So now we hit the brakes. Our long-term play is widespread immunity. The vaccine is, let's say 12 to 18 months. That's unprecedented. The fastest vaccine in the history of the United States has been four years and other SARS uh, vaccines have failed. So our next gameplay here is widespread immunity, herd immunity. It was criticized early on because of the, um, because of the amount of deaths. But now that we're looking at 60 to 70,000 deaths, although a tragedy, no worse than a bad flu season, we need to start thinking about how, what's our plan out of this. And we look at the, the amount of deaths that are happening, 65 and over, uh, and two or more multiple medical conditions, 20%. That's the number you guys were looking for earlier in our long-term care facilities. The only thing we can control, the only thing, we can't control the stop of this, the area under the curve is the same, is the only thing within our power is to bias where those infections go. Uh, we either bias the infections to the young and the healthy that with right now with the antibody testing coming out, it is more likely that you will get the virus, recover, and not even know you had it versus having complications from it. So we have to start looking in terms of when we try to keep things locked down, we are prolonging the inevitable. The faster we get back to normal. I'm sorry, so your time has sure, expired. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker, I do not have a name. Uh, it says Moto Supra. If you could go ahead and uh, identify yourself, give us your first class name, uh, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yes, sorry, uh, my name is Monica Maximovich. Um, I am a- you, And I'm sorry, for the record, can you give us the spelling, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. Monica Maximovich, last name Maximovich, M-A-K-S-Y-M-O-W-I-C-Z. And um, I am a small business owner in Largo, Florida. Uh, 10634 Seminole Boulevard, Largo, Florida. Uh, I own a dog grooming and boarding business, very small scale, I'm a small business owner. Um, my business was shut down along with all the other groomers in uh, Pinellas County. April 3rd, I had a sheriff come by and tell me, your boarding can stay open, but you have to shut down the grooming. And so I abided, but I, I still did not understand um, seeing as small businesses have a higher capability of controlling bigger crowds coming in, like Home Depot and the grocery stores, there's hundreds of people in there at a time. There is no way for them to sanitize everything. I mean, even the, uh, the virus can sit on plastic for days. However, small businesses like groomers and little little mom and pop shops, we have the ability to control how many people are coming in and sanitizing. My business, for instance, I take one family at a time for grooming. All groomers and small businesses can adhere to social distancing and and CDC guidelines for sanitation. And um, I, I just, I, I'm at a loss here. It's, it's horrible for us out here. And I believe that we should focus on reopening small businesses 100%. The pools and the beaches, that's also important, but we need to focus on these small businesses. Um, like one of the other commenters said, you know, a lot of us have not received uh, government help. You know, we're stuck here with running out of money. What are we going to do? And reopening the businesses should be a key focus as well for that. Um, when it comes to protocol for CDC guidelines and whatnot, we have the ability, just like the other commenter said, we can set that up in an hour, no problem. Um, I, I truly feel that with reopening small businesses, that that would be key to getting our economy back working. And, you know, with, she also mentioned with uh, the beaches, people will be back to work. There isn't going to be an abundance of crowds on the beaches. This is all very important and, and it all comes together. It all aligns together and links all of these aspects. 
Um, so I just wanted to say my part and um, I thank you guys for giving us a voice to speak. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, just for the record, we start with 16 speakers. We have 17 remaining. Um, <laughs> Good. Okay. Our next speaker is Denise uh, F O U G E R E. Uh, hold on one sec. Uh, and this speaker is on an older version of the technology. I don't know that I'm going to be able to accommodate uh, that speaker. Uh, let me try one thing here. Yeah, I'm going to have to move on to the next one. Uh, the next speaker is telephone number, last four digits, 7173. Uh, if you can go ahead and identify yourself, give us your first and last name, uh, spelling, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, my name is Robert Rudomsky. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes. Can you hear can me? Hear you. Yes, sir. Okay, good. My name is Robert Rudomsky, and I'm from Clearwater Beach. Um, I'd just like to start out for a second making a quick comment about the playgrounds. Um, with playgrounds, I mean, you have a lot of touching of the same surfaces, and whereas with the beach and some of the other things, you don't. So I'm not sure if that's taken into account where, I mean, immediately to me, that would seem like a concern. And perhaps you might want to consider uh, separating the playground issue from everything else and taking a different decision from the fact that you've got kids and adults climbing all over equipment, putting their hands on things, and uh, kind of hard to maintain six feet of distance on a jungle gym. So. Uh, but that wasn't the main reason uh, that I wanted to make some comments. Um, on a more bro on a broader basis, um, the public opinion on opening the beaches and, um, <clears throat> and the pools, it's going to remain divided. Um, there's not enough general knowledge about how the virus spreads, and, and that leads to people making their own conclusions. Um, along with that, the opening of the beaches and the pools, even with the declining number of new cases, it doesn't mean the virus is going away. There's going to be a lot more cases unfortunately more deaths and that's where the beaches are going to be and the pools are open or not. And I think what the county can do <clears throat> to help alleviate the concerns of the community, create a common belief and build trust and transparency in your efforts is to provide a deeper level of analysis on the cases that we have. Because it seems like the only data that we're focusing on are the number of tests, positive cases, hospitalizations and deaths, along with the constantly shifting projections. And it's not enough to alleviate concerns or even help you to make informed decisions going forward. We have a, a, one example, starting with a little background. There's close to 700 total cases in the county. It was the last Friday, around 190 hospitalizations. Um, we've seen in some phase of shutdown, or we've been in some phase of shutdown for the past six weeks, and the virus incubation period is somewhere around 14 days. We have cases that have developed during the restriction period. So how do those cases compare to the ones that were identified prior to restrictions being put in place? Grocery stores, Home Depot, other businesses remained open during that time. Many people are still going to work. What do we know about the cases identified more recently? What, if anything, do they have in common? Do any of these people go to the same stores? Is there any proof that the businesses that were open contributed to the spread more recently? The relatively no numbers, low numbers wouldn't suggest that um, it has, but it's important to know. Last paragraph. I mean, you have six weeks of test data and a manageable number of cases to learn how the virus is contracted before and after restrictions were put in place. That's a large enough sample to provide rich information that's much more useful than the top line data we've been, uh, that we've been used to seeing. Uh, going forward, you'll have beachgoers to add to the sample if that's voted in. With that information comes confidence. I urge the board to use this as an opportunity and to add rigor to the data and help inform your decisions going forward. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, just for our last speaker that I wasn't able to accommodate, Denise Fougere, F-O-U-G-E-R-E, -E, if you would call in on the main telephone line and do star nine, uh, your version of Zoom that you're using is not uh, up to date. We're not going to be able to have you for public comment. Um, so we will move on to the next speaker, which is Tim Holliday. Uh, Mr. Holliday, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, give us your first last name, uh, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Mr. Holliday, can you hear us? Mr. Holliday? Hello? Up there. 
Can you hear us, sir? Yes. OK, go ahead. You have three minutes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. OK, I just wanted to thank Commissioner Peters. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. You're very, very quiet right now. Are you close to your microphone? Yes, I thought I was. We, we cannot hear you adequately, sir. OK. Pass on. Madam Chair, I'm going to move on to the next speaker and we'll come back to that gentleman. Um, if, is, 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 that a, is that okay or should we try to accommodate the technology? Uh, that's fine. He can call back in or something. If I could ask people to please limit their comments to new things. You know, we have a lot of people waiting to speak and uh, we want to hear from you, but okay, go ahead. All right, our next speaker is last four digits, 8431. Uh, if you could go ahead and uh, give us your first and last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Good morning. My name is Zeb Atkinson. It is Z-E-B-A-T-K-I-N-S-O-N. I'm the president of the Upper Pinellas County branch of the NAACP. Um, and the question that I had or the comment that I had is about uh, testing in the community. Um, I agree with a lot of most of the things that have been said today. Um, but as we know, when you start talking about statistics, you're only looking at a, a, a portion. And I think Commissioner Welsh or and somebody else said, you know, how are we testing in the different communities that may not be able to drive over to Tampa and all these other places? I uh, placed an email to the CEO of Baycare and Advent Healthcare to ask about testing in the communities, be it walk up, drive up, whatever, so that you can get a larger sampling and then the doctors that are here have more data to analyze. Um, Baycare, I think they said they have a testing facility in St. Pete and one in Newport Ritchie. I'm still waiting to hear back from Advent. Um, and I see today that Hillsboro is doing testing for everybody and anybody who wants it. I know you don't really answer questions in this forum, but how is it that Hillsboro seems to be leading the way with the majority of things that happen in the community or in the area and Pinellas County is not? Um, if I can be of help to anyone, <laughs> give me a call. I think everybody there has my number. If you need help with setting up facilities. I think we all know some of the same people. Um, I've reached out to a couple of people already that have church parking lots or empty parking lots that can be used to do facilities. Um, food was another thing that was mentioned. I haven't really seen that share program in Pinellas, Upper Pinellas County, Tarpon Springs, Dunedin area, Safety Harbor area, those type of areas. Um, so those were the type of things that I would like to hear more about. And again, if I can be of help in any way, give me a call, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, our next speaker is last four digits, 7173. Uh, if you can go ahead and um, identify yourself, give us your first and last name, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Hello? Hi, I already spoke. I already spoke, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, our next speaker is last four digits, 8431. Uh, if you could go ahead and give us your first last name, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Hello? Hello? All right, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Megan Chapman. Uh, Ms. Chapman, if you can go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. It's Megan Chapman, M-A-E-G-A-N, last name C-H-A-P as in Paul, M-A-N, live in Clearwater, Florida. My husband um, actually spoke a couple weeks ago. Um, we were actually both interviewed on the news this week as well, um, and I know they're going to be following up with me to do a follow-up interview. Um, I'm at a loss at the comments made by several of the commissioners on here who are against opening the beaches. Um, while it looks promising for the pools, and I'm appreciative of that, um, 
I can't for the life of me understand the thought processes on the beaches. I really can't. Um, I agree with um, the administrator, uh, obviously Commissioner Burton and the sheriff. They've presented factual data that shows that this can be done safely. Um, you're begging for anarchy at this point. The people have showed you that they're not listening and they're going out and they're packing the causeways and they're packing other areas and they're doing it anyway. And they're gonna continue to make it worse. The sheriff came out, the um, administrator came out and people got their hopes up. And you could give them just a little bit of hope by opening these beaches, but when this gets voted no, I hope you are prepared for the backlash that's gonna happen. Uh, people, people have reached their limit. And, and if you don't believe that, just get out there and start talking to the residents that voted you in. Um, and it's, it's gonna get scary and it's gonna get um, justified, unfortunately, because the beaches should be open. It's 35 miles of open space that should be allowed to be utilized by the residents that live here. Give us adults the opportunity to do the right thing and social distance. By taking away our rights on a continuous basis and to continue that, you're just begging for problems, more and more problems than, than you think by keeping them closed. So I, I ask you to, to, to vote yes on the beaches, to think about the consequences that are gonna happen if you vote no. Um, and, and to be perfectly honest, it's just not your right anymore to take those rights away from us. Um, it's our beaches, let us be responsible adults and show you and prove to you that we can social distance and stay under groups of 10. So I, I implore you to please vote yes on opening the beaches. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Kurt Barnes. Mr. Barnes, if you give us our, your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, this is Kurt Barnes. Uh... Uh, last name B A R N E S. Own a business here in Clearwater. Uh, we have conference rooms, and and you know everybody. I think unless you lived under a rock, everybody's heard about the coronavirus, what spreads it, how to prevent it, and we're all adults, like the last caller just said. Here at our business, we control what's going on. We control when people go into the conference room, and like the sheriff said. People need to be able to get out and move about. And if you only have five people, uh, five places to go, everybody's gonna go to those five places. If you have the beaches open, the pools, places for people to go, then they can go. The other thing is we rent real estate out. We have restaurants and businesses that are, they're just dying on the vine. And the government can't get the money out fast enough uh, to save them. Uh, we, we couldn't put out enough money to save everybody. We've got to open the economy. I mean, people have got to get back to work. That would also help disperse people as well. So, you know, I understand why we closed down because we wanted to gain some information. We didn't know anything about the virus and needed to educate people. And I think we've done that. And now it's time to get back to, get back to normal. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is on a phone line, the last four digits, 4665. Uh, if you can go ahead and give us your first name, last name, spelling, and address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Gina Sharkey, uh, G-I-N-A-S-H-A-R-K-E-Y, 2145 43rd Terrace North in St. Petersburg, 33714. And I appreciate the opportunity. I don't know that I'll need the, the full three minutes. I just wanted to share that I am a nurse, have been a nurse for decades, um, and I fully supported um, all of these restrictions that were put in place. As the previous caller said, they, they were very necessary, um, and we don't have a vaccine or, or a cure at this point. And I see firsthand um, the impact of patients literally dying across our hospitals. That being said, um, we are experiencing a new normal here. Um, because we don't have a vaccine, because we don't have a cure, we really have to wrap our heads around our new normal. And so the public needs to learn how to move forward uh, in this new time with social distancing and the ability to uh, manage accordingly as per the recommendations that have been set forth in terms of spacing and protective uh, equipment and things of that nature. There's also mental health issues here. And I, I really think it's important um, that, that the beaches are able to be open. I, I fully appreciate the conversation about pools. Not everybody has the luxury of 
being able to afford a condo association or um, have, have the ability to, to go to these places to get their reprieve. For many people, um, that reprieve is the free beach that they're able to go to. So I think it sends a really bad message if we are opening up luxuries in one area for groups of people that can have them um, and, and not for others. And I say this as a person um, in the middle of building an in-ground pool, so it's not for my benefit. I'm just saying the message is, is not great if you don't allow folks to have access to the beach responsibly with oversight, with punishment, if, if you know, if, if people are not adhering to the guidelines, whatever that looks like, a fine, whatever that is. But people do need to start getting outside. People do need a place to have some recreation. Um, and, and it is going to be our new normal. So it's not a matter of, you know, how it's going to work. It, it's when it's going to start. This is going to be the way we live for the next several months, even into the next year, depending on when the vaccine um, and cures come down the pathway. So I really encourage everybody to just think about the message it sends to open pools, um, but not the beaches, which is free to the public, to the taxpayers and the constituents of this county. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm going to defer to our process moderator quickly uh, for an announcement. Sorry, uh, please excuse me, but uh, in order to make sure that we're being able to take the public comment that we need to, I wanted to again announce uh, to those that were having problems, particularly Ms. Fugere and Mr. Holliday, uh, members who wish to comment can call one of the several numbers on the public notice, one of which is one. 646-558-8656. Again, that is 1-646-558-8656. You will be asked to enter a webinar ID number. That number is 238-247-671. Again, that webinar ID number is 238 Two four seven six seven one. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Don. Uh, Madam Chair. Our next speaker is on the phone line. Last four digits one two five three. If you'll give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. My name is Evan Swallow, spelled E V A N. Last name is S O I L E A U. I'm in Reddington Beach, and I want to say that I agree with the decision to reopen the pools and beaches with conditions, uh, and do ask the commissioners to consider the additional following uh, points in regards to that decision. First, I do want to reiterate the White House Coronavirus Task Force April 23rd press conference and their research with John Hopkins University concerning warm temperatures and sunlight, reducing the half-life of the virus to two minutes instead of 18 minutes, even if we cannot definitively prove those exact numbers at this time, additional research will continue to support those conclusions. And while it may adjust, we can be confident that John Hopkins was very wise in the work that they did in researching that. So I believe that should strongly support Pinellas' decision to reopen the pools and beaches. Secondly, Mayor Curry of Jacksonville discussed on the Florida Task Force conference call their working strategy for reopening their beaches, and he noted that the beaches did have a larger influx of people on the first day. However, media coverage was not, in his opinion, accurate. The beaches were not overcrowded, and people thinned out in the days since reopening. It's also noteworthy that Duval County, where Jacksonville is, has more cases of COVID-19 than Pinellas, but we have similar population sizes. Thus, Pinellas is at an even lower risk than Duval in reopening its beaches. Third, we have also seen many other coastal counties whose statistics closely match our own open their beaches and loosen restrictions. And as the number of other counties grows daily, the public, as the sheriff mentioned, has become discontent with the current lockdown measures put in place by Pinellas. But opening the beaches will help to greatly reduce the stress on the people and the sheriff's department during this time. And fourth, the White House showed its best practices for every American, which suggested that heat and humidity suppresses COVID-19 indoors and outdoors and encouraged people to move activities outdoor where sunlight helps to impede the transmission of the virus. So for those reasons and for the other reasons that other callers have given uh, during this call, I do support Pinellas County in reopening the pools and beaches with conditions. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Ken Copeland. Uh, Mr. Copeland, if you'll go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. 
Ken Copeland, C O P E L A N D, Reddington Shores. Yeah, just want to say, echo what a caller said a few few minutes ago. The mental health is very important, and I think some of the conservative members of this board aren't taking the mental health of the community into consideration as much as they should. Um, obviously, a playground or a condominium pool has a far different um, surface area than a beach, which is a lot more spread out. I don't go to the beach and camp out next to somebody within six feet or even 10 feet. Um, I think a lot of this has nothing to do with the health per se of, uh, or possible spread on the beach. It's that the, the commissioners don't want another embarrassing um, media expose like they did in Clearwater Beach during spring break. Um, and that was spring break and that was Clearwater Beach by the pier. So I don't think you can really bundle that with the rest of the 35 miles of beaches and say, okay, we gotta be real careful you know, we, we can't open these up too fast. Um, listen, people want to go to the beach and the people that are at the beach within close proximity of each other probably already live together. They're probably already dating. So they're going to be in close quarters anyhow. Um, I don't understand how uh, opening up a pool um, is the same as opening up the beach. In my opinion, the beach is the most spread out for the mental health of the community and for getting back to at least some sort of norm, those need to be open first. The sheriff, who in my opinion is the only one with common sense on up there, gave you an implementation plan. He told you how it would work. He told you what makes sense and what doesn't. Listen to the sheriff. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Robert Blackmon. Uh, Mr. Blackmon, if you can go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling, address, then you'll have three minutes. Hey, my name is Robert Blackman, R-O-B-E-R-T-B-L-A-C-K-M-O-N. I am a St. Petersburg uh, City Councilman. Just wanted to speak real quick on the reopening issue here. Um, there's exercise options that are still available. I did a, a, an interview with, with Fox on Sunday at North Shore Beach in St. Petersburg. Um, in the five minutes we were there, at least 200 people ran and jogged by. Uh, there's, there's plenty of, of ways to get exercise and get outdoors. Uh, St. Pete polls today put out a poll saying that I believe 60% of people um, are against the reopening of beaches and people are for reopening businesses. Um, I just think we need to be in line with what our constituents want. Um, when we open beaches, we're, we're talking about publicizing ourselves and encouraging tourism. When we have not even tested the system with small beaches or small businesses, excuse me, uh, I, I want to reemphasize my support for focusing on business first. Um, we need to understand the seriousness of the situation here. And I think in a lot of ways, we're victims of our own success. We've, we've had low case loads. I get the data every day, um, but we don't want to become New York. And I think that there's going to be essentially refugees coming here if, if we start publicizing we have beaches open. And we're going to encourage drinking and partying and increase litter on the beaches um, since there aren't any businesses open, the only way to eat and drink is going to be on the beach itself. Um, in restaurants, you know, or controlled environments where you can control how many people there are, the beaches, you know, you, you can't patrol the whole beach. And there's going to be uh, a free rider issue on the beach where, you know, all the, the police responses I've seen, people just disperse quickly. In a restaurant or a small business, you know, the, the, the business owners have incentive to follow regulations because their livelihood depends on it and they want the right to be open. So I just think that our priorities are in the wrong spot. Uh, beaches should not be the um, at the forefront of our mind right now. And we have so many small business owners hurting and also employees who are out of work. And, and I want to also say, you know, I think a lot of people who are struggling to put food on the table, the last thing on their mind is getting to the beach. Uh, they don't have that kind of luxury and they have much bigger uh, priorities and, and things in mind. So I just want to please emphasize the business first approach. Um, and, and say that the beaches are, are not necessarily what we should be focused on. And, and as the new poll shows, it's not what the people want either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Madam Chair, we have six remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Danielle Siliento. Uh, Ms. Siliento, if you can give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, Danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Last name Chiliento, C-I-L-I-E-N-T-O. Thank you. Um, I called in a couple weeks ago. I was the mother of three, just calling nicely to ask you to please consider reopening the beaches for recreation for me and my children who are at home, homeschooling all day. The parks are closed and we were just looking for somewhere to go. 
And in the meantime, I just sat quietly in my house. We're just hiding under our bed over here, just trying to get through the day. And my mother-in-law lives on Bel Air Beach and she keeps inviting me to go over to her beach. She lives in a condo. And I said, no, no, no. I actually have a particular beach spot I really like to go to. And, you know, just trying to keep our distance. So the other night I agreed finally, because I want to get out of the house with my kids. And I went down to Bel Air Beach around sunset. The boys brought their boogie boards. Um, there was like 75 people there on the beach, all spread out. No one was close together, but I was like flabbergasted. I'm like, so people are able to go to the beach, just not me, not my kids, because we don't own beachfront property. And I just think that's completely unfair. And everybody down there was doing exactly what they should be. And in regards to one of the comments earlier, you said, oh, the people aren't ready. They need more than two days notice to get ready to go to the beach. It's like, We've been going to, I've lived here 40 years. I've gone to the beach my entire life. Like I don't need like a new um, way to go about it. I don't want people closer than six feet to me anyway. I never have. I want to go to the beach with my kids to play in the sand. I want to soak up the sun and I want to get away from the bad news and all of the fear and the panic that is in our world today. And I just feel like you guys aren't listening to us. No one's listening to us. And the guy who just called in before, from St. Pete, like, where are you even getting that poll? And are you even from Florida? Do you even like the beach? Like, we can't talk about businesses because we're waiting on the governor. We already established that. What we can talk about is the fact that you guys have the power to open the beaches and the pools, okay? That is where we should be still talking about. That is what I was expecting to be talked about today. The sheriff said he can manage it fine. The beaches are, we're on a peninsula for crying out loud. I mean, we can spread out all around three sides of this county. And you guys are still acting like we aren't able to do that. And then you're complaining that people are crowded on little um, little causeways and things. Like, yeah, people want to get outside. Like, we need something. Give us some hope. Give us something. You can't keep us locked under our beds with our kids in here as we try to, like, school them and do everything that on top of it. And we have nowhere to go. Parks aren't open. There's no place else. And we want to go out, spread out on the beach just for a little bit. I don't even need to go there that long. But it's not fair that we're not being heard and that you guys are just kicking the can down the road. And I'm supposed to just keep sitting here waiting week after week for you to do something. So I am politely and I'm sorry that I'm upset, but like the beach is like for me, like my first right. Like I never thought in my life someone would take the beach away from me. And now it's been taken away and I want it back. I want the freedom for me and my family to live the life in clear water that I was born into. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just remind people that our parks are open. You can go to the park any day. Go ahead. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Tiffany. Uh, I don't have a last name. So Tiffany, if you'll give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, uh, my name is Tiffany Beach. I live 11 Baymont Street, Clearwater Beach. Um, I appreciate all your hard work and thank you for all, all that you're doing. Um, I do want to just reiterate a couple of comments that have already been said. I know you didn't want us to repeat stuff, but I just feel like it's important. Um, we've got a million people here and we've got 31 deaths. Now, granted, nobody wants anybody to die, um, but the amount of our population that have gotten COVID is 0.07% with a 0.003% death. Um, the measures to close the beaches and the pools are based on a large model of predictions of very huge illness and death. Um, we've not come anywhere close to those. Pinellas County hospitals are in good shape. Last week, you guys all asked for Sheriff and Mr. Burton's opinions and to look into the information and the data and talk to the city partners. They did a great job. They gave recommendations and now you're not listening to them. And I. I it's baffling. Um, you asked for the, the input from the community last week. You didn't listen to them. Um, we know how to so social distance. This is not just gonna be open it up and it's a free for all. That's not how we're doing things. Um, there's been more and more medical community speaking out about what this is actually like. Uh, Dr. Erickson of Accelerated Healthcare in California and his partner produced all kinds of information and data. They looked, they even gave out about Sweden and Norway that have about the same amount of people and the same amount of illness and the same amount of death. One country sheltered in place and the other one did not. And they had the same results. Please listen to our sheriff and Mr. Burton. 
they came up with all kinds of great information and great ways to move forward. Um, give us back our freedom, give us back our beaches, give us back our pools. We are all smart and we can all do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Sheila Nagley. Uh, Ms. Nagley, Nagley, if you can give us your first last name, uh, spelling address, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, you'll have to unmute, please. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Sheila Nagley. It's S H I E L I A. Nagley, N-A-G-L-E-Y, and I live in Tierbury. Um, I wanted to just say that I'm in favor of opening pools, beaches, and playgrounds. People can choose whether or not to go to these places. They're not forced to. And we are in this, you know, for the long haul. We're not going to have a cure or a vaccine for a long time. So we have to allow people to be responsible for taking actions that are appropriate for them, for keeping themselves safe, not one size fits all. If you have existing conditions, you, you gotta be very careful and you're responsible for keeping yourself safe. I agree with the sheriff and the county administrator's comments and really appreciate their recommendations and think that you should listen to them because I think not, if we don't open them, I think we're gonna create much bigger problems as frustration mounts because 99% of the people are, as they would view it, being penalized. Uh, now that everybody has done a great job of flattening the curve and not overwhelming healthcare, these freedoms and rights need to be reinstated. So I hope that you'll vote in favor of opening the pools, beaches, and playgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have five remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Justin Potts. Uh, Mr. Potts, if you'll give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. And you'll have to unmute, sir. Mr. Potts? Mr. Potts, can you hit unmute on your, there you go. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. You have three, uh, give us your first Hi. last name and spelling, please. Yes, Justin Potts, uh, J-U-S-T-I-N-P-O-T-T-S. That's uh, Clearwater, Florida. Uh, my, my only comment was with opening the beaches. Sir, there's a lot of feedback right now. Do you have another stream going of this, this video? Uh, my only comment was opening beaches without uh, any restriction, without a phase type opening. I think it's very uh, naive to think that, that there won't be a tremendous influx of outside visitors. I understand the residents' uh, perspective. I feel very similar to that. Uh, however, um, you're going to increase traffic at the, uh, at the airport. Uh, I mean, we have world-class beaches. It's very naive thinking to think that they're not going to very quickly become crowded. Uh, in the coming days when the beaches are, are open, if it is a wide open without restriction uh, scenario. Um, I would just consider, uh, ask the board to consider a phased reopening, uh, being a little bit more cautious than the all or nothing approach. And uh, that's my only comment today, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Denise, F-O-U-G-E-R-E. Um, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, gives your first last name, spelling and address, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Okay, so I don't know why my software wasn't working. I just got a brand new computer not even a month ago. And I also was using the Zoom link that you provided on the commissioner Facebook page. So I'm just glad I got through with the phone. So thank you so much for that. Um, I run an online local magazine called enjoypinellas.com. And we also have a really active Facebook group. Um, we've reached about almost 700,000 Pinellas County residents a month. And I've done extensive polling on all of these issues. And I have a few questions and a couple statements. Um, but my, real quick, my statements are, I agree with the pool um, opening. I feel like people need that for exercise. Um, and I also, um, I, I feel like with the beach right now, like maybe we're kind of rushing it and to open it up on Thursday. Like why can't we open it up on Monday or Tuesday? That'll also eliminate the people rushing to the beach on the weekend as well as um, 
minimizing the, the Tampa visitors that will be driving over, you know, across the bridge. And then speaking of that, I wanted to talk about, um, are you guys um, ready for the influx of the Tampa, the Tampa visitors? Because there is an influx um, of the virus there. It's pretty much a hotbed and it's just a short drive over to our beaches. So are you ready for that? Um, and then as far as with the pools, are you voting today to open the pools as of Thursday at 6 a.m.? Because I hope you do, and I hope you vote yes. Um, have you asked for the expansion of testing? I feel like there's not enough tests to go around and that perhaps our minority is not being adequately tested. Um, if you can um, perhaps maybe reach out to Baycare and Morden Plant. I have people that I know there that say that they do have the ability to test. So maybe make that more widespread and then market it to the residents to let them know where the testing is because there's been a lot of questions and confusion on that. And then as far as opening the businesses, I realize that you can't open them like right away because of the state order, which will expire in a few days. I do feel that it's important to have a plan in place. Are you requiring the businesses to do continual disinfecting measures? And are you using the CDC guidelines for that? And is there any way to enforce that that's actually being done? Because I know some people that probably won't do that. And that puts the public health at risk considering the virus can stay for a few days. Um, and then also uh, regarding nursing homes, um, what's really happening with that? I don't, I see a little bit of talk, but not much. Um, will you allow outside visitation as long as it's being properly monitored and their social distancing being adhered to? And um, and what what are your thoughts on maybe a liability waiver to help the nursing homes be more open to you know allowing those nursing home residents to visit with their family, especially in this time of crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Laura Royal. Um, Ms. Royal, I'm sorry, your software is also out of date. Uh, you're gonna have to call into the line. Um, Don, would you be willing to give out that phone number one more time? I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> sure, it is, uh, again, the call in, for people who need to call in, the number is 1-646-558-8000. Five, six. Again, one six four six five five eight eight six five six. Then you'll have to enter the webinar ID number. That number is 238-247-671. Again, 238-247-671. Once you've got through, dial star nine to raise your hand. Thank you, Don. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Nick Gers, G-E-R-Z. Uh, Nick, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, give us your first last name, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Nick Gers, G-E-R-S, Treasure Island, Florida. Uh, I'd like to ask that Mr. Welch's vote is stricken from the record, as I understand he's deathly afraid of seagulls, and that's why he does not support the beaches being open again. Please strike his vote from the record. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Eric Mahoney. Uh, Mr. Mahoney, if you'll go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling and address, and you'll have three minutes. Eric Mahoney, M-A-H-O-N-E-Y, 1100 Mineola Court, Palm Harbor, Florida. Uh, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak. I agree 100% with what the sheriff is saying, and I, I think uh, we all should trust him. He's him and his deputies are out in the community. They know what's going on. I can see the frustration in his face. Um, I think he's, he really thinks that uh, we need to start working on opening everything up. I also want to, I don't know if you're aware of Attorney General Barr's uh, memo he he uh, put out yesterday to be on the lookout for local and state directives that could violate religious free speech or economic rights under the constitution. If a state or local ordinance crosses the line from an appropriate exercise of authority to stop the spread of COVID-19 into an overbearing infringement of constitutional and statutory protections, the Department of Justice may have an obligation to address that overreach in federal court. Now, we were told two, we were told two million deaths, hospitals overrun, the health system wouldn't, wouldn't be able to keep up and that's simply not the case in our area. None of that has happened. Our health system has kept up. We have more hospital beds in the whole state than we had even pre-COVID. So the, you need to worry about, if we keep closing stuff down, lawsuits and things like this are going to start happening. And uh, something you got to pay attention to. It's uh, a lot of uh, civil liberties are taken away 
and um, pay attention to what the sheriff's saying. He, he, he is out there in the community. Really take what he's saying to heart. Um, him and the, um, it's uh, just really listen to, the, to, to someone who's, uh, who seems to have it right and is, uh, is out in the community, him and his deputy. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have, we have a lot of hands that went up. We've got about eight speakers remaining now. Okay, thank um, you. We'll go to the next one. It's uh, Richie, and I don't have a last name. Uh, Richie, if you can give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes, sir. Richie? Hello? Richie Davis, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Claudia Lane, Palm Harbor, Florida. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been in the medical field and public health for going on 20 years. And I understand a lot of the constraints about the previous callers um, and you know, wanting to exercise their independence. Um, one, I have a concern that you know, I believe all those people would exercise their independence, but I also believe exercise their independence responsibly. But I also believe that they're projecting that responsibility and independence onto the general public, which I do, do not believe has the common sense to abide by um, public health standards. Um, I do believe everybody that has spoken will would absolutely have the integrity and intention and intelligence to manage that, but I do not believe the general public can. I also believe that it's the job of this quorum to put public health as the number one um, thing in the forefront. Um, I want to keep it brief. I just don't believe that um, it's shown throughout history that having trust and confidence in the general public regarding issues of, such as this has not been beneficial. Um, I wanna thank this team for everything they've done. I wanna thank the sheriff especially. Um, I've listened to this whole bit and I can tell that he has integrity and he is doing the best job and he is doing, the, you know, his team is doing the best job they can. I also wanna say, I completely agree with Kenneth Welch. I do not believe he's scared of seagulls. Um, <laughs> I believe that he has the public's best interest at heart as do I, and um, I just think, you know, having large groups self-monitor themselves is not going to be something that's beneficial to the general public. Um, I'm talking specifically to beaches. I do believe, based on the size and geography um, and the square footage, that pools would be much easier to um, be applied at this point in time. Thank you, for everybody, for your time and your hard work. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 13 speakers remaining. Um, do you want to continue or break well, or? <clears throat> Does anybody feel the need for a break right now? Or should we just get through this? Let's keep going. All right, our next speaker is Claudia Varela, V-A-R-E-L-A. -E uh, Claudia, if you give us your first last name address and you'll have three minutes. Ms. Varela? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. I just, um, my name is, uh, I'm going to spell it V I R E L A, that's my last name. Uh, 127 Forest Lakes Boulevard South. I'm a pet grooming business owner. I know that someone else, another, uh, just talk about it and I'm going to be into that uh, issue. But I will only want to address two thoughts. The first of all is that someone else says that we need to start living a new normal life. And I think that has to do with we need to reopen spaces. We need to reopen the economy to, to the small businesses. And we need to start um, to start having the chance to put our rights uh, out there. 
to leave as a, with the CDC guidelines because this is not going to be for the next month. This is going to be for the next several months. And we need to start knowing what is to leave with, um, with some other um, new strict rules. Either it's not about if we want or if we don't want or if we like or if we don't like it. It's about a community thing. It's about a society. And it's not only about me and my family. It's about the others and what happened. And this is going to take so long. And because of that, I think that we are going to be, that we are going to be need to remind us that, um, uh, with a fine and with some consequence because we are human and as a human we're going to tend to forget the implications so I think that one of the thoughts that hadn't been like put on the table and I want to emphasize is that if we open all again and I am too and I'm into it and I think we should is that we only need to put a very strict and clear rules about how is it going to happen if some people doesn't uh, get comply to what they have to because um, we have been doing so well but there are some people that doesn't thank you thank you Madam Chair, our next speaker is on a telephone line, last four digits, 4531. If you give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Hey guys, I wanna thank you all for uh, everything you guys have been doing this uh, crazy time. My name is Henry Fusell. I just moved here to Seminole, Florida from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Um, my concern of being an unemployed bartender is unemployment. It's been hectic, um, to say the least. Uh, there's no information out there that we can get there's no way to contact anybody i know this doesn't really have anything to do with you guys but maybe moving forward we could have a, a branch here in pinellas county and maybe other counties can do it too to uh help us with that it's uh it's rough i've had to borrow money it's not it's not been the easiest situation um don't want to go too much into that but uh also with beaches i believe beaches could be a great thing i've snuck there myself not gonna lie uh but in general um it's just rough and uh i think if you guys could maybe uh help us out and come together and you know i know re restaurants and bars make a ton of revenue for the county state and whatnot and uh we're hurting i talked to a lot of people i kind of broke myself but uh i've helped some people get some groceries and whatnot because of the whole situation um and i was thinking something while i was listening to all you guys um Maybe if we do the beaches where you go, you know, by zip code to certain beaches, like I live in Seminole, I could go to Indian Rocks to help spread out people and not have them gathered. That would be something that could do maybe a 30 day trial of. Um, I don't know. It's a, I know it's a crazy situation we're in and uh, we're going to get through it and uh, appreciate everything you guys do. And uh, just remember this unemployment situation is uh it's, it's miserable. <laughs> I've applied places. I didn't want to just take a job. Um, hopefully I have a new career going on. Um, I know it's, uh, it's tough, uh, but thank you for everything you guys do. And, uh, please, uh, remember this whole unemployment thing. Um, Madam Chair, can I just make a comment to the gentleman? I said last week, and I guess we need to say it again. If you're having trouble with unemployment, call your state representative. For you, sir, it would be Representative Nick DeSegli. And to get his contact information, if you go to myfloridahouse.gov, um, his office numbers will be there. Um, call the local number, not the Tallahassee number. Um, but the governor and the state legislature has requested that if we get calls for somebody that's having difficulty getting their unemployment, to contact the local state representative and they will help facilitate it. So I recommend you contact Nick DeSegli and, and help him have him help you. Uh, I actually have contacted him and have not heard back um, through email and calls. So I, I, I don't well, want to be that, that guy. Case, but. In that case, then what I would recommend you do is that you call your senator. So Senator Brandis would be your senator um, and his office will also help you. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank right, you, thanks Madam Chair. For Okay, Madam Chair, our next speaker is on the phone line, uh, last four digits, 4531. 
Uh, if you'll give us your first last name, your address, your spelling, and you'll have three minutes. I think you guys went back to me, Henry Fusell, and said I'm unmuted. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, you didn't have any further comments, right? No, guys. Uh, you know, sorry to be stressed out about it. I don't want to. It's just, it's rough. It's really rough. Um, please do what you guys can to help us, you know. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Madam Speaker, our, our next speaker is on the telephone line. Last four digits is 0355. Uh, if you'll give us your first, last name, spelling, and, and address, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, yeah, my name's Darren Suffrage, last name, S-U-F-F-R-A-D-T. I live in Brighton Bay, St. Pete, Florida. Um, first, I can guarantee, if I bet my last bottom dollar, none of y'all are a viral specialist or doctor. You're not looking at the facts, what's going on. Doctors in California just came out saying you got a .003 chance of dying from this virus. Kids are basically immune from it. And I just think you're out, you're, um, outreach and your boundaries, you're going overboard. So you need to open the pools, open the beaches. We got to start getting this thing going again. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is on the phone line. Last four digits, 3485. If you'll give us your first last name, the spelling, your address, and then also uh, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. Lisa Hendrickson. H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S-O-N, 17960, Gulf Boulevard, Reddington Shores, Florida. And my comments are in regards to opening the beaches and the pools. I feel it's a little too soon to open the beaches and the pools for the safety of all. I ask that the commission just pause in their steps for a moment, and at the very least, just wait to act until the governor's updated order in just less than two days. This will allow for phase one to employ in a systematic fashion and allow the businesses to get ready to support the traffic and the patrons that are going to be coming onto the beach. However, at the time in which the commission does determine it's time to open the beaches, I'd like to suggest and also support instituting the beach signs that the sheriff and Barry Burton talked about but most importantly, I'd like to ask the sheriff and the county administrator to employ planes flying over the beaches with banners, which will clearly establish the expected messaging and social distancing requires. Banners such as six feet apart, no groups of 10 or more, spread out, be responsible. And one thing I heard this morning on the call was Dr. Cho, Dr. Cho mentioned you know, this is a new virus. We haven't eliminated the virus by instituting the measures that we have to date, and it's probably going to be around for a while. So I'm hoping that we can support taking it slow. We don't move too swiftly to open spaces that are going to invite crowds. And unfortunately, no matter how well we patrol opening beaches, and pools are going to invite crowds. I thank you for your time, commissioners. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Peter Schorsch. Uh, Mr. Schorsch, if you can give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Peter Schorsch, S-C-H-O-R-S-C-H. I live at 5733 Bayou Grand Boulevard, Northeast. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak right now. Uh, there had been, um, some comment earlier about some about some polling that uh, I commissioned. I'm the publisher of FloridaPolitics.com. I wanted to uh, make sure that the full commission had those numbers. Um, St. Pete Polls and I commissioned or uh, surveyed 3,100 uh, St. Petersburg residents last night, which uh, is an enormous sample of the county. I would be it has a 1.9 percent margin of error. It's a fairly significant poll uh, at that point. It was an IVR poll, which means it's a robo poll. It's not a live call. Uh, we asked three questions. Would you support reopening of the county's beaches and community swimming pools? 37% uh, said yes, 56% said no, uh, and 8% said that they were unsure. Um, the second question was, would you support a countywide order requiring people to wear masks 
while in public, as some other counties in Florida have done? 69% said yes. And then do you think that non-essential businesses should be allowed to open back up in Pinellas County? The numbers were there, 46% said yes, and 44% said no. I know some of you on the commission have relied on our polling for your political ambitions and so forth, and you've trusted those numbers before. I ask you to trust them again. 83 people uh, died in Florida yesterday. It was our record amount of deaths. Um, we are not out of the woods. If you, look at the Nash, if you look at the New York Times and the Washington Post reporting, it shows that COVID-19 deaths are greatly underreported at this point, almost two to three times what they are being underreported. I had the unfortunate task of breaking the news about uh, the outbreak at Freedom Square. I fear that there could be more of those as people who are asymptomatic, people young enough to go to the beach, they go there on their day off, and then they return to our hospitals and our nursing homes, and they bring back COVID-19. Governor DeSantis announced uh, just moments ago uh, from the White House that he's going to be making a decision uh, about his regulations. I think it's important that you know that as well. Um, I think we only need a couple of days here. Sheriff Goltieri, you are probably the most thoughtful leader in Florida politics. I have said that about you, even when I have disagreed with you, which is many times, as you know, but you definitely put your all into thinking and you're not afraid to admit when data has given you the opportunity to change your mind as it is here. I think you are a general fighting a rear guard action. I think we need just a few more days here, maybe a few, maybe another week or so of keeping this, of, of Mr. Keeping Shor, the your three system. minutes has expired. I appreciate the time very much. Thank you, County Commission. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Taylor, uh, no last name. Uh, if you can give us your first last name, uh, spell it, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. You'll have to unmute on your side. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, uh, my name is Taylor Laner, L-A-Y-N-E-R. Um, I live in Clearwater, Florida. Um, just listening to uh, some of the previous callers and things like that and the polls that are going out. Um, I'm curious who, who are, who are the people filling out these polls? Because from the uh, widespread community and widespread of everything that I see, everyone is uh, ready to kind of open up as far as going to the beaches and uh, opening pools. Uh, should social distancing still be a, a main thing? Of course. Um, but the fact that the beaches are closed and pools are closed and while we look at uh, Jacksonville, they're, I think they are on day 12 or 13 since they opened and their cases have been going down. Um, so, and whoever, uh, an earlier caller said the, uh, that Tampa was a hotbed for cases. The percentage in Tampa is 0.0007% uh, or 0.7%, 0.07%. Um, so I don't understand how that, that is considered a hotbed. Um, it just, the sheriff knows what he's doing. Um, he's going off of statistics. He's going off of the data that we are given. Um, the, like someone said earlier, the White House said that heat and uh, UV rays and sunlight is what we should be exposing ourselves to. We should not be inside. If we can maintain social business, distancing, why should we uh, not do what is recommended or what will help us. And then on a separate topic, what I know that uh, uh, the chair, uh, Ms. Gerald, or Gerard, excuse me, said that parks are open. Uh, why are fields and things like that not open for kids to go play, for parents to get out? Parents are kids' own principals right now. Uh, I'm a teacher in Pinellas County. I, I know the struggle with the education right now and all of that. Uh, why are kids not going out and playing sports at fields. The social distancing, distancing isn't an issue at fields. So uh, that is all that I have. Uh, I appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you. Madam Chair, for the record, we have 11 remaining speakers. Um, our next speaker is on the phone line, last four digits, 6519. If you'll give us your first last name, spelling, address, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hello. Hello. 
This is Laura Royal, R-O-Y-A-L, Pinellas Park, Florida. I'm calling, I'm a board member of our homeowners association here in the quaint city of Pinellas Park. And my first question is the rush to please allow us members of a, another board, another governing board, that we need to hold our own meeting and be able to discuss with our management company and our legal counsel before we would reopen the pool with the correct notice that we need to be posting and notifying our residents on. So again, the rush to open, maybe again, keep with the May 1 deadline. Second, uh, the notice that was posted by the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office when the pools were closed by the resolution ordinance the sheriff's office actually came out to the different communities to have the notice posted about the pool closures. Will they be doing the same type of notice about the limited reopening and the enforcement by the sheriff? We are actually in the city of Pinellas Park. So if we need enforcement assistance, do we contact our local police or the sheriff's office? And with that, I will yield back to the meeting members. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have nine speakers remaining. Our next speaker is Marilyn Thurman, or Terman, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Terman, if you could go ahead and give us your first last name, your spelling, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Sure, it's Marilyn Terman, M-A-R-I-L-Y-N, last name is T-U-R-M-A-N, um, Clearwater, Florida. Um, and I just want to say, there were some folk who, respond, who uh, commented saying that um, the commissioners um, um, are not considering everybody's opinions or the comments that were made in the two weeks ago at the previous meeting. And that's, just, that's exactly what's being done. Every, they're considering everybody's position. You can't just consider those who live on the beach or those who are just focused on recreation. I understand recreation. I want to get out of the house myself. I feel you on that. But we've got to consider everybody. Um, and it's not that um, those who say they're in opposition of the beach opening, I think that we just have to focus on what is the priority right now. And I believe it was Mr. Schorsch who said, who talked about the fact that if you open up the beaches and people are out there rec creating, if they're not practicing the distancing, which I'm not saying that they can't, and I love what Sheriff Walteri was saying um, uh, about being able to enforce and having, you know, the deputies out there, but in the event that they're not and they're getting exposed and they're going back into their families and they're re-exposing them, and then we keep talking about these numbers and the curve has gone down, but we've not tested. I'm telling you, we have not properly tested. Those numbers cannot be accurate. There's absolutely no way um, that those numbers can be accurate. We can, we can say that whatever we want them to say in order to appease that which we want to, to happen. Um, but um, I'm uncomfortable with the numbers and I too wish that we could imp implement more um, testing sites so that we can make sure that we know who has what is the asymptomatic um, folk who I'm most concerned about. And let me just say this, if we do open the beaches, I hope, I hope that no one, no one else ever gets exposed to this disease or any issue for that matter. But I, I just want to assure you, your privilege will not, this, this disease doesn't see color, doesn't see economic status. We're all vulnerable to it. And I just think that everybody needs to consider everybody, not just the folk on the beach, but everybody in our, in our Tampa Bay area. Everybody in this whole the world as a matter of fact, but nonetheless, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are eight speakers remaining. Our next speaker is Marilyn, oh, I'm sorry, Morgan Rutch. Uh, Ms. Rutch, if you could give us your first last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. Okay, my name is Morgan Rutch and I live in Gulfport, Florida. M-O-R-G-A-N-R-U-T-C-H. Um, and first, I'd like to just start by saying I work for a home health company in Pinellas and Pasco County, and we don't have any positive cases of COVID-19 patients. 
And I, I truly believe that's because our clinicians and our staff is taking every precaution possible and, you know, doing everything that's recommended, washing your hands, sanitizing, not touching the patients unless they absolutely have to, to take vitals. So that, that is working. And like I said, we have over a hundred patients on census. So the precautions are, are absolutely necessary. Um, but besides that, I 100% support opening of the beaches, playgrounds, and businesses. There's a lot of people that can't even feed their children right now because they don't have any income. And um, with the beaches, you know, I'm working every day. And I know I'm not just speaking for myself. I'm working every day. And the only thing I like to do in the little free time that I have is go to the gym and go to the beach. And I don't even have that outlet. So at this point, it's turning into an issue with mental health. And, you know, if we can't get to those outlets, what are we going to do? We're going to go crazy cooped up in our house. And I just can't wrap my head around the fact that we're allowed to go to grocery stores and Home Depot and Lowe's and, you know, touch everything that a hundred people touched, but we're not allowed to go sit on the beach in the sand and just sit in the sun by ourselves on a chair. It doesn't make any sense to me. And, you know, everything the sheriff said, there is perfect ways to do this. You know, keep your distance. Don't go in groups. I 100% agree with him. And I feel like the only way people can build immunity to this virus is to be exposed to it. I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> just common sense. And I refuse to live in fear and allow whatever agenda is behind this to um, sway what I do. And you know, without gyms and beaches, I personally feel very unhealthy and I would just like to get back to a normal life. And if people don't wanna go out and go to the beach, that's fine, they have that choice but at least give the rest of us a fair chance to go live our lives, stay healthy and support ourselves financially. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Robert Catterton. Uh, Mr. Catterton, if you give us your first last name, spell it, uh, give us your address and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Robert Catterton. I live in St. Petersburg. And uh, I, I really would like to just comment on the fact that I think that overall, we've lost sight of what we were originally asked to do. We were originally asked to shelter in place, to stay apart in order to flatten the curve, to ease the level on our medical world. I mean, your real numbers are in our hospitals. We're being told certain tests work, certain tests are not accurate. The hospitals are not full. The governor himself was over at Tampa General. Those people stated they're not. I mean, the reality is the influx and the outflows of them hospitals and our medical professionals, we're not seeing that. We were asked to stay home, to flatten the curve. We have more than done that. It's time to get back to living. Being cooped up in our home is surviving. Existing and surviving is not living. It's time to move ahead, folks. You guys have a chance to control this portion of the lockdown eyes are upon you and I know you know that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Karen Mullins. Uh, Ms. Mullins, if you'll give us your first last name, your address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Hi, Karen Mullins, K-A-R-E-N-M-U-L-L-I-N-S. I live in Dunedin. Good Thank afternoon, uh, commissioners. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. I have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I want to just say I do, do concur with the previous caller, Marilyn Terman. Um, she hit on ev almost every point that I wanted to make. Um, I'd like to ask the commission, what is the cost difference in enforcement of compliance to open the beaches? And if that, um, if that is a large amount and those funds can be used elsewhere, can those funds be used to get folks back to work. What is our return on investment here? I have one more question for Dr. Chow. When will we reach herd immunity? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is from the phone line. Uh, last four digits, 1071. If you'll give us your, your first you'll give us your first name, your last name, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, Hello? can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? Yes, ma'am, okay. go ahead. Uh, all right, 
My name is Faith, F-A-I-T-H, Worley, W-O-R-L-E-Y. I'm a resident of Safety Harbor, Florida. I am also the parent of six children, five of which are 14 or younger. So um, everyone's been talking about the school situation. I have two preschoolers, an elementary, two middle schoolers, four of which are boys. So uh, we have an annual membership to Honeymoon Island that we have not been able to use. We have followed the social guidelines uh, for everything to the maximum. My five children who are under the age of 18 have not even stepped in a store since uh, the second week of March, but we are becoming increasingly weary with the, all of the restrictions the children do not understand the playgrounds being marked off at the parks. That would be the reason that we would go. Uh, our children um, are really a little too young to go on the, on the biking trails. So we have very little that we can do. But um, I just implore you to consider all of the impact to all of the families. Um, we have been watching the numbers. We have done what we've been asked to do. The folks who have not complied, those folks are not ever going to comply. So if we wait for them, we're all going to remain uh, sheltered in place or in lockdown indefinitely. And it is very unhealthy for um, a large family unit. Many people are dealing with loneliness. We're not dealing with loneliness. But um, again, we have followed this to the T. We don't even see family members except for drive-by who do not live with us. Um, we are impacted in many ways. We have a parent in uh, memory care or we understand the safeguards, but we do not understand uh, unnecessary restrictions. Uh, if there is a way to limit the beaches to Pinellas County, Residents, I believe that would be ideal. We have heard that's going to be problematic. So let's open them up. If we do not start somewhere, we're not ever going to get where we need to go. Thank you very much. That's all my comments. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are five remaining speakers. Our next speaker is on the phone line, last four digits, 5302. If you'll give us your first name, your last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, my name is Matt Chapman, uh, C-H-A-P is in Paul M-A-N. Uh, I am in Clearwater, Florida. Um, so yeah, I, I, it was probably two, three weeks ago, one of these meetings, actually, I, I called in and, and spoke. Uh, my wife actually has emailed in, and uh, apparently, as those are a matter of public record, News 8 contacted us. We did a... a uh, uh, an interview for the news via uh, FaceTime that was on, I think, sometime last week. Um, and in the course of that, they asked if we had been kind of following along, and I replied that I, I really hadn't, because um, honestly, my take initially was that it was a bit of a dog and pony show. Um, decisions were predetermined. The, really, the feedback did not matter in terms of what decision was going to be made. Um, so based on that, I'm really not going to waste my time with any kind of intellectual argument uh, here. But I do think it's, it's instructive for people to watch how quickly politicians exercise control uh, based on models that necessarily at the beginning have to consider an infinite number of outcomes, uh, yet are reluctant to rel relinquish control uh, as that real data, data starts to dispute any kind of apocalyptic predictions. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, of all tyrannies, a tyranny exercise for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. Those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end. They do so with the approval of their own conscience. Um, at this point, it, it really it, it seems that exceptions are holding a higher position of privilege than the rule when, when we're making a lot of these decisions. Um, and it's my, my, just my personal opinion, it's time for people to start kind of taking a stand. So, well, I appreciate the sheriff's support on, on relaxing some of these pool and beach measures. Um, I would just say, should they not pass, I'm not going to be a jerk about it, but I do fully intend to contact our interviewer over there at Channel 8, see if there's any interest in, in filming me being arrested 
for civil disobedience um, because I'm going to the beach and the only way I'm being taken is by force. So you guys have a nice day. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is on the phone line. Uh, last four digits, 5913. Uh, if you'll give us your first last name, spell it, give us your address, and you'll have three minutes. Hello, this is Dan Lidke, last name L-I-E-D-T-K-E, -E, 2812 Kipps Colony Drive, Gulfport, Florida. And I just want to mention that I hope we all understand the difference between public opinion and science. They're two totally different things. If you're relying on polling to make your decision on whether to open the beaches, you're not basing your decision on science, which is what we need more of. We know the risks of outdoor transmission are almost zero, as new science released last week has proven the virus quickly dies in less than two minutes in humid, sunny conditions. When the sun is out, we are actually safer outdoors than we are indoors. And when the sun is out, we will always be safer outdoors than in a PSDA bus. We support the sheriff and trust in his confidence to help ensure we all continue to adhere to CDC guidelines. And finally, with air travel down 95%, there's no way possible for beach hotels to fill up. Please reopen all the beaches and all the pools. The sooner the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have two remaining speakers. Um, our next speaker is on the phone line, last four digits, 4836. Uh, if you'll go ahead and give us your first last name, your address, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, my name is Jennifer Barbaro. I am a resident of Bel Air Beach, Florida. And um, thank you for all you're doing. I do empathize with all the people feeling extremely overwhelmed and restricted as I think all of us on some level are, are definitely uh, feeling this way. Um, however, I am concerned um, due to the lack of available testing and the testing that's been done and the asymptomatic people. Um, it, I feel the numbers are probably somewhat skewed and it is hard to tell exactly what is going on in this county and throughout the state. So I personally, do not feel safe. I have been using orders to get my groceries. I have not been to a store. I have not gone out in public. I have social distance um, completely. And um, I personally, even if the beaches are opened, um, probably will not be using them right now or, or some type of public pool. Um, that's my choice. Um, I do understand that it's probably inevitable, um, whether tomorrow or in a week from now, that pools and beaches will be reopened. Um, people are wanting it, and I do understand that, that desire. Um, but I do think that guidelines that are specific and uniform then are going to be really, really of great importance. Um, I think that there's a lot of peer pressure and maybe that's not being considered, but I see this like with the mask situation. Uh, for example, my stepmom, who's probably going to be forced to go back to work. She's in her 60s living with my 70 plus year old father. Um, my father's retired and at home. She works in a small office in Clearwater Beach and, you know, will be exposed to tourists and different people. If there was a requirement that everyone in public needed to wear a mask, like many other cities are doing, I think she would feel somewhat comfortable and definitely wants to get back to work. However, um, you know, if everyone is not following the same standard or the same set of rules, I think there's pressure because people feel differently about different things and believe different theories on what's going to work. So for example, if one person is wearing a mask in an office, public facing, where other people aren't and think it's ridiculous, there's going to be commentary on that and peer pressure. And I think the same thing with the swimming pools and the condos and the condo associations. I think if there's a group of people that demand that their pool be open and that other pools around them are being open, even if that particular, particular association doesn't have a plan, they're going to feel the pressure and open their pool, whether it's safe or not. And I think there is a lot of pressure from the community to open things right now, which I respect and understand, but then I think it's our responsibility as a community and as, as our leaders, our county commissioners, to set 
some kind of standard or guideline that is very clear for everyone and not just leave it up to an individual association or a group of people to do the right thing. Because unfortunately, yeah, your time has expired have, now. Okay, people have the best interests in mind, but they don't necessarily always do the right thing. It just doesn't work that way. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our last speaker is Joshua Coville. Uh, Mr. Coville, if you'll give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, thank you. My name is Joshua Coville, and I'm a resident of Bel Air. And I currently live across the street from uh, Bel Air Golf Course. As I look out in my garage today looking out, I've seen more traffic uh, because of the virus as far as the traffic flow of golfers, which is fine. I have no objections to that, and I'm not seeing anybody crossing any boundaries or any lines of getting close or anything. I think people are respectful. But the optics of it is you have folks that are in their 70s and 80s, the people that we're supposed to protect, out there golfing, enjoying the outdoors and the sun, and our beaches are closed. And it doesn't ring true to the optics of being fair to the people. And to speak to the sheriff, I would wonder to him, is it more stressful and, and, and strenuous on his, uh, his officers to have to fight people from going onto the beach than it is to just let people just go on the beach and, and be responsible as we all are. And I think uh, we're missing the point. I think we need to work with the virus and not hide from it because the longer you hide from it, the longer it's gonna stick around and it's gonna catch up with us one, one way or another. And I really hope you guys uh, review that and give us an opportunity to go back to the beach. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have no more speakers that wish to be heard. All right. Okay. Do we have any comments from the commission? We have a motion and second to open the pool. Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could, could we get a restatement of the motion so that we know exactly where we are at? And, and, and we're doing that. Um, I think it's, uh, we got an email during this conversation from uh, condominium management uh, directors about the size of their pools and things like that, that we would encourage associations to keep their pools closed if they don't want to be an enforcement agent uh, and if they don't have the ability to enforce it. Uh, because the last thing we want is uh, sheriff's deputies or local law enforcement coming to apartment complexes and condos and breaking up those kind of, uh, those kind of problems. But if we could get a restatement of exactly what the motion is, so we know what that is. Yes. Uh, Jeanette, do you have that? Jeanette, you're muted. If, if I could, here's here's what I wrote down when Commissioner Peters first made the motion. Right. Um, okay. She stated that she would move to approve opening the pools as set forth in the resolution which does include the 50% occupancy limitation and then following CDC guidelines for distancing and, and cleaning and sanitation. And she also stated that they would open on April 30th at 6 a.m. Okay. All right, and we had a second from uh, Commissioner Seal. Yeah, hey, I didn't say April 30th. I said Wednesday at 6 a.m., which is April 29th. Oh, I thought you said Thursday. You were talking about a day and a half to get ready. Yes, and the half a day is today since we should have, well, I thought we'd be done by noon today, so that would have been a right, half a day. Tomorrow's so. Wednesday. Right, so I, I stated on Wednesday that as tomorrow at 6 a.m. is what I stated. I don't believe they need till Thursday on the pools. Thursday, sure, on the beaches, but not on the pools. So my, my motion was for Wednesday, the 29th. Uh, Commissioner Seal, do you support that? I also thought it was on Thursday and I support Thursday. My notes also indicated Thursday. Mr. Egger, did you hear? Yeah, something? I just, yeah, I, yeah that, that's all I was going to say. It is Thursday. So, was the so I'm happy to go ahead for, with the statement I had actually on uh, asked for when Friday. I, I had asked for Friday, and um, Commissioner Peters was unwilling to change that. So I'm 
I'm fine with Thursday, but that was the original ask, and I'm going to be be happy, content with that. So if I said Thursday, then I would stand corrected and be happy to do 6 a.m. on Thursday. And that gives them all day tomorrow to do preparing. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Peters for Thursday at 6 a.m., a second from Commissioner Seal. Uh, let's Wait, hold Anna, Madam yeah. Chair. Oh, please. Uh, could we make sure that we have a good communication process for what the CDC guidelines are for pools? Because um, I have looked them up and we want to make sure that they, that the condominiums and other pools understand exactly what they are. Because yes. they're pretty lengthy. <laughs> While we were on this call, Dr. Cho and I um, kind of texted back and forth. We'll make sure that we um, we push that out through uh, marketing and communication and, and have a specific plan to reach out to condo and uh, pool owners. That, okay. that includes the 50%, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, let's poll the board then if there are no further comments. Uh, Commissioner Justice? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Welch? Yes. Commissioner Long? <laughs> You're still muted. I'm a yes. I'm okay, sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. And yes for myself. Okay. Next issue. That is unanimous. Um, next issue is the beaches. And I'll entertain a motion of some kind. I would make a motion to open the beaches on Thursday morning. And actually, before I make that motion, I'd like to the sheriff to say um, if he like, apparently supports it, what time on for the few days, what time does he think it is best that his deputies could have it ready and then be prepared for enforcement? As far as I'm concerned, open them at 7 a.m. on Thursday. We got it. Says so that Thursday morning at 7 a.m.? Yeah. Yes, I'm fine with that. Okay. Mr. Eggers, did you have something? Yeah, just um, um, most, again, not all, but when I was looking at some of the uh, feedback from our, from our partners, um, and I did get a chance to talk to a couple of the uh, council people at Clearwater, um, that you know they were asking for two full days to, to get ready. Uh, I think as it relates to the beaches, I you know, think we ought to you know, give it the weekend and start on Monday. Um, I just think we just, that's a different thing. And I know people are ready to go and I think they'll, you know, everybody will exhibit the, you know, caution and, and all of that. But I just think as far as making sure that our partners, our, our beach communities are on the same page, that we get the, the signage out, that we get all the things that we need done and opening on a Monday, I just think gives us a little bit of uh, a chance to do it uh, uh, the right way, in my opinion. So that, that's my only change that I would ask uh, uh, as, as the uh, to the maker of the motion. Mr. Peters. I want to confirm that you took that as a motion and um, yeah and so thank you and I'll make comment then afterwards or I can now I you know I live on Treasure Island and I'm watching Treasure Island their deputies are driving down the beach every 30 minutes and I know the sheriff is already preparing and if the sheriff believes that he's prepared um, I've had hoteliers on Clearwater Beach that said at any given time they look outside and they see anywhere from three to six deputies on the beach. So I, I think that the, the cities are ready. I think they're prepared. They've already done so much in enforcement. I, it almost would be a relief to some of them, but I don't believe they'll cut down on their on their enforcement and how much time they spend on the beach to make sure that everybody is there because they're already doing it. And so I, I'm sorry, and I want to complete that motion and I appreciate any support. We have a second for the motion to open the beaches on Thursday morning. Okay, do we have an alternative motion? Mr. Seal? Uh, yes, I would move to reopen the beaches on Monday. And I would also like to discuss whether we are Limiting it just to exercise, or if we are reopening it 
in full what people would feel about that. And looking at the surrounding counties, um, they, Sarasota doesn't have any public parking and I don't wanna go shut down public parking because I understand the sheriff's concern about going into neighborhoods for sure. But um, I, I'm concerned with, and they, and they're doing it, some places are doing just afternoon and early evening hours. Um, there's variations, but we would be the first ones to be fully opening the beaches from what I've seen. So I just wanna put that out there. Do we have a second for that motion? Opening the beaches Monday Monday morning. Mr. Eggers? Yeah, I would, I would second uh, the, the motion to open the beaches um, um, as, as discussed by the um, uh, county administrator's uh, recommendation um, to, to open them completely. Um, I've expressed my a little bit of concern about the weekends this month, but um, I think if we can get through this first weekend, get everybody kind of uh, lockstep, the businesses and, and, and the government groups that are gonna be taking care. I've felt pretty good with City of Clearwater's plan to take care of their beach and to make sure that uh, that there's cleansing agents there, that there are six that the six foot guidelines that they have, as the sheriff said, they have enough capacity of of uh, deputies to or not deputies but officers to take care of, of of what they need to do to enforce it. So um, I'm 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 going with that, and I think this weekend will give them that uh, that ability. But I think that my mo my second would be to opening up the beaches. And Madam Chair, if I could. Just for clarification, ask the uh, maker of the motion in the second. It sounds like this would be to open the beaches in conformance with what we have set forth in the resolution, specifically paragraphs two and three, which speak to the beaches, the beach parking, and the beach restrooms, all subject to social distancing and other sanitation and um, disinfection guidelines, particularly for the restrooms. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Seal. As the maker of the motion, that's correct, but I still wanted to see if we could have a discussion whether, <clears throat> not making this part of my motion yet, but do you think we should limit this just to exercise or do you all want to fully open up the beaches? I would like just to have a little bit of feedback on that. Thank you. Right. Commissioner Welch. I, I do think the exercise only approach, which is what Clearwater suggested in our comments, at least allows for some ramping up. Uh, I, I won't be supporting the motion because I think we're still too early. I think we need to get the governor's action. But if we're going to do it, I think we should at least have the exercise component in it. And when you say no exercise, you mean no blankets, no coolers, no chairs? Yeah, in their notes, they say permitted walking, jogging, swimming, other exercise, non-permitted sitting, lying down, lounging, standing is in the clear water suggestions. Okay. Uh, Sheriff. Yeah, Commissioner Jarrett, I got to be heard on that, please, because it, 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 that's not possible. And here's why is, is that the private beaches now are all open, all up and down. This isn't just Clearwater Beach in the area north and south of Pier 60. This is all the rest of it. And you got people out there now with lounge chairs. You got people out there with coolers. And it's impossible for us to differentiate between the private area and the public area. So if you say it's only for exercise, then how do I know who is in the private area with their chairs? Who's in the private area with their coolers? Who's out there running? and do it they got you know all the things they do out there on the beach it, it differentiating that is it's it, we will not be able to tell it, it, it that just doesn't work Mr. Welch? i still think the signal that we send is important and the sheriff had some of the same uh, concerns when we initially closed down the beaches so i think the signal you send is important i think exercise only again gives us a way to ramp up the opening of the beaches uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, and that, and that was, I mean, again, I'm not trying to complicate things at all, but I mean, this is a complicated issue uh, to discuss. I think in a lot of people's mind, it's pretty clear what they feel, but that's why I had, I had raised the question about, you know, you know, keeping them open during the week and, and, and just doing for exercise only on the weekend, at least for, you know, the first couple of weekends. I just think it gives everybody a chance to 
you know, again, we're not talking about the residents here. We're talking about the, 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 the business community and the government groups that are going to be monitoring and making sure that they have cleansing equipment, that they have all the things that, that, that we're asking for, uh, that the city of Clearwater for one had said they were going to have. So I just think, you know, again, I would be open to the discussion of, of just, you know, opening the beaches during the week and on, and, 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 and exercise only on the weekends. But, um, I mean, I, I do think there was a couple of comments that were made that were pretty compelling and the people that called in about, you know, we've got to get moving forward and learning how, how this new normal is going to be. So I think some of that phasing uh, would incorporate that. So all I've said was, is that um, I'm willing to consider that option or, or just opening the beaches um, uh, starting Monday. Mr. Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think what's um, uh, frustrating for so many of us is that there's not a widespread knowledge, even among us, about what's public and what's private. And I think, uh, you know, kind of logically, you think we should ramp it up. We should do something on Monday and then something on Wednesday and something on Friday. But I think the way that information is flying around so fast that it, it's going to be nearly impossible to clearly uh, share that information with the public. So if we're going to do it, we should do it and not piecemeal and not partly. I just feel like so many of our residents didn't know our parks were open. That's one of the number one emails I get is open the parks and beaches. They didn't realize the parks were still open. So if we're going to do it and I feel much more comfortable doing it Monday than I would have Thursday to get through that weekend when I think you'll see a ramp up this weekend of folks who are going to take advantage of the coming day. So um, when we close the beach, we were told that it was gonna be nearly impossible to enforce because of the public private issue. But the message it sent was that spring break is over, the party is over, um, the administrator, our department of health representative, the sheriff has said that this is the way to go, that they can enforce it. Um, at this point, that's where I'm gonna trust and I would support the motion to open it on Monday. Same here, anybody else? Madam Chair, just for the record, we did have another hand go up from the public. I'm not sure whether you wanted to entertain any more public comment. No, I think we've, it's a little late now that we've stopped. Okay. Okay. Um, any other board members? Well, let's pull the board then to open the beaches on Monday morning at seven as written in the uh, recommendation from staff. Commissioner Justice. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Welch. No. Commissioner Long. Yes, <laughs> yes, just, sorry. Uh, uh, Commissioner Seal. Yes. Commissioner Eggers. Yes. Commissioner Peters. Yes. And yes for me. Uh, motion carries 6-1. Okay, can we um, talk a little bit about playgrounds at daycare centers? Um, I, I would like to see them open just because it makes it a lot easier for them to do their ratios. Uh, Commissioner Seal? I make a motion to open up the playgrounds at daycare centers, um, given all the appropriate um, social distancing guidelines and no more than 10 children at one time um, and disinfection after each um, year. Thank you. I would second that. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, Madam mm -hmm. Chair, can I just ask would we want this to take effect immediately or to include a date and time? I, Mr. Seal? Uh, you, you just muted yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, I would say let's start on Thursday, um, same time as the pools, so it doesn't become too confusing. I don't, I hate having all these different dates out there. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peters, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Not all in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 
Aye. Um, Aye. Are there any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Um, we have another couple of big issues to talk about. Do we want to take a little break? It's 123. Can, we... can, can I remind you as well, we do still need to take action on just extend the local state of emergency. All uh, right. Okay. Um, okay. Can, can I ask a question on that, on that point? Um, I'm assuming that Barry is going to be, um, uh, we're going to have another meeting this week. Can we take up this action to extend uh, that order on Thursday or Friday, whenever we have the next meeting? That's, uh, again, I, we're kind of kind of wait on what the governor has to say, but I'd sure like to. You can. Um, that that we you do have another meeting scheduled for Thursday, especially now that we that we hear the governor is going to make an announcement tomorrow. Um, if we keep that meeting, you can certainly take up that motion then, because our current order doesn't expire until Friday. Okay. Great. Okay. And if that was a motion, I would like to second it. Uh, the oh. governor is going to make an announcement tomorrow. We'll have more clarity tomorrow. So I would like oh. to, if that was a motion to second it. If That's not, I'd make a motion. You all need to take any action to just simply not do it. Yeah. It doesn't, I, can the administrator is correct? It doesn't expire until Friday. So if the will of the board is to just not take action, I don't think you need a motion to, to, to basically do nothing. Okay. So we'll revisit that on Thursday. All right. Do we want to take a break? I do. Yeah. yeah. Can we take a 20-minute uh, break to 1.45? Thank you. Good. All right.
sure draw you're muted. There you go. I'm ready to get going. Are we live? We're alive. Okay. Mr. Burton, do you want to talk about this um, next item, Pinellas Cares Financial Assistance Program? Yes. Um, so item number two and three uh, is with regard to the funding we received from the federal government from the coronavirus disease, um, the coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security or CARES Act. We received $170 million uh, under that program. One of the biggest concerns, you know, that uh, as a staff and we brought to you on the 16th is that we try to use this uh, fund, this funding to get it into people's hands most in need quickly. Um, in designing any program, the key is having a structure in place to be able to process and uh, distribute funds in a manner to where we can both certify the need and also account for the expenditure. We have an existing program in place um, for adult family assistance that under, for this piece of the program, which would provide individual assistance up to 200% um, at or below the federal poverty guidelines, up to $4,000 um, of one-time funding to be able to assist with bills that are um, they've fallen behind on. Let me, let me clarify one piece on both of these programs. The amount of funding we received is to help pro provide a bridge. We, there's not enough funding to um, talk about loss of income and things like that, that, I, that we've had many um, businesses and others you know, request assistance on. So we're taking this, we're, we're asking that we take this in two pieces. One, we get this money out quickly into the hands as we've outlined by the programs and we're gonna have two presentations, one on the individual assistance and one on the business assistance. And then second, look at the funding available from that and then have a more thoughtful approach in terms of the amount of funding left and the ways in which we could use those funds to offset the impact from coronavirus, both the municipalities, nonprofits. Um, there's a big question about home-based businesses. Um, and so we, we can have a more thoughtful approach then. We have a, but we wanted to get the money out quickly. And so um, under this first program, and I would ask for Daisy Rodriguez um, to provide a PowerPoint presentation and show outline the structure of the program, its intent. Uh, I'll have a few closing comments uh, once she completes her presentation. Thanks. Daisy? Maybe I'm giving the <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry. Are there you go. Are you able to hear me okay now? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Burton, and thank you to the commissioners for the opportunity to present this. Um, so we're we're going to talk about the Pinellas Care Financial Assistance Program. As uh, Barry indicated, this would be an expansion of what we already have in our Adult Emergency Financial Assistance Program. So if you could go ahead. So just a brief overview, you know, we know that we got the coronavirus, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in March, there was a national state of emergency. Pinellas County issued the declaration of local state in March, uh, March 13th. The CARES Act came into effect by Congress and you all asked that we design an expanded assistance program for individual and families that were directly impacted by the loss of income due to COVID-19 public health emergency. And so Pinellas County seeks to implement the Pinellas Care Financial Assistance Program to help stabilize low income individuals and families impacted by the loss of income due to COVID-19 public health emergency. It would be an expansion of our current financial assistance process, which is the AFAP, with expanded eligibility due to COVID-19 and is designed to provide assistance to those residents who are struggling financially. The program leverages existing assistance infrastructure designed by Human Services in partnership with 211 Tampa Bay Cares to provide one-time CARES Act assistance for affected residents to help bridge financial gaps uh, for overdue rent, mortgage payments, and utilities. 
The eligibility criteria remain similar. So you would need to be a US citizen, permanent or legal permanent resident. You must provide documentation that you are a Pinellas County resident. The income level would be at or below 200% of the poverty level. So an example of that would be a household of one. Uh, the 200% poverty level is 25,520. And then as the household increases by a person, that amount increases by just under $9,000. So a family of two then, or a household of two would be 34,480. And we're also indicating that they would have to have liquid assets must be equal to or less than $4,000. So cash, checking account, savings account would need to be less than $4,000. It would be a one-time assistance for $4,000. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, thank you. Um, the applicants must demonstrate that this is uh, as a direct result of COVID-19. So they would need to show verification that it was they were laid off or they received a furlough notice, that they have uh, proof of a reduction in hours. Uh, and it looks like I put that down twice. So we'll move on to the next one. The process is for those who can ac access technology, we would highly recommend using the texting feature which is text to 898-211 COVID CARES. It provides criteria information. It provides a quick triage. So you answer a couple of questions and it'll tell you whether you're eligible or you're gonna move on to the next screen. And if the answer to that is yes, it will prompt you with corresponding step-by-step -step details for submitting the required documents to a designated email address. Or if the um, resident so chooses not to, doesn't have the technology or doesn't feel comfortable using the technology, they can always call 211. The staff will gather the eligibility information to assist with the preliminary screening and help facilitate the documentation process. Once all the documents have been received, the case is reviewed, approved or denied and the resident is contacted. When financial assistance has been indicated that they are eligible, the financial assistance is paid directly to the landlord, mortgage holder, and or utility company. And the funds will be coordinated as a separate assistance pool related to COVID for tracking and reporting purposes. So they will be able to see all of the expenditures directly related to COVID. We have shored up and trained up human services staff and community development staff. They've been working with 211 since last week on Monday on training and processing and reviewing documents to help facilitate what we anticipate will be an influx of calls. And we're also talking with Mickey Thompson, of um, the CEO of 211 Tampa Bay Cares, to look at you know what's our what's our opportunity to ramp up and how will we do that? Should we need to do that uh, very quickly? And the financial assistance will commence upon direction and approval by the county commission and, and will continue through June 1st of 2020, giving us a 30 day period to kind of assess and see where we are. And with some of the um, national conversation about reopening, I, you know, we just don't know where that is, but it'll give us an opportunity to see, to see where we are. And that's all I have. Commissioners, we also have marketing material and stuff prepared. So um, again, with your approval, we would um, make this um, the details of this program available and uh, push that out to where residents know how to access that. Um, different from the next item, which is gonna be on the business assistance. A lot of people have said, you know, what about taking on some of these other areas? With the individual assistance, we don't know how many people are gonna become eligible. Um, I know how many businesses I know how many businesses fall under a certain category, so I can predict and have a, um, a, um, an idea of the amount, the maximum amount of funds uh, outlay under this program. That's the reason we want to go through a June 1 deadline. We'll establish that. We'll establish the number of people eligible and the financial impact um, over the funding available. And while we're taking a, a second look at potentially a second round later this, um, this summer um, uh, on the remaining funds. And so that's the way we've kind of approached this based upon uh, the timeline and the need to move expeditiously on this program to provide assistance to people now. Commissioner Justice, was that a hand? Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Welch. Thank you. So uh, Daisy, the text number you said was 211 COVID CARES? It's 898 211 and you would text that, you would text COVID CARES 
to that number. So the number is 898-211 and you, the text you put in is COVID care. That's correct. And once you put that in, it starts to prompt, it asks you questions and starts to prompt you based on your responses to the next screen, all the way up to the point where it indicates where you submit your documentation. Okay. And when do we expect, if we approve this today, when will 211 start accepting and processing these requests? Tomorrow. And when will, tomorrow? Yes, sir. And, and the payments will be directly to the vendors, the utility companies or what have you, how will that work? That's correct. So generally, if it's to the utility company, once everything has been verified, they get they get paid right away through uh, by the use of a credit card. If it is um, to a landlord, then we have to two one one has to request a W nine as soon as that is um, received by um, submitted by the landlord and received, then they will go ahead and cut a check. And, and Mickey has indicated that takes about twenty four to forty eight hours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, sure, Angers. Um, yeah, just um, so folks who are listening or, you know, it, there's going to be obviously a very clear indication of, of that what that 200% number equals, depending on the size of your family. So you said 34,000 for a family of two. I would assume that means that 200% uh, would be 68,000 for a family of two. Um, it would no, be. No, no, no I'm sorry. Um, so a household of one. The right. threshold level would be $25,520. And for an example, a household, two person household, the income level would be 34480 So that would be the threat, the income threshold. Oh, I thought it was 200%. I'm sorry. I, where did I read? Yeah, it is 200%. So, so using, the, using the poverty income level guidelines for 2020? Yeah. For a family of two, uh, what is the threshold? The income threshold is thirty-four thousand four hundred and eighty dollars. That's that's a that is the hundred percent of poverty level, right? Um, I, that is the two hundred percent of poverty level. Oh, okay, I've always thought that uh, thirty-four thousand was the the poverty level, hundred percent of poverty level for two. So you're saying that's the hundred, that's two hundred percent of poverty level. That's correct. Thirty-four thousand dollars. Correct. Well, then I guess you know. I guess the the only comment that I would make is that I think there's an awful lot of people from thirty-four thousand um, dollars that we're, we will totally miss. Um, and I'm not, and, and, and they're hurting, everybody's, I mean, again, like prioritization, I get that, but there are a lot of folks that are, you know, single family with three kids or something, and they're out of work, they're making, you know, 45 or $50,000, and they don't, you're saying that they don't qualify under this program in this first phase. Commissioners, we, I mean, just, you're, you're exactly right. We did set a, a threshold of 200% of poverty level. Um, and you know that you you could pick a number. It could be could have been 100 percent. It could have been 300 percent. Obviously, the when you put a program out like this, um, you know we're not. If you notice, we didn't say that we're going to spend X amount of dollars on this program, and then people apply like we've seen other programs. And when the money's out, then the money's out, and the person you know has that last application. We wanted to set a threshold there where we know we could serve everybody that applies within that time period. Um, but again, the, the number, I, I absolutely agree that you could go an amount just above that. And there are families that are hurting, you know, um, just as much as somebody right below. But we, we tried to set that as a reasonable um, threshold. But, you know, that's a, that's, that is subjective. Mr. Peters. So just so I make sure I understand, so a single person like the bartender that called in that was laid off when the governor shut him down, doesn't have a wife, doesn't have children, is he going to be eligible in something like this when he's gone two months and has no way to pay his rent or his utility bills? He would be eligible if he yeah. meets the income criteria and he would have to show documentation that of all the other uh, documentation criteria as well as past due rent and utilities, whatever it is that he's asking us to pay for. So what's, let's say, let's say he had a parent that paid his rent. 
Does that now disqualify him because he couldn't afford to pay his rent and he got somebody else to give him a loan? He would have to, it would have to be a past due bill that's under his name. So anybody that felt bad for him and gave him help or gave him a loan, he now wouldn't be eligible because somebody gave him a loan. Correct. And, and just for clarification on that, because I know that'll be a question about in terms of fairness, um, we're, we yeah. used an existing program, which we, we don't, we're not cutting a check individual. We're cutting a check and paying bills. If we set up a program to where we have to process and then have verification um, and then cut a check back to them, then the delay in setting up that program and the time uh, to actually get money to people would be uh, delayed. And, and so that was that was the thought. We had an existing program where we provide one-time emergency assistance um, to individuals, and we we've, we've expanded that program. That was the design on our approach. Well, I just finished my comment and said I don't think that's fair to every one of these servers that have been put out of work that often are are single, and um, have people that are helping them out to get them through what they need to get through, and you've just eliminated them completely. <laughs> And they've been out of the work the longest. So I'm really surprised and I, I don't support that element at all. I think it's missing a big key component. Okay, so Thank you. anybody else? Oh, I, I did have one other, Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Well. Barry or Daisy, can you just speak to 211's capacity? to handle this load? I know that we talked privately about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll ask Daisy to speak okay. to that. And that was a concern both from a, we, we don't want a system crashing uh, or or the ability to, you know, we wanna make sure we have the ability. So Daisy, please. Sure. Um, and as I've indicated, I've spoken with Mickey. We have, uh, I wanna say probably about 18 people helping to assist uh, with the calls that are coming in and doing the preliminary screening. And then she does have a team that does the reviewing and the approval process. She does have other people that can jump in to help with that process as well. And uh, as I've indicated, we are looking at what's the next step, how do we shore that up and how do we continue to expand that? So that's an ongoing conversation that she and I have been having. Thank you. We are clearly anticipating that, you know, we're gonna see some high volume. So we wanna be prepared for that. Okay, thank you. Daisy, I've got a, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another one? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, so people will have to have documentation that they've been laid off or their job was disappeared. Um, and then they'll, they'll have to have a late bill of some kind. Uh, what if, as is the case with many people, they've applied for unemployment, they have no idea whether they're going to get it or whether it's going to get kicked out and they'll have to start over tomorrow. Um, does that have anything to do with anything? Yeah, at, at the time that they're applying, if they have zero income, then they would qualify. Okay. All right, great. Even even if they've had their hours reduced, a lot of restaurants there rotate right. people in and things like that. So there, there's been a provision made for reduced hours. Commissioner Peters? But not if they had somebody pay their rent for them. They haven't gotten unemployment. They've been furloughed. Well, we wouldn't be- But if somebody paid the rent for them, they're not eligible. Well, we wouldn't be paying, if somebody paid the rent, then they we would not be paying their rent. But they have 30 days to apply. So certainly, you know, they could, if, if they applied, you know, not for May 1st, but for the June 1st, they could certainly apply. And, and you're confident that if they don't pay the rent, they're gonna get, there's gonna be money left for them to do that just because somebody helped them out. I, 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 okay. Well, I think those people are more fortunate than people who don't have anybody that can help them out. So, uh, Commissioner Eckers. Um, yeah, again, and, you know, probably focused a lot of my energies um, on the previous conversation. <laughs> yeah. up to the the day, so so I'm 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 just I'm just wanting to make sure again that when we walk away from here that I'm totally clear. I'm already getting a couple of emails that are just very upset, um, and um, because they've they've heard about this financial assistance for folks who had trouble with um, you know making making payments, um, and there are a lot of them. Whether they are 
folks in our in our uh, beautician world that we that we shut down, or uh, as as it was said about the the bartenders and and, and and folks that work at restaurants and all of those folks, for the most part, this just this pretty much flies right over them. So um, again, I think it's all about messaging. Um, we're we're going to go through a system that we we have a, a handle on the monies that are available for that. Uh, um, I would say that um, we probably need to be looking at that next level like now, because there are just too many people out there who haven't gotten any help at all and are going to are counting on this, are, are counting in their minds that there's going to be some help from their local government. So I appreciate the, 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 the you know, plugging in quickly on the, the folks that need it. The, perhaps I'm not even going to say they need it the most. I'm just going to say they need it a lot too. But there's some other families who are struggling big time. So, um, so I don't know if we got a we got a set number of dollars right now for this program. I think we need to be looking already um, at, at that at that next level. So thank you. Yes, Daisy. Yeah, if I could just clarify a little bit. So if they if they've lost employment, they would have zero dollars, right? So they would qualify for the program. So. It, so these people that have had their businesses closed yeah. and they have no income, correct? they are eligible re without regard to the income levels. So at the time that they're making the request, they have no income or their hours have been reduced. They meet, if their hours are reduced and they still fit within the 200% poverty level, then they would qualify. If they have no income, they would qualify. Okay, so the 200% or these, these guidelines that you're talking about uh, aren't necessarily an annualized guideline. It's really where they are today. Correct. So I'm if, they've if, lost their, if they've lost their job and have, are not making any income, though they, they clearly in their job that they lost make more than the, the minimum, they're Correct. still eligible. Correct. Yes, okay. Sir. okay, thank you for that clarification. That's, I think that helps a little bit. Uh, Daisy, Daisy, I'm sorry, this is Don, and I, I hate to interject, but uh, I had a question on that because I've been looking at some of this program as we've been coming along. Is there also, there's a an asset threshold too, though, right? If they have assets, liquid assets, they also don't uh, qualify. Is that correct? We capped it at $4,000. So if they have liquid assets beyond $4,000, they would not qualify. So, so that's the other thing that I just wanted to be clear on is I believe there's some other requirements other than just not having income. So, and liquid assets are bank accounts, cash, stocks and bonds, cash, not your car, not your house. Correct. That's, cor that's correct. Right. And again, this is not meant to replace unemployment. It's not meant to replace uh, lost income and things like that. It's, it's emergency assistance. Um, and so they're, that you don't have money in the bank to be able to play the mortgage. Um, and so we're trying to trying to set the parameters around the emergency assistance. Larger conversation and certainly requires additional stimulus dollars um, when we get into or trying to help people uh, over an, an extended period of time because of the overall uh, lost wages. So this is up to $4,000. That's correct. Uh, for uh, specific uh, bills that have not been paid. So you didn't pay your uh, your mortgage, you didn't pay your uh, rent, you didn't pay your electric, up to $4,000 one time that you'll be relieved of those past due debts. That's correct. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, I appreciate the clarification on Commissioner Eggers uh, question. Um, Cause I had the same question in my mind, I was looking at it differently. Um, but we're doing um, rent or mortgage and utility bills. How do we feel we're doing with food assistance, which is not part of this, right? So it's we, not we, part of that, um, and and that's a that's a that's a much bigger issue. Obviously, we've got the, um, the the food security group that's been working and you know pushing out different programs through Feed Tampa Bay and others. Um, you know, and so they, they've been expanding those uh, those efforts out, um, but that doesn't cover direct financial assistance to individuals under this program. Now, depending upon the outcome of the funding of this program, um, there may be, you know, a available for us to be able to have a phase two to this, 
Um, but even under this, like I said, um, it's very hard to, you know, when you have so many people that have been impacted by this to know how many people are going to qualify. So $4,000 times, you know, get you to, it's very easy to, you know, creep upwards of, you know, $7,500 million. And so um, that's, that's the reason for trying to break this down into two parts. I was asking more of just a gauge of how we're doing as a community with all the efforts, you know, farm share, yeah, in Tampa Bay, do we feel like there's enough out there for folks? Well, so, da Daisy's on the, the food group, and I, you know, I'd ask her or Lourdes to, uh, to pipe in. I mean, there's, there's a, I, I will tell you that is a, a bright spot. Um, and I, I, I think if you're the one not, not receiving, you know, food or something that, that you wouldn't say that, but there has been a tremendous effort by so many community groups, um, really stepping up and finding ways of helping individuals, um, you know, Feed Tampa Bay has, has more than doubled the amount of food that they're moving. And um, so there's been a tremendous effort, but I'll let Daisy and Lourdes uh, pipe in more directly since they've been working on that, on yeah. that group. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I've been working with the food group. So there is a, a myriad of, of networks and services provided, uh, pri providers working together. There are food pantries and mobile food pantries and grab and goes throughout the county. Also, two one one will help to navigate navigate people to those uh, to those locations for food resources. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave. And this is Lourdes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, so also, those who've received SNAP have been provided more SNAPs without having to recertify or apply again. Um, that's the what we know as the food stamp program. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chris or Seal. Uh, yes, I know I can miss this, but what is the maximum dollar amount we're allocating to this program? I know we're doing it for one month. We, we do not have a cap on the program. Um, that's the nervous piece. Um, I could, we could have said 75 million, 100 million. Um, we feel, we do believe that it's, we have sufficient funds within the 170 million that we received. Uh, we know the, uh, the, the next piece is about 35 million. Um, right. And because I know how many businesses, I don't know how many families will qualify under this. So it's very hard to get an accurate projection. We feel comfortable with the program. Um, otherwise I wouldn't bring it to you, but I didn't want to say 75 million. And then the person that comes in right after the person that got the last dollar, you know, and needs assistance that, that we had to deny the application. Um, so that's, that's the way we structured it. But I mean, technically, if we're putting 35 million towards the business community business program, then this would be, say, 135 million. I mean, in other words, if something if it really went out the window, then what are we going to do? Then, then I'm going to be coming back to you and talking to you about it because, um, and we're going to monitor this. And we're going to monitor the expenditures on it. Um, but frankly, I don't want to turn anybody away, and and so I think we need to we need to figure that out. <laughs> um, that's a you know, there not too many times will you ever see me come into a program without being able to manage the uh, size of the ask. Um, and, and this is one of those exceptions where I, I just feel for those that need a little hand, a uh, little help um, over this in, little this period of time that we'll figure that out. I feel comfortable, and so does Bill Berger, that we'll be within the parameters of the program and the overall funding, but. Um, but we hadn't, we, we didn't set an artificial cap because of um, wanting to make sure that everybody that's eligible was able to receive that assistance. Well, I do think it's a very well structured program. Thank you to Daisy and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? A quick question. Yes. Um, I got something uh, from a resident that wrote, you know, call, called in or wrote in or whatever, said, um, uh, there's a pandemic unemployment assistance uh, work location. Is that is this part of that? Is that is it with this yeah. pandemic unemployment assistance program uh, for folks that are self-employed? No, not the answer. No. So, uh, nothing to do with that. I think that's a federal thing. This, this yeah, I, I, Daisy, do you are you aware, or Lourdes? I'm I'm not aware. No, okay. that, that is not this, but I know Mike Mydell um, has up-to-date information because we have calls on it. 
um, okay. and um, he may have more on that if it's yeah, a new it might program. be more yeah it might be more applicable in the next conversation but um, so so we're really so we're, again we're going to roll this out and see after 30 days where we are um, and then and then revisit the possibility of of expanding it to a different it, depending on the fund availability ex expanding that uh, a little further because i'm telling you right now there are people out there who you, you made the comment about assets and um, they have money tied up and they may have a retirement income it's tied up they're not and maybe everything else is you know zero um and accessing that may not be quite as simple as as, as you think so i mean i just and again i'm not saying it's a lot of money um but i think for some people out there this is a this is a this is a big deal to help get them get them over so i just i like the idea i mean this is great i just think it you know they, they I think we're missing a whole lot of folks. Um, oh, we, we do, and, and the and the question is how much money is available. You know, we if you'll notice, and as you are, you know, we we have obviously had financial impact to the Pinellas County government. We're not taking one penny out of this. This is all going to individuals and businesses that have been impacted by this. And so we're trying to to, to do this first round look at that. Uh, there's been a question about equity and uh, fairness in the program. I think those are all valid topics we can look at as you can see this is going to those most in need you know this is people that don't have four thousand dollars in the bank of li liquid assets and they got a mortgage due and they got a car payment due um yeah. you know have their hours cut you know and so they're working curbside so yeah we understand this is not the art of perfect um this is this is the art of, of taking an existing program and expanding it to where we can move quickly but i and do think oh, go, i'm sorry okay I'm, I'm sorry, if I may, I just wanted to respond. This is Lourdes to um, Commissioner Eggers. Um, a retirement yeah. account would not be included in this, okay? So it's checking, savings, and cash, any liquid assets. Okay, okay, all right. Um, okay, thank you. And I think this goes along with our strategic goal to help those that need it most. I mean, there are a lot of people that need a lot right now. And a lot of people that have zero income, but there are also people that struggled even before this happened. So um, I'm glad we're able to do something. Um, oh, yeah, I read that email about the pandemic unemployment assistance. It's being administered through the local workforce board or career source. Oh, okay. So it's a state money. Uh, Commissioner Seal? No. Commissioner Welch? No. <laughs> Okay, if anybody wanted to talk, I missed you. Okay. Um, do we have any people? I, have one, I did have one, one other question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll ask it later. I'm, I'm good right now. Okay. Do we have any people that would like to speak to this issue? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on this item, please just star nine on your phone or raise your hand virtually in the zoom meeting and madam chair it does appear that we have one uh person on the phone that wishes to speak uh okay. la last four digits seven two two five if you can give us your first name your last name spelling address and then you'll have three minutes to address the board um hi my name is lisa anir i'm at n-e-r um i-e-m and um you know what? I can't believe everything I just heard. I just had someone from your care center just call me too, because they know this whole thing you're talking about right now is important. And what's upsetting me the most, and I'm the one who just sent you the urgent email. My family needs help. And I, what I want to know right now is this, whoever that person is representing 211, I already tried to get that help last week. And I called Darlene, Commissioner Welch's assistant, and I talked, I just talked to our state senators and congressmen, and here's the bottom line is this. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be emotional, but we're furloughed. And, and, and the girl that just called me from the Citizen Center says that she's, now I don't know if this is true, but she's saying it's based on your salary when you apply. I don't think that's true, because when I applied for the, bay, for, for the 211 help last week, I was denied. I actually was getting accepted based on our, which had nothing to do with it. They didn't even ask income. They were going to help us with rent. They were going to help us with electric. 
But as soon as they found out that we did not have a minor and that we were, we lost our position because of COVID or not lost it, but on furlough and we did have a return date, we were denied. So now you've created a COVID plan and now they've set income limitations and they've set liquid asset limitations. So I guess I have to sell my car. That's crazy. That is so crazy. What are we supposed to do? That's, I mean, we, 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 we have a home we're leasing in Safety Harbor. She's already threatened us. We're already out the door. The only thing that's possibly even staying this right now is the, what is, I think the governor signed the emergency order for uh, the stay, the writ, to stay the writs or whatever. I can't think what you call it right now. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be upset, but. I, I'm just listening to her say all this stuff, but yet why was it different last week where you didn't have all these requirements and you were ready to help me, but it was COVID. Now that it is COVID, you've lowered everything and you put all these restrictions on people that need help. I, that's all I have to say. I am more than happy to document everything that's been said and how it's been done. And that's all I have to say right now, but I just don't like this being misled. I feel like you let them who create this thing for us, for the Pinellas County, and I just don't think they're. I just don't think they're representing us at all very well. She, I mean, we're back again. We're in the middle. We're middle people. We never get qualified for anything, and right now we need help. And I'm just so upset about this whole thing, the fact that you guys are actually going to do this. And now what are we going to do? I mean, yes, maybe we'll, back, we'll go back to, I'm sorry, I know, my time's probably up. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be emotional about this whole thing. But, okay, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for your time. Yeah, keep listening because we have, may have some information for you. And Commissioner Gerard, do you want me to, um, I just want to make sure, first of all, we have the um, young lady's phone number, um, so right. Daisy can give her a call back, and right. it's the act, actually the opposite of um, what was just said, so I just want to clear, clarify for anyone else who is listening, we have an, an adult emergency financial assistance program, we have made the restrictions less stringent um, with this new COVID funding, so it's, it's, it's the opposite of what was said, so I Hope that we can give her a call back and give her some good news because I, I think there was some miscommunication. Okay, just for anyone else listening, it, it's it's uh, it, we have more help available than we did last week. Thanks. Or if I have a couple of questions, um, so up till now, Human Services has been administering the um, assistance for individuals, right? Right. And so Jane now has a program for for families. Right, which is so why she was one, denied if she called 211. No, because they could have given her AFAP. So it well, sounds like okay. something went wrong there. Um, well, and there's okay, less so, requirements now. Well, let's make sure she also knows that this hasn't, we haven't voted on this yet. Right. So they don't have this money yet. <laughs> right. Um, but can we make sure that the 211 staff is very well trained about what the guidelines are on this? Because that won't be the last time we heard that if if they're not right because it is different and there's just a couple of 211 staff it's mostly our human services and community okay, development good. staff that are going to be doing this i love 211 but this is a whole different program so yeah it is a new program and everyone's been trained on it last week okay well let's getting let's ready give them sheets too okay uh commissioner eggers well, I, I really appreciate that lady calling in because I know we all know what's going on out there, but, you know, sometimes just to even hear it like that, it kind of puts a, a, a strong reality a, a twist or bent to everything. And I, you know, I know it wasn't easy for her to call in, uh, but certainly appreciate that. And hopefully we can work with her and, and help her out. But uh, Barry, I think it gets to the issue of when this first came out last week, we were talking a little bit about this first phase for individuals and this first phase for businesses. And then we had some governments, uh, age, government agencies calling in and saying, well, is there a phase in here that the monies are gonna get to the governments? And I would argue that well, there's not gonna be any money of this $170 million available for, for local government. So, I, I mean, I, I, to me, you could hear it that there are people that are hurting in four thousand dollars or up to four thousand dollars for a month's rent or electric. It's all that matters. 
And so I suspect that the second phase, if we get through this first phase and with the estimated dollars and maybe a little bit more, that we need to be looking at that next group of folks. And uh, that the, the, it did help a little bit when you talked about the liquid assets, but I suspect that that's even gonna knock some people out. Um, and um, so anyway, I mean, having $4,000 in the bank doesn't give a lot of you know, comfort to anybody. Now it's better than having $2,000 in the bank. So I get that priority, but there are some people that are just hurting and you heard it in that lady. So I hopefully we'll look at that second phase going forward, even if we're not ready to fund it so that we're ready to move into that second phase quickly. Thank you. All right. Madam Chair, we do have one other speaker, member of the public that wishes to be heard. Okay, great. Uh, last four digits, 2946. Uh, if you give us your first name, your last name, uh, spelling, address, and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, this is Maria Gotsis, G-O-T-S-I-S, -S, and I'm in Pinellas County, Palm Harbor. Sorry about that. Um, you know, it, it's disheartening because it is the middle class that I think is hurting in all of this. And sometimes we hurt because we don't get that extra. I'm a hairdresser. Um, I've spoken to all of you before. I'm the one that stood in front of you about um, the the one on one salon. And I'm hoping that once the governor, um, you know, slacks up on us that we do get back to work. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't make less than 25,000. I made 32,000 last year and am struggling to make mortgages, my mortgage payment, um, struggling to make all kinds of payments. And I'm underneath this new, you know, CARE COVID Act that you guys are going to um, vote on. Obviously, I'm not going to get any relief. Haven't, I was, um, rejected for unemployment because of I don't have a computer at home. I did something online with the mobile phone app and they rejected me because everything came up zeros. I haven't received federal aid yet. We're at the end of April. It's um, I've had to go to some people's homes to do hair and to put food on my plate, whether that's legal of me or not. I had to, I had to do it, you know? Um, where do we fall? And I know there's other, I've spoken to other people in my industry and it's, it's, um, it's really sad. You guys, <laughs> uh, I, this is un unbelievable where we are with this. I, I just, um, you know, I'm glad we're opening the beaches. I'm glad we're opening the pools, but I need to pay my bills. I need a car to drive. Um, I don't know how I'm going to pay my car payment. Um, I'm grateful that some of my customers who still have jobs are paying me for their, they're, they're actually, you know, PayPaling me and Venmoing money for hair that I haven't cut their hair and they're paying me for their hair ahead of time. But then when they come in next time to get their hair done, you know, then what? Um, so it's very difficult out here, you guys. And I appreciate all you do. Um, that's all I got. I don't know what to do. Thank you. Well, keep listening. Um, Lourdes, again. Yep. Is there a way that we can, obviously the thing about the $25,000 or $34,000 annual income is really confusing people. Is there a way to restate it so that if, yes, you, I, if, if you've had zero income for the last two weeks, you qualify. Yes, if, if you, you have an, an overdue and, bill. And that's exactly right for the young lady who just called in. Um, it, it sounds like she would qualify too. I don't know the whole situation. But I was just um, talking with Barbara and marketing communications. We need to make sure and um, get that information so people understand it because there does seem to be some confusion. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you made last year. It doesn't matter what you made two weeks ago. Um, it's if you have zero income currently or under that level currently right, because you lost really your job. Important. I don't want to see people excluding themselves before they get a chance. Uh, Commissioner Peters. So she got Venmo payments so that she could pay her bills, but you're telling this, I'm going to stay on the same subject because I think we, we're doing this wrong. So she got Venmos and people to give her money so she could pay her bills and not 
default on her bills. And, and, and so I'm not sure based on our conversation earlier, if she's eligible, because you just told me if somebody helps somebody pay them rent, however, they got the money to help them pay them rent, they weren't eligible. So I'm really concerned that we just haven't, we haven't looked at this the right way. And just because people were able to get some help doesn't mean that they aren't struggling and the people that helped them aren't struggling. So I, I just, I worry for even her since she said people have been paying her in advance so she could pay her bills, that she won't qualify. I know, um, I know Lourdes is saying maybe she would, but based on our earlier conversation, I'm getting the impression she won't and many servers and many bartenders and many hair salons and dog groomers um, that are the independent employees are because somebody helped them, they're not going to get the help they really, truly, truly need. So I'm not sure that this plan is ready yet. I, I'm really, I don't, I'm not clear on it and I just don't know that it's ready yet. Well, I think the people in the community are ready for it. Um, we just need to make it very clear what we're covering and what we're not. Um, do we have anybody else on the phone? Madam Chair, we, we have one more speaker on the line. Uh, okay. This is Mr. Eric Seidel. Um, oh. Eric, if you can give us your name, address, and uh, you'll have three minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. My name's Eric Seidel. Hello, Mr. Mayor. I am fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Hey, thank you all. First off, for all the hard work that you're doing. I, I have to tell you, as a, as a local mayor, and I think this is echoed from everyone throughout the county, uh, the, the amount of support and leadership from uh, our elected officials, uh, our county administrator and the sheriff and uh, Dr. Cho have been um, outstanding, to say the least. Uh, so thank you for that. God bless you all for that. Um, I, I just wanted to make comment. You know, and you clarified it very well. The, the income requirement doesn't matter if you just lost your job. It means you have no income. So I think that was a little bit of confusing. The only thing that you may want to entertain a little bit, I know that the, the county administrator has, I'm sure, vetted this well. But so if, if one person's laid off and one is not, it's a family, a household of two they're still going to have the significant problems. And so I realize that it becomes difficult to address everything in one swoop, but it might be worth entertaining uh, uh, a higher multiple um, on the baseline so that it captures more of those individuals who fall into that category. Uh, I realize that's easier said than done. Uh, the $4,000 liquidity, uh, you know, the average person in Pinellas County makes almost 46000 a year. You would assume they're going to have some money saved. I, I don't know that. I, I realize the intention is to try to get those highest at risk. Uh, but by the same token, um, you know, I think it's also to try to keep people above water to come out of this faster. And so uh, I would just ask that and maybe that's something you think about, maybe doesn't work for this round. Uh, maybe it's the next round. Uh, maybe that next round comes sooner uh, than later. But uh, I just thought I would share. We're, like all of you, we're getting lots of calls from people who seem to be falling into this horrible spot with unemployment and the technical problems that they're having. I know that you guys have got to be getting a lot of calls. We are. Uh, and you guys, uh, the county right now is kind of saving grace in, in, in their hope. And so um, not fair to put it on, on you when we have a system that's supposed to be taking care of it, uh, but it apparently is, is falling that way. So in any event, I, I thought I would share that. Uh, once again, thank you for all you're doing. That's all. Thank you. So given that, I would like to see us pass this today and maybe be talking about, you know, let's look at it on a week by week basis and see how how much the demand is at the level that we've set, which is poverty, you know, 200% of poverty. Um, and let's just see if there's a, if we need to phase in a higher limit as we go. Mr. Walsh? I mean, I think we have plenty of people that will qualify for this, but. Yeah, I'd move approval if you're ready for a motion. I am. Yes, is that a second? That's a okay. Other comments? No other public comment, Madam Speaker. Oh, good. <laughs> no offense, public. Um, all right, we have a motion 
question from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Steele. <laughs> uh, all in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 It appears to be unanimous. Opposed? No? Okay. Next issue, assistance to businesses. Commissioners, uh, the next uh, part of this program was to provide uh, care funding to small uh, as a small business grant uh, program. Again, we've designed this as a one-time um, payment uh, for eligible small businesses. This is not intended or it, and the funding is insufficient to cover loss of income and many of those things, but designed as a bridge to get them to other programs, state or federal programs that many have had a, a real difficult time accessing. So um, Mike turned it over to Mike Mydell, who's worked with uh, a team to design this phase of the program and uh, let him cover that for you. Mike, you're muted. Good afternoon, commissioners. Mike Mydell, I'm the Economic Development Director for Pinellas County. We have set aside $35 million out of that $170 million from the COVID aid, um, relief and economic security fund. This would be utilized to help offset that significant temporary loss of revenue to those qualified businesses during the pandemic and to assist businesses in retaining and, and paying their employees and in continuing their supply chain, paying their vendors, keeping the, uh, those business transactions going during this difficult time. The uh, purpose of the program right now, a description of the program, each, each eligible business would get a $5,000 grant and this is not a loan, it would not have to be repaid. And the idea of the program is that this, this money would help to qualify uh, these qualifying businesses to cover expenses such as employee wages, pay the bills to their vendors and uh, pay their rent or, or business mortgage. And it's specifically targeted to help our local brick and mortar businesses and to cover that immediate financial need. And as our county administrator said, that this is really to help cover over that period until they're able to obtain other financing from the Small Business Administration or the Paycheck Protection Program or other means. And uh, so this is, we wanted to have a substantial um, amount of money that could make a difference, that could be meaningful in um, keeping these businesses running, providing that financial relief, and, and also have a dollar amount that would allow us to reach as many businesses as possible. So that's how we selected that $5,000 amount. We calculate that about 6,500 businesses in Pinellas County, both in the unincorporated area and in the cities, is, uh, would be able to qualify under the guidelines we set out for the program. We would have sufficient funds for every business to receive this $5,000 grant so people aren't under the gun to try to get that application in before everybody else or whatever. You can get your documents together, get your application together, and not have to worry about being too late to the game to, uh, to be able to participate. Um, funds can only be used to reimburse the cost of the business interruption due to the health emergency, not for any other reason, and the cost cannot already have been paid or will be paid by insurance, say continuity insurance or other insurance the uh, business owner owns, and then or by any other federal program. So you can still participate in other federal programs. You can still receive an insurance payment, but we can't allow double dipping. So whatever you use this $5,000 on cannot have been covered by another source. The, the businesses that have already applied for funding for municipal grant programs, several of our cities have already set up money and um, even distributed money to their citizens, to businesses who are located within their city limits. This does not preclude us, you know, those companies from receiving our program as well. And likewise, um, if you apply and receive money from our program, you can still apply for other state and federal programs. And we encourage you to do that. Um, owners, if a, an individual owns more than one business of an eligible business type, 
that they can apply for each eligible legal entity. So each of those businesses has to qualify on its own, meet all of those criteria, but it doesn't matter if we got one owner with multiple businesses. The idea being that each of those businesses has employees, each of them has customers, each of them has suppliers. We want to keep those people in business and keep the money flowing in our local economy. And here, the last bullet on, the, on this particular slide gives you the, uh, the address to find more information about the other state and federal loans that are available. Wanted to let people know that as of 1030 uh, this morning, we do have the Paycheck Protection Program again, actually yesterday morning. So that, uh, that um, process is open again at your local bank and uh, information on how to start that process is available there at bced.org slash COVID-19 loans. Now to be eligible for this grant, businesses have to occupy commercial space in Pinellas County. Now the, the reason for that is that those spaces have rent or um, a mortgage at least. They're paying money to occupy the space. And that, that money also helps contribute to the local economy. It shows that the expenses of that company are higher than those who do not have uh, rent expenses. And uh, so that was one of the initial eligible criteria, at least for this first phase. We also limit it to firms that have between one and 25 full-time equivalent employees, and that includes the owner. So if you're a sole proprietor, you have no employees, you will still qualify for this program. And the 25 full-time equivalent employees allows uh, businesses such as restaurants that may have 50 part-time employees if they have 50 half-time employees, they would still qualify for this program. Basically, you'll add up the full-time hours. I mean, you add up all the full-time and part-time hours for all employees of the business and, and then divide by 40, and you'll know how many full-time equivalent employees you have. Um, so that gives it a wider range than some of the other municipal programs that are out there. We also want to ensure that the business has been operating since at least October 1st. So they were in business for six months prior to, um, in this case, March 1st, uh, February 29th, and that they were still open on the, on the end of February when the, uh, the federal money becomes available for expenses after March 1st. So that's why we chose that date. Um, we just wanted to make sure that someone didn't open up a business after March 1st in order to try to get a $5,000 grant. Um, so it's a way to prevent and fraud more than anything else, and then also making sure that it was a going business concern before the COVID crisis hit. And then we want to make sure that the business is expected to full to return to full operations after the crisis. We're not going to be funding a company that has already chosen to go bankrupt and close their doors permanently. As you can see, commissioners, this is really designed around getting to our small business. Um, and so getting them bridge type assistance. Again, we're not trying to replace income and we understand there's a lot of home-based businesses, but home-based businesses were not required to close. Um, and that's really trying to go to the heart of this is we closed physical business locations. That's a differentiating factor. We may look at that as part of that phase two, but again, wanted to really kind of highlight that as we were going through that program. Exactly. And this slide speaks to that directly. Uh, these are the businesses that were either forced to close by the governor's order, by your order, or were severely limited in their operations by one of those orders. So in the first case, the public food service establishments, restaurants can remain open, but they are limited to only carry out and um, delivery services. And many types of restaurants are unable to do that or unable to make money doing that and are better off closing their doors. So we've seen that there's a, there's a significant impact on our restaurant business. Um, so that's why they are included as an eligible business. Food trucks would also qualify under this as a public food service establishment under Florida Statute 509. So this covers a great swath of our, of our restaurant community. Uh, bars, pubs, and nightclubs were required to close early on by the governor's order, so they are included. They, they cannot have any income at all at this point. Uh, Short-term lodging and vacational rental management 
They've been affected significantly. We've uh, received data from our Convention and Visitors Bureau. During this time of year, usually the occupancy rate in our, in our lodging uh, facilities countywide hovers around 90%. Um, recently, it was as low as 17%. So these are significant cuts, and it's primarily due to the restrictions on travel that the president set in place and that the governor also uh, uh, confirmed. And then also the fact that our beaches are closed, our attractions and museums are closed, and it's significantly hit our lodging industry, and that's why they are included. The fourth bullet, uh, the non-essential businesses under Section 5. This is your safer at home order that you issued before the governor's order made it even more restrictive. But these are, are firms that were required to close and, and as such are getting zero income right now. So that's why we included those. And then also in your safer at home order in Section 2, um, various places of public and private assembly were closed. These are uh, the bowling alleys, the um, museums, uh, amusement halls, um, music venues, you name it. It's, uh, you know, it's actually listed there in that section. So these are why we, we chose to, um, to cover, include those in that area. Basically, any commercial facility that was required to close by the sheriff's deputies or your local police should fit under this category. Ineligible businesses, we, d we are not providing funds to publicly traded companies. Um, this is because basically the shareholders own the company and are not involved in the day-to-day -day business operations. We're trying to get this money to our local business owners, those sole proprietors and partnerships that, uh, that provide a unique um, shopping and, and, and amusement experience for our citizens. And we wanna make sure the money goes to them first. We have not included home-based businesses at this time, and there are several reasons for that. The, the biggest is probably that we, we need to get the money out as quickly as possible to as many folks as we can. We want to be sure that we're providing significant impact, and that's why that $5,000 level. And we want to make sure that it is having an impact both on employees, hopefully, but also on the, on the general economy through the rents and, uh, and mortgages. So a, a non-home-based business that has a physical location has a lot more bills to pay and tends to have more employees than a home-based business would. It's easier to track and to verify the, um, the business location, the uh, income levels, the expenses in a business that has a, uh, a, an actual commercial location than it is in a home-based business. Um, we can definitely look at this going forward, but as, as the county administrator mentioned, home-based businesses were not required to close, and they could conduct conceivably conduct business on an online basis for many of them or in a social distancing uh, basis for others. So uh, in the interest of getting the program up and running and getting the money out to people as quickly as possible, we've excluded home-based businesses at this time. Also excluded nonprofit corporations, and this is uh, the 501c3 charitable organizations that are funded primarily by private donors and by governmental sources. Uh, many of our partners will continue to receive funding from those our governmental sources um, even during this time, and then other um, nonprofits include our uh, lobbying organizations and membership organizations that derive their money from, primarily from their uh, membership dues and uh, or from the payments of uh, folks, you know, the membership of the uh, lobbying organization. So we've chosen to, to not include those at this time. Uh, firms with now, if I just, if I'll just comment on that, Mike. I mean, sure. let's just talk about the nonprofit. Actually, for many of our nonprofits, Oh, they're, they're, they're the lifeline, um, and, and we completely understand that. And so they're, they're, they weren't forced to close. They're just hit harder by people in need in many particular cases. And so here we're trying to keep the doors open on a business and provide this emergency assistance. We will look at this as a second round in terms of funding, but they, they you know, typically their funding sources are continuing. It may be down because they have business uh, donations or something like that, but, you know, but the actual physical structure and the location wasn't forced to close. And that's the reason we, we differentiated that um, and, and quickly, but I, 
absolutely agree. Our nonprofits are working. I was out there this weekend. They're working harder than ever, and and and, and more people are in need. And so they're a vital lifeline. We need to address that, but not just part of this initial program. Exactly. Thank you. The uh, firms with code enforcement liens. Now, these are not people who just have had a, a, a fine placed on them for not mowing their yard or whatever. These are people who have over time consistently ignored code enforcement violations, have actually gone before a magistrate had a lien base placed on their property. So this is only intended to, to be ineligible in the most um, vigorous of circumstances. It's uh, people who have ignored orders on repeated basis and have resulted in legal action. And uh, another legal action is if, if a, a owner or partner in the company is currently serving time or serving a sentence, uh, could include parole and probation for a financial mismanagement crime, some kind of financial crime, they would not be eligible. And this is to prevent uh, further fraud from occurring. Um, but this does not exclude people who have may have misdemeanors or other other crimes not related to, to financial. Right now, we don't want to um, necessarily block someone from money for uh, a past drug crime or something like that, where they're still serving an extended probation. The application process. Um, so the applications at this time are going to be set up to received on a digital online um, portal. It can be done through your home computer, and we also have a mobile version of this, so it can be done through your smartphone. Uh, we are looking forward to working with some of our community partners, such as the Chambers and the Tampa Bay Black Business Investment Corporation and uh, Prospera, the uh, Hispanic um, um, financing organization, Urban League, others that could um, help take applications. We need every application to be put into this online digital portal. We're hoping that those who can't do so using their smartphone or a computer can work with our partner organizations to, uh, to get that data put in online. And then uh, at that point, uh, we, the, the business also has to document the fact that they have a commercial location and the status of the organization, we, we need to know again that they were in business before October 1st and still in business on February 29th. And we need to know the employee count. So we know that it's less than um, 25 or less than or equal to 25 full-time equivalent employees. So we'll have the information, uh, specific uh, reports we're looking for that should be attached to your application and we'll make that information available before the applications are open so everyone will have time to gather their documents and be ready when the application process begins. You need to demonstrate that you have recent business income and expenses. We wanna see um, a tax return or, or other um, profit and loss statement that shows that you did conduct business during that six month period. And then uh, need to digitally sign and attest to the information that it is truthful. We, uh, we're working closely with the inspector general here at the county to uh, avoid fraud. We know there's potential for that. We're working together with the finance department and the clerk's office and with inspector general to, uh, to limit that risk. And part of that is um, everyone agreeing to the fact that they are being truthful in this application and uh, stating the consequences if they're not. So you'll see that on the application form. The entire process, if you've got those documents ready to go, should only take 10 to 15 minutes. We're trying to keep this very short and a very simple application. Timeline, we, uh, from if you approve today, we'll begin immediately with public outreach and education so people know uh, what that application form is going to look like and how they will apply. Um, truthfully, we are still, this is a brand new program, so we are in the process of building the software even now. Uh, we have been doing that for several days, but uh, we need your decisions today on some of the policy questions and in order to complete that application. And that's the reason we've targeted May 4th for the first day to receive applications. And then we would continue to do it through June 1st. And again, I wanna emphasize, we have plenty of money. There is not a hurry to get your application in to be the first in line. Um, there will be funds for everybody who qualifies under this proposed program. 
Um, we have 20 folks uh, identified to help us review these applications, folks from my department and from others around the county, and we are grateful for those who volunteer to be a part of this. We, we have no way really of knowing how long it's going to take because we've never done this before and the software still isn't put together yet. But we believe that with, uh, once the uh, learning curve is over, we can get through about one an hour per person, per reviewer. And uh, that would be a typical application. Some may take longer. It, what we plan to do is a two-tier process where a reviewer will go through a checklist and verify all of those documents. If everything is in order, that initial reviewer can send it right to the clerk's office for, uh, for a draw, for a check to be made. If, it's, if there's any question at all, anything that is out of the ordinary, it gets accelerated to a... Um, a group of uh, lead um, quality control people who are in my office in the Small Business Development Center who will look at those atypical applications and determine whether documents that they've attached can be used as a legitimate substitute for the ones we ask for and so on. And then they can move those on to the clerk. And then anyone who does not qualify for any reason will uh, be notified why they did not qualify. And uh, in fact, the, the portal that we're developing will allow any applicant to go in and check on the status of their application at any time. And, uh, and, and we'll, they'll see online the reason for the denial if that should occur. Um, the clerk's office intends to get the uh, check in the mail within 10 business days of the approval uh, occurring through our staff. So that's all I have at this time. Want to see if there are any questions? Uh, Commissioner Ross. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to thank uh, Barry and his team for getting both these programs, the financial assistance and the small business program up and running so quickly as we know the problems with the unemployment and the PPP that folks are having. So uh, great job on that. A couple of things that came to mind and, and perhaps is we're talking about maybe around two, Barry. Um, I received an email as we were talking from a family daycare home provider uh, who's authorized to provide for essential workers, but they're not commercial space, they're residential. So if we could add that to the list of things that we're looking at. Uh, second thing that came to mind are land, um, lawn services, that they're mobile. Uh, they could have been impacted if folks, you know, eliminate their contracts. So just two examples that come to mind. They weren't shut down, though. I mean, you know, that's um, so that, they, is, that, is that the threshold? They have to be shut yeah, down. I mean, we're, we're trying to get. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to get this. You know, if I cancel my long contract, I cancel my long contract because maybe I didn't have work, but they were able to continue to work. Um, so okay. just on that one, I think we, we really have to kind of. And I'll, I'll look at the other one, you know, so okay. we're going to have to get examples like that and go through that. And I do think that we'll have to kind of take a harder look, you know, as we talk about round two. Okay. Um, uh, two other points, Madam Chair. I um, love what Mike said about working with community partners like the Urban League and others. I think making sure that everyone has a fair shot and that we have an equity lens as we look at this. We received a letter from one community. And I just think that's a real concern as you look what happened nationwide. And I know our program is different, but the whole Ruth Christ and LA Lakers and all those examples, this money needs to get to folks who really need it. So I really appreciate uh, those partnerships that help the money get out to everyone in the community. And the last thing that made me kind of shaky, Mike, mm -hmm. <laughs> given the, the unemployment fiasco with their software system, where are we in developing our system? Is that OTI, Brian, or BTS? And what kind of system will that be? OTI assisted. I'm sorry, I was going to say OTI no, no, no. assisted with helping with the contract for this one, Commissioner Welsh. But really, Bill Berger and his staff uh, are developing the kind of the configuration of the software at this point. Um, Bill, I don't know if you wanted to speak on that and where we are in that process. Yeah, so um, the software that we're going to be using is called Neighborly, and that's a commercial uh, application. It's a cloud based application that's used by uh, dozens of other communities for programs just like this. Okay. It's been in existence for a little while now, and it already has clients. Uh, we use it, in, in fact, for CDBG. Uh, we're using it for our social action funding grant process, okay. and uh, we have a high level of confidence in being able to use it. The development piece of it really is on our side, trying to figure out what's the most efficient, effective process to make sure we can 
go through the review, do it in a, an effective way, do it accurately, make sure we reduce fraud and abuse and be able to make sure that we can get those applications reviewed, approved, and get those checks out the door in coordination with the clerk. And there's a lot of people involved in that. So uh, just making sure we get the process right and appreciate if there's the opportunity to be able to wait until May 4th to open up the portal so we can make sure it's done right. We don't have the kind of experience that people are having with unemployment. Thank you. That that's, um, brings a lot of comfort. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good. I wanted to put in a word for the family daycare homes, too. I think they're providing a pretty vital service to the essential workers, you know, our police and fire and EOC people. And, you know, they have to be there. But if they're not, if they only have one or two clients, it's very difficult for them to stay in business. So just saying, uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two, two questions. One. I just wanted a clarification because I, I thought I heard two different dates of when we're rolling this out, when people could start applying. They can, they can apply on May the 4th. May 4th, okay. And then the second question was, um, just walk me through your thinking on, and I don't have a better day for it, but uh, walk me through your thinking about a business having to be in business for six months. Yeah, the, the biggest thing is we want to make sure that it really was a legitimate ongoing concern. Uh, the biggest, you know, we want to make sure they were still in business on, on March the 1st because uh, we don't want anybody forming a business after the COVID crisis began in the hopes of getting, you know, some kind of a, of a benefit. But, uh, but we tried to, for one thing, it's hard to track businesses who are newly formed and they won't have the documentation in many cases that we need. We don't know what their income levels because they were still growing their income. And in many cases, they haven't filed their first tax return and so on. So we, we just felt like in order to get as much money out as quickly as possible to businesses that had uh, ongoing operations, we would, we would make some decisions. Many of the city programs required a full year of operation before uh, being open, and the city of St. Pete modified it in phase two to allow that six-month uh, time period. But we just want to make sure it is a legitimate ongoing concern and that um, you know there are expenses and, and income that we can document over a period of time. Well, I think everyone wants to get the money out as quickly as possible, so right. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner Seal. Thank you everybody for working on this. Um, I did have a little bit of concern about um, home-based businesses as well as nonprofit organizations. Um, nonprofits have, people can't afford to be donating to some of them. At Juvenile Welfare Board, we've been augmenting some of the food pro providing not-for-profits, but um, I understand the governmental piece may still continue, but they may see a real drop off in um, donations. And that does concern me if they had to close their doors and it was a service that really like a homeless shelter or something like that, that they're really um, essential to our, um, our folks here. Home-based businesses, they may be in the event business, they may be in you know, providing stuff at Saturday morning market where that market's dried up or um, you know, other places where we might not necessarily know that they, they may be out of their home, but they might have storage some other place, or they may be, um, again, impacted by the fact that they're technically now a non-essential business, so they have no income. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the biggest thing we were trying to do with, with the entire program is to address people who were forced to close, that under no circumstances could they be making money. And then we, we extended it to the, also to the restaurants and the lodging because of the severe nature of the impact. It's hard on anybody beyond that to take a look at what exactly the impact was without getting an extensive amount of documentation, including really just an affidavit saying, this is how much I would have made if I were open or if I were operating at full capacity. I think almost every business has been impacted. I mean, we take a look at manufacturers and wholesalers and everybody has been impacted to some extent, mostly negatively. There are a few businesses that are making money in the process, but at some point we had to draw a line and say, we only have so much money. We wanna make a biggest impact we can quickly. 
So we really took a look at who was it that was required to close based on the governor's order, on your order, and, uh, and how can we make them as whole as quickly as possible? And then we could take a look at businesses who are impacted negatively but not closed at a future time. And then maybe even, you know, like, as you said, there are some essential businesses that for one reason or another had to close um, just for their own personal operations. And we have no way of, of knowing that. But in order to put together a program that has some legitimate guidelines to it, we had to make some decisions. And that's kind of what, why we chose those two points. Well, I would again ask that we keep an eye on this and look at the, those cases where we're turning people down yeah. because they don't qualify for some reason, because I think there are an awful lot of at-home businesses that were viable businesses before and frankly did not fall on the non-essential business list, but were forced to close down. Yes, um, well, I think we need to, we, did, we definitely will track that. And we do, we plan to keep uh, careful records of all the denials and of all of those who are approved, you know, and initially, yeah. you know, we need to we need to know that we we chose these businesses to be included, and that we are consistent in they're always included if one of them is included, and then um, also we did research based on home based businesses, and over half of all home based businesses make less than twenty five thousand dollars a year from their home based operations, and we are again we're trying to make it so that we're giving five thousand to everybody. And in, again, in order to keep it, you know, get the most people treated as quickly as possible have the biggest impact on those businesses, employees and on their customers and on their suppliers, it, uh, it, it'll, it'll spur the economy quicker doing it this way. And then in the second phase, maybe we look at, maybe we don't give the full 5,000, but we give the amount of the impact for those essential businesses that were impacted. Um, or required to close, but happen to have income that would have been lower than that five thousand dollar amount. So um, we, you know, it's definitely a work in progress. But uh, what we propose propose to you today is a phase one. Well, again, I'd want us to look at that very closely because I think we might be creating a hole here. You know, the home businesses that don't make twenty five thousand dollars a year or do just make that probably need this money way more than the ones that. We're making mm -hmm. a lot more than that. So well, I, that's why you know, we would maybe, and, I, and from our discussion before, it doesn't appear that they would be eligible for individual. Well, maybe they would. They would. But Commissioner, if I could suggest, okay. I mean, obviously, there's um, you, you raised some concerns on this program. You raised some concerns with the individual assistance program. Let me, I guess, staff together and look at that and come back to you with a recommendation. We could actually, and you know, we received a letter. Uh, recently um, talking about kind of equity lens and, and different types of businesses and individuals right. that may not fit within this program. Maybe we put together a, um, a committee um, made up of community members that we start working with. And even while we're taking applications through June 1st, we begin to get that process going to where we're, uh, we're understanding the full breadth of the need and, um, and get ideas in terms of what a phase two would look like while we're still figuring out what type of funding would be available. We'd be happy to get that started. All right, I would appreciate that a lot. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. First of all, I just wanted to echo the comments that uh, Commissioner Welch made and, and Bill Berger made about you know trying to make sure that we do this right and, and get the money to the folks that uh, are in most need and the companies that are really hurting. So. I really appreciate what staff's done to put this program together as well. Um, it looks like, I just wanna make sure that of course, we're not we're not including uh, home-based businesses here. So I'm assuming that that does not include any B and B. So it includes this lodging industry, but not B and Bs, cause that's a home-based business. So I'm just clarifying that, is that correct? That, that is correct. A, a An Airbnb type operation where you're renting a room of your home, of your homestead would not qualify. Many people on Airbnb have invested in separate properties where they have a commercial property that they rent out. Um, those would qualify. So it's just a matter of, you know, because they would probably have a rent or a mortgage payment of their own to, uh, to be able to uh, afford that investment property. So that's that, that's the, the dividing line there. If it's your own homestead, it doesn't qualify. 
Um, and then, uh, thank you. And then um, the 25 and under, it's an arbitrary number. It could be 22 and under, it could be 28 and under. I've just gotten a call from several folks that, that are like in that 27, 28 number. And of course, you know, they're completely ruled out. It's not like they get it for a percentage of the 5,000 for being a little too big, they get nothing. So maybe in that, again, in that second phase, just look at some of those. Cause those are some real, they, I mean, they look and feel like a small business. They just didn't yeah. make that one hurdle. So just keep that in mind. Um, the newly formed businesses, I, I understand the part about the, 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 the fraud potential, but because the economy was roaring along, there are a lot of folks that made big investments from November through February. Um, I know several, um, but one in particular comes to mind wow. and, and they just got, they just got blown away. So, I mean, I think there's some extenuating circumstance. They're still in business. They're trying to make a go of it, but they've been impacted hugely. Those new businesses really are, are teetering. I mean, a lot of businesses are teetering, but just keep that in mind as well in that second phase. Um, and then uh, I'm assuming that the governor's order that, uh, that, that will come out and perhaps open some of these businesses up and, and, and get them going again, and they're making some money, and that that's not going to hurt their eligibility for this program. Correct. Okay. Um, and um, and then Commissioner Seal made the comment about the, the 501c3s, and um, again, I know we have to watch this first phase, but uh, I would argue that there's a lot of small churches that are going through the very same thing that you mentioned on other 501c3s um, that probably won't be here. Um, uh, without some assistance and some help. And again, I know that's not in this first phase, but as we look at 501c3s, that's a big, con that's a big group of uh, entities out there, but certainly not any without needs. So thank you. And I agree. I think we can limit the uh, 501c3 assistance to those that are providing direct essential services, you know, food, shelter, whatever. Um, as opposed to associations and that sort of thing. Anybody else? Do we have any, what in, one would like to speak on this issue? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment on this item, please hit star nine on your phone or hit the virtual uh, hand raise button in the Zoom application. Uh, Madam Chair, we do have two members of the public that wish to speak on this item. Uh, the first member of the public is Chris Lauber. Uh, Mr. Lauber, if you'll give us your uh, first name, last name, spelling, address, and then you'll have three minutes. And you'll have to unmute on your uh, your Zoom meeting. Hello? Uh, Mr. Lauber, if you could hit unmute on your, your Zoom meeting, and then you can address the board. we're having technical difficulty with the first one, Madam Chair. I'm going to move on to the second one. Uh, our, our next speaker is on the phone line, uh, last four digits 2332. Um, if you'll give us your name, spelling, address, and then you'll have three minutes. Hi, my name is Dawn Britton, B-A-W-N-B-R-I-T-N-E-R. -E I'm in Clearwater, Florida. Um, uh, myself and my wife both own uh, Sweet Peas Preschool in Clearwater. And because we um, are actually in, in Pinellas County, we can't take advantage of any of the city grants um, that are being offered right now. And I listened since 9.30 this morning to find out what Pinellas County would be able to do for us, only to find out that because I'm an in-home business, um, I don't qualify. And um, I, I appreciate the comment that um, Pat Gerard said. I, I mean, we are a very essential business. We are really helping uh, those workers that are trying to hang on to their jobs um, by taking care of their little ones for them. Um, and we have lost 33% of our, of our business um, due to parents being laid off or furloughed and not being able to afford to bring their children. We came up with our own um, deferment program to try and help them, but they couldn't even take advantage of that. So, um, we we are trying to to stay alive because we know that our our services are important. Um, and you were saying that you you made these decisions on who was to be included and who wasn't based on the severe nature of the impact. Well, 33% of your business, I think, is pretty 
severe. I mean, as of right now, we're already down four thousand um, dollars, and that's growing, you know, every week. So, um, you know, I would would like to have that reconsidered, even in phase one, to include um, small in home, uh, not the commercial preschools. They've got, you know, you've got other things for them, but these in home based um, preschools that that you know we have like a small in-home preschool can have a max of six kids a large in-home preschool has a max of 12 and you know when you lose two kids out of six it makes a big impact um and we're not eligible for the individual help so we can't go that direction so we're kind of stuck being in unincorporated pinellas county um you know, no matter where we're looking, we can't seem to get any help and the SBA is out of money. So, you know, no matter what we do, we're running out of, of places to go. So one more um, note on that too, if you could address my concern, um, is that we also have an Airbnb, but it's not in our homestead. It's in our camper in our front yard. So does that count? Does that not count? I, I don't know. So thank you very much. I appreciate all you're doing. I thank you for the time that you've invested today. And uh, thank you for your answers. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have four other hands that went up on this item. Uh, the next speaker is uh, last four digits 9196. If you could tell us your name, spelling, address, and then you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, my name is Chris Lauber, and I'm with uh, Watercross International. Um, I live in St. Petersburg. My address is 6161 7th Avenue North. Uh, did you need the spelling of my last name? Yes, please, for the record. Okay, yeah, that's L-A-U-B-E-R. I'm sorry about our dog in the background. Uh, we are a home-based business. We promote road races throughout Pinellas County. We, 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, et cetera. Um, our place of business where we engage our customers are at Fort DeSoto Park, downtown St. Petersburg, and for our point-to-point race from Madeira Beach to Largo. The only thing that we need to be able to do from our office is be on the phone and use our computer and we use our garage for storage. We are slipping through the cracks. We had an event scheduled for March 15th, a Sunday, 44 hours prior to the event. We learned from County Parks Department that we would not be able to execute the event um and we postponed it till may 3rd we postponed that till may 17th and now we have been forced to cancel that because the county wants to make sure that we have social distancing which of course we uh, wholeheartedly endorse however we've been in business for 30 years we pay property taxes we pay sales taxes we pay federal taxes we hire multiple law enforcement agencies to control traffic for some of our events. We hire ambulance, we hire local crew members. We got a lot going on. Um, And to be eliminated from this opportunity, just because we're home base, it's just just not right. Uh, Early this morning or late last night, depending on how you look at it, I sent an email to each of the commissioners. I hope you've had an opportunity to look at that. Um, You know, we need this program. You know, we put on our races for a number of reasons. One, to promote a healthy, active lifestyle. We showcase our coastal community, our beautiful coastal community. We generate an economic impact for our hospitality uh, industry. Uh, We host 5,000 runners a year. They stay in hotels. They eat at restaurants. They shop in our stores. We have generated literally millions of dollars of economic impact. And, you know, like I said, we, we were forced to shut down. We, we were forced to shut down our event 44 hours prior to it taking place. That was after we had all the expense. We have uh, we had almost 1,400 people registered. Our, our events require us to be out in the public and they're mass participation events. We were the first to go and we're going to be the last to come back. And that's not just me as a race director. Think about home shows, car shows, boat shows, garden shows, concert promoter, promoters, basically any live performance. I know that the big sports, the the, the rain, the bucks. I'm, I'm the sorry, to interrupt, sir. Your time has expired. 
Okay, well, just in closing, they get all the all the notoriety, but there's a lot of us guys out here too. So thank you very much, and I and I hope that you can either make exceptions or change the rules a little bit to incorporate us as as well as other event promoters. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Jennifer Harmon. Uh, Ms. Harmon, if you could give us your first name, last name, spelling, address, and we'll give you your three minutes. Jennifer Harmon, H-A-R-M-O-N. Um, my address at business is 1153 Main Street in Dunedin. I only have two questions um, pertaining to this. One is, can a person as a business apply for the business grant and then that same person as a family member with no income apply for the family help? That's one question. And the other question is, um, can we, do we still qualify for the business grant when we can um, apply on 5-4 if, with all the Lord's help, we can open on 5-1? Um, so those are my two questions. That's really all I have to ask. If I could get those answered, that would be awesome. And thank you for this very long day. You guys must be exhausted. Thank you. Thanks. Mike, do you want to address that? Yes, um, I, I believe they could apply for both as long as both the financial assistance grant and the um, small business grant, as long as they qualify for each under the criteria. So there's nothing to stop you from doing both. And many of our home based businesses will fit in that category, um, you know, especially if they receive a small income from their home based business they would qualify under that financial assistance category. And then as far as, um, see, what was the other question besides applying for both? The... Wow, I, I, I don't know. I can jump in. Uh, the... I think one thing to think about, you know, we, we put program criteria out here and you're exactly right. And the, the, the call, the people that are calling in are exact, you know, they, we, we do understand that. Think about it this way: When we were talking about individual assistance for people, um, we have, um, you know, a significant portion of our population where the average household income is under fifty thousand dollars. We have fifty thousand people applying for four, or for four thousand dollars. That's two hundred million dollars. That exceeds the federal stimulus dollars. Um, and so, trying to find the balance between what we put on the business side, what we put on the individuals, it's it's a tough balance. And so. Um, I, I completely agree with phase two and we'll, we'll work on that, but I, I just want to recognize the, the limitation on the dollars. It sounds like a lot of money, but it adds up pretty quick. And her other question was on the May 1st, May 4th. If she's back in business on May 1st, can she still apply on May 4th? And yes, the, uh, the impact occurred during the closure with the governor's order and your order. So that's what we're trying to uh, counteract with the $5,000 grant is the required closures due to the, that period. Great. Madam Chair, we have one more speaker remaining. Uh, this is Sandy F. Uh, Sandy, if you'll give us your first last name, spelling, address, and then you'll have three minutes to address the board. And hit unmute, by the way, also. Andy? Hello? Can you hear us? Hello? Madam Chair, I think we're having tech technology difficulties here on Sandy's end. There are no more speakers that wish to be heard. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board? Yes, Commissioner Welch. I would make a motion if you're ready, Madam Chair. I'm ready. Do we have a second? Second. Come on, just a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple more hours. Um, okay, if there are no further questions or comments, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. Please raise your hand for aye. 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 Nay, anybody opposed? No? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next issue, board agenda, uh, agenda briefing for next week. The um, agenda brief is on for today. Uh, we will have a meeting on Thursday. You could 
we could go through that today or you could postpone that until Thursday. It's your decision. That's the pleasure of the board. Are we thinking uh, Thursday's meeting is going to be any better? <laughs> Under your stewardship, Madam Chair, we'll be fine. Hey, this is going to this is going to ruin my record, you know. Uh, or at least my average. Mr. Seal. It looks like a fairly short agenda. I would imagine Barry could cover it pretty quickly. Just okay. you're right. Thursday will probably be another long meeting. Be happy to. Okay, do it. Go. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so items uh, two through two, one, two, and three on the agenda are reports. Um, item four is an award of bid to Highway Safety Devices for the ATMS Phase Three Expansion Project in the amount of nine hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars. And just speak up if there are questions. Um, item four is an award of a bid to Tamco Electric for repairs electrical industrial equipment related services. This is for um, repairs out of our wastewater and water uh, system operations. It's a three-year contract for $916,000. Items six and seven are report and file items. Item eight is a resolution approving a qualified applicant for the qualified target industry tax refund program. Item nine is a resolution, uh, as we just talked about, uh, for the CARES Act funding. Item 10 will be a change order number one to a contract with Pepper Construction. This is for the Forest Lake Boulevard phase two project. This is where they had significant soil. They did borings, um, but actually into the project, they had significant problems with uh, bad soils. Uh, that's a result of this change order. Can you, can Barry, can you have somebody there on Tuesday to, to, to talk a little bit more detail on that? Uh, sure can. Um, unfortunately, this one I could speak to it in great detail myself because um, of, um, you know, the, the issues involved. But yes, we will absolutely have Kelly there and available to answer questions. So, I mean, this is a 25% increase in the, in the bid, right? You bet. It's it's bad. It's bad soils, and so they they did have sufficient borings um, as they no, do on any other project. And once they got in, um, that's when they 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 discovered that. So that is a change in condition, and and qualifies as as a, as additional money necessary to complete the project. But yes, we'll go through that in, in great detail. Thank you. Item number eleven is a grant application to the U.S. Department of Transportation for Infrastructure and Inve Investment Act. Um, so this is to apply uh, for uh, the $25 million under that program uh, for the, um, uh, the Deneen Causeway Bridge. Commissioner Seal has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Seal. All right. Um, that leaves around $61 million if we did get the grant. And um, I know we don't have, I mean, that would be, a big hit in the penny for Pinellas. So if we are unable to identify other funding sources, um, can, can we turn down the grant or what is the whole thought process behind that? Mr. Seal, obviously this was discussed before I was here, so I don't know the exact background and, and details of this particular grant program. Um, so I'll have to get that information for you and we'll have it available on Tuesday. I believe that you can turn the grant down um, if you're able to not secure the other funds, but I don't want to misspeak on that. And I know that this is going to require a lot of other funding sources. They wanted to get this in because without this, but then we know the answer. <laughs> without this funding, the bridge project can't happen. So I think that was the uh, the, the thought process. But again, we'll, we'll provide answers to you on Tuesday on that. Um, item 12 is this is to accept uh, uh, coronavirus relief and secu economic security under the department of health and human services um initial 30 million dollars and this is for 1.6 million dollars um out of safety and emergency services 
item, and then item 13 is an appointment to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Committee, and then down to the County Attorney's Office. Under 14, this is a confidential item similar to what we uh, had last time around. So what I would ask is uh, for a phone call with each one of you over the next couple of days, or at least prior to Tuesday, we can cover it in just a few minutes. You're right. It was quick. <laughs> oh, that was it. Do we have any? <laughs> Does anybody anticipate bringing up any new business? Question. Yes. Uh, uh, Barry, on the um, we're planning to meet on third. He's coming out uh, with his uh, a new order or whatever on Wednesday. Is that enough time for you to prep for Thursday, or would Friday be better? So what he that comes out with, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, you know, it's it's hard to say. Obviously, um, we, um, I mean, I don't think it's a secret that you know we've been planning for um, some type of modified order. Um, the, I think the piece is, is we could talk Thursday. If, if it's going to require us to coordinate um, a response, in other words, amongst all of our municipalities, it'll actually probably require a little bit more time than that. So I think meeting Thursday is fine. If you want to meet Friday, that's, that's fine too. Um, I just don't know what to anticipate at this point because we haven't got a heads up in terms of what his order is going to do. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody have a feeling one way or another about Thursday or Friday? Um, okay. That's why I asked him. Peace. Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't okay. care either. I'm, I'm good either way. I think you Not do like some, we're doing anything these days. Some, um, <laughs> I think you may, you may have a PSTA meeting. On Friday? On Friday no. now? Mm. No? Okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It makes no difference to us. Okay. Um, okay. Great. So you want to make it Friday 930? It works. Is that okay with notice and everything? Yeah, we'll re well, we already noticed it, so we'll just re-notice for Friday. Oh, okay to do it on Friday instead? All right. Okay. All right. Anything else for the good of the... Yes, Mr. Seal. We don't have to address it today. We could even address it on Friday, but I would like everyone to be thinking about a uh, mask. I'm not sure I want to make it a requirement, but I'd like mm -hmm. to push out um, heavier suggestions on when you're going to a confined place, you know, things like that, that you really should be wearing gloves and a mask. Um, because I do think it's it's becoming more of a standard for um, not passing or not getting as much. Um, and then the other thing is I would like us to be working on, and I know all the staff's been working really hard on different things, but um, it came up today about trying to get increased testing in our county and um, even get to on demand. If that's what Hillsborough is doing, I'd like to see if we could get ramp ours up or get to some point where we would have a greater comfort level with citizens being able to access more testing if needed. Right. Okay. So don't have to address it today. I just wanted to bring it up. Yeah, if we could find out how they're doing that in Hillsborough. Yes. If I can address that first, you know, I think uh, marketing is is part of it. They, uh, they're doing, we're, up to this point, we've been testing at the same level as Hillsborough County. Um, and so, you know, you, you've seen them run, you know, the, the Raymond Jane sites and, and then have to shut it down because of the lack of PPE and uh, test equipment. 80% of the testing is being done through the private market, not the big single Raymond Jane sites. Um, now, my understanding is that there was a... Um, an effort through um, one of the universities that uh, that enabled them to get a, some additional testing. Uh, Dr. Cho's following up on that, but but we're we're very active. We want to do more. Uh, we have made those requests. We have it in through the EOC, um, and so um, I think that the tests are out there. But I'll, I'll let I'll make sure Dr. Cho is available, obviously, to address that directly. But we have been making 
um, those types of requests throughout this entire operation. It'd be great too if he could give some suggestions to Barbara for um, this week's message. If we do decide to open things up, even just the beaches and the pools, what are the things that you should be doing as an individual, or what would be best practice for you to do as an individual so we can get that out? You bet. Thank you. Anything else? All right. See y'all Friday morning. All righty. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.